Good morning and welcome. This is NDTV Profit. My name is Alex Matthew and you're watching All You Need to Know. Over the course of the next half an hour, we'll tell you everything that you need to know to start the end of your week on the right note. Let's start with the headlines. Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal is arrested by the Enforcement Directorate in the liquor scam case. The Supreme Court will hear the case today. U.S. markets extend rally despite a 4% slump in Apple. U.S. Department of Justice sues Apple for iPhone monopoly in a landmark antitrust case. ADRs of Infosys and Wipro dropped 3.8 and 1.7% respectively overnight after Accenture cuts its revenue guidance for the current financial year and also warns of lower IT spends. The Adani Group and M&M join hands to set up EV charging stations across the country. In same day settlement uh, trial to run on the 28th of March, the SEBI has decided to go for a beta test. A major news from the national capital, Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal has been arrested by the Enforcement Directorate in the liquor policy case yesterday. We'll get you detailed coverage on that in just a bit. But first, let's take you through the quick uh, global check that we normally do this morning. Uh, U.S. benchmarks extended the post-Fed rally as all three benchmarks closed at record highs for a second straight day. The S&P 500 climbed three-tenths of a percent, while the Dow and uh, the Nasdaq have both risen by 0.7 and 0.2 percent respectively. Uh, tech stocks broadly have helped the indices higher, but Apple lost over 4 percent and raised as much as $113 billion in market value. This after the Department of Justice and 16 attorneys general sued the iPhone maker for violating anti antitrust laws. The company is also said to be facing investigations about whether it is complying with the Digital Markets Act in the European Union. This is not the first time that Apple has come under scrutiny and in fact large tech companies have for many years now faced accusations of uh, enriching themselves by suppressing competition. Apple has denounced the lawsuit, calling it wrong on the facts and the law. Now, take a check on the Asian markets as well. The three early rises had started mixed, not too much to speak of, but the Japanese Nikkei continuing to gain ground. It's up as much as a third of a percent. The inflation data in Japan is going to be watched very closely today. You have the Hang Seng that has opened lower by as much as a percent and a half or thereabouts, and the onshore markets in China also showing a little bit of a down tick. Let's uh, turn to the major cues that you should take into trade today from the FNO space. Yesterday you saw quite a bit of action in the broader markets. Finally, a bit of a break uh, from the selling and in fact, quite a bit of buying. But what are the latest cues post the options expiry? Agam's here to tell you just that. Agam, morning. Uh, what are the latest cues? Right. Uh, well, uh, we continue to see the Nifty consolidate around 21,900, 22,000 thereabouts. And uh, the, the picture really hasn't uh, changed uh, dramatically. Uh, sure, we did close about 22,000 yesterday, but uh, the consolidation around that mark continues. And uh, well, we continue to see a very little change in open interest. Uh, and it actually, uh, March has so far been uh, quite slack in terms of the way things are panning out for the index future. The bank nifty, the picture isn't very different. We did see unwinding coming through, even though the index advanced by around 0.8%. As we move into a new week, Let's take a look at how things have panned out for the option space. So if you consider the change in open interest, uh, again, the, uh, we saw a little more writing around the 22,000 mark on expected lines, both in terms of calls as well as puts. Where does that leave us when it comes to your overall open interest picture? Well, at the moment, once again, max OI around 22,000 in terms of calls as well as puts. I reckon that uh, traders as well are expecting a little bit of a sideways movement over the course of the next few days, which is why we have seen most amount of writing and max OI around that particular mark. Uh, moving on to stocks, we have seen a good day overall because so we, we saw longs in Coal India, l &T, SRF, Tata Steel as well as sale. And even in terms of stocks which are unwinding, those stocks advance in terms of its underlying. Uh, and with short covering seen for Glenmark, Pharma, PVR, Inox, Industower, HAL as well as NMDC. So it's turned out to be a good day of trade, Alex. But I reckon today uh, we could just see some amount of pressure 
on the indices because of some pressure in IT. Absolutely, you said it. And we'll be talking about that in just a bit. But for now, let's turn to the major national news that we're tracking at the start today. And that has to do with the arrest of Arvind Kejriwal in New Delhi related to the liquor policy case. Uh, the Supreme Court has been moved and in fact the Supreme Court will be hearing that case, the bail petition, later today. We're joined by NDTV 24-7's Vedanta Agarwal. He's standing in front of the AAP headquarters in New Delhi to give us the latest there. Uh, Vedanta, what's the context and what can you tell us about the latest? Well, the context is pretty clear that Arvind Kejriwal has been arrested. He's the first sitting chief minister to be arrested. It's a huge uh, development in the liquor policy case and certainly uh, paving the way for a constitutional crisis in the national capital. I come to you from the DDO mark, which has been completely barricaded as we speak. Uh, because remember, there are huge mobilizations, huge protests that have been planned by the Aam Aadmi Party uh, right outside their headquarters. All their karikartas, their leaders, senior ministers have all been summoned summarily to the Aam Aadmi Party at 10 o'clock, uh, after which they will be protesting towards the BJP headquarters, which is very close to this, uh, the Aam Aadmi Party headquarters here in the national capital. This is the ITO area that has been completely barricaded. Prohibitory orders on gathering, uh, you know, have also been imposed. Uh, because remember, the Aam Aadmi Party has moved the Supreme Court, as you mentioned. So parallel developments happening. Uh, Arvind Kejriwal is uh, likely to be produced before the Rouse Avenue Court here in Delhi at about 2 p.m. Uh, before that, uh, the Aam Aadmi Party's plea uh, could be heard by the Supreme Court at about 10 uh, is what we are being told because remember it was late last night, soon after his arrest that the, that, that the Ahmadi party government in fact moved the Supreme Court and um, they also wanted an urgent hearing, a midnight hearing but that could not uh, happen so that hearing is likely to take place at 10 today as well uh, but certainly a constitutional crisis because remember he is the first sitting chief minister to be arrested, though little impact on the governance because remember he had very strategically transferred all his portfolios to ministers his most trusted lieutenants including Atishi and Saurabh Bhardwaj. Uh, whether there's going to be a change of guard or not, that remains to be seen. But the Aam Aadmi Party has said that he will continue to be the Chief Minister of Delhi and uh, that he will continue to sort of uh, do governance from inside the hard jails. That's an important political point also being made by the Aam Aadmi Party. Other alliance partners, including the Congress, the TMC, which is not an alliance partner, but certainly a prominent opposition party, all of them have come out in support of the Aam Aadmi Party. And today, on this road, we'll see massive protests. There's a key road uh, in the national capital that has been completely barricaded from all sides. If I can ask my camera person to pan around and show you how all sides have been completely barricaded uh, and uh, you know there's there's heavy police deployment as well uh, section 144 in place uh, so of course a very critical day today uh, for Delhi Arvind Kejriwal's arrest has set in motion uh, you know political a chain of political events that are truly unprecedented Absolutely. thanks so much Vedanta for breaking that down for us and in fact we will certainly touch base with you over the course of the day to get the latest developments there let's turn to another a major story and that is uh, the latest update in the electoral bonds case in line with directives from the top court SBI has now released a fresh data set of electoral bonds detailing the parties and whose bonds they encashed my colleague Janani has all the latest details here Janani we saw one data set a short while back which we break broke down for our viewers this is clearer in that who has gotten money from whom and how much has been and cashed. Good morning, Alex. That's right. What this data set essentially differs from the ones before is that the alpha numeric code, which is the identifier for the bonds that were donated and who encashed that particular code have all been revealed now. So this tells us who has contributed directly to uh, the biggest political party's political funding over the course of five years from April 2019 till January 2024. So essentially, uh, like I said, the top political funding for India's biggest parties have been revealed and the total value of bonds that these parties have engaged. Now, remember, uh, some money has been allotted or perhaps donated to a particular party, but they've all not been encashed. Now, if we look at uh, the Aam Aadmi Party, uh, it has encashed over 65.25 crores. BJP has encashed over 5,594 crores. Uh, the Congress, uh, 1,592 crores. And uh, Trinamool Congress has encashed uh, over uh, 1,500 crores as well. Uh, uh, apologies, Congress has encashed actually over uh, 1,300 crores. 
and the DMK also a big number at 632 crores. Now let's try to understand how much of these are listed companies, how much of these are actually the top donors that we already know about. Uh, remember the future gaming company, which was the biggest donor, a Tamil Nadu based lottery company has contributed in fact the most over 500 uh, crores to uh, the DMK, Dravida Munetra Karagam, the party in power in Tamil Nadu and to Trinamul Congress. Uh, Trinamul Congress in fact has been its top uh, beneficiary at 542 crore. The second top donor, Mega Engineering, in fact has donated most about 584 crores to the Bharatiya Janata Party. Uh, of course, we do not know the dates in which uh, these bonds were encashed. So uh, further uh, you know, insights and understanding into what exactly went down uh, will still have to be figured out. And of course, there's also companies like the Haldi Energy Group, which is a subsidiary of the conglomerate RP Goenka Group, uh, has contributed uh, quite a significant amount of over 280 crores to the Trinamool Congress. Vedanta group, of course, uh, contributing both to Congress and BJP at 104 and a 227 crore. You know, lots of numbers that are coming in now. Uh, we'll still be breaking this down further, but that's all we have for you at the moment. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Janani, for giving us those details. And by the way, in case you're interested, we've got all of those lists that Janani just spoke about and all of those numbers in a story on the website ndtvprofit.com. So do check, take a look when you get the time. We have to slip into a very quick break, but we've got more on the other side, stock-specific action at that. So do stay tuned. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay Welcome back. You're watching All You Need to Know. Now, we will focus on IT in just a bit because that's likely to be the pack that is a little down in the dumps at the end of the week. But let's focus on some other stocks and news first. Varsha is joining in with the first list and that includes Tata Chemicals as well as Muthut Finance and Lloyd's Metal. Varsha, what can you tell us? Morning. Good morning, Alex. So let's start with Tata Chemicals, wherein Income Tax Department has imposed 103 crore penalty for violation related to disallowance of interest. Now, in simple term, this means that company which had deducted interest as in business expense should not have been deducted as per income tax. Now, hence, NCLT has disallowed the deducted interest and imposed penalty. Company will appeal against order seeking reversal of penalty. Now, net profit in 2023 stands at 2,400 crore. Uh, now, Tata Chemical is not alone in this race. You, you do, uh, uh, Cromptum Greaves Consumer Electricals also got a, a notice of tax demand of rupees 68 crore, uh, of which tax amount stands at 57 crore and interest amount stands at 11 crore. Now, financial impact would be 54 crore on the company. Then we have Muthut Finance, wherein they've acquired additional 4% stake in Bellstar Microfinance, which is a subsidiary of company. They've acquired 60 lakhs equity shares for rupees 300 crore they've increased their stake to 60 
63.5% from 59% earlier and this acquisition was carried through subscription to right issues by Bellstar Microfinance. Lastly, we have Lloyd's Metals wherein company is going to raise 5,000 crores for CapEx program without restarting to debt. That means they are not going to consider debt as an option but company is evaluating pros and cons of each option and will select best possible one and they are going to consider minimizing dilution of promoter holdings. So these are all the stocks that should be on watch out. Right. Thanks so much for getting us those details, Varsha. More stocks to lock, look out for and Mika has got the rest of the list. Mika, what are you picking up? So up first, we have Mazga Docks, which has accepted an offer from the Mumbai Port Authority. And they're going to be allotted a land and a building adjacent to Mumbai Yard. Now, the land is measured at 14.55 acres, an allotment on long lease basis of for 29 years. And the allotment cost was at 354 crores. Uh, then we have Sarda Energy, where it's a joint venture unit called Natural Resources Energy has gotten a letter of intent um, from the Industry, Energy, Labor and Mining Department of the Government of Maharashtra. Now, Sardar Energy has an economic interest in the JV unit at 51%. And the LOI received is for the composite license of an iron ore block that is located across 1,526 hectares in the area of Maharashtra. What the license basically does is allows the company to carry out iron ore mining and possible production. And it uh, helps to de develop an iron ore mine in the uh, Surjagat 1 block. Then we have Prestige Estates, which has acquired 62.5 acre land in the, the Delhi NCR region and at an acquisition cost of 468 crores, the land will be acquired for a residential development with a gross development value of 10,000 crores. Got it. All right. Uh, let's uh, move on to IT and Accenture is uh, something to watch out. Rather, the IT pack as a whole is uh, something to watch out for because Accenture has said that it expects that its uh, revenue for the current financial year will grow slower than it had previously anticipated. To tell you what the latest development is and what the IT companies should watch out for, Agam is joining in. Agam, what's the latest here? Right, so Accenture has suggested that for the fiscal 24, they are expecting a revenue growth of anywhere between 1 to 3 percent as against 2 to 5 percent suggested earlier. Moreover, they are suggesting that clients at the moment are tight-fisted when it comes to uh, well, discretionary spending, they are limiting their budgets, and smaller deals are harder to come by. And smaller deals are important because uh, the revenue accretion there is a lot faster. While they have suggested that the large deals are still there and sh showing strength, revenue from ra large deals is uh, slower to trickle down in terms of its earnings. Perhaps more importantly, the financial services vertical has seen a decline of as much as 6% in terms of its revenues and that is something which can potentially weigh on the sentiment of the Indian IT pack as well because not only is a US market uh, its largest uh, well market but also the fact that uh, financial services contribute substantially to a lot of these larger IT companies and because of that we've already seen pressure in Infosys and Wipro ADRs, both of them down anywhere between 1.7 to 3.7 or 8% overnight. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Agam, for getting us those details. And uh, in fact, Agam had pointed out right at the start that uh, it might actually be the IT pack that puts a little pressure on the markets uh, today. But uh, let's bring you a significant development uh, from the perspective of electric mobility. M&M and the Adani Group are set to join hands to set up EV charging stations across the country. Puneet is joining in with more details here. Puneet, what's being talked about? Hi, good morning, Alex. And yes, as you rightly said, that the, they have signed an MOU with the listed entity Adani Total Gas. Now, this has been signed with a subsidiary uh, Adani Total Energies E-Mobility Limited, which is uh, mandated to and dedicated to building the next generation clean energy infrastructure in the country. Now, they have said that this is to accelerate the adoption of EVs as well as creating expansive EV charging infrastructure in the country. Now, uh, for Mahindra, the XUV400 customers of Mahindra uh, will now have access to more than 1,100 uh, electric vehicle chargers on their own BlueSense app. Uh, financial details of this partnership is not disclosed at the moment, but they see that this will help the 400 customers get more options uh, for EV infrastructure. Now, for Adani Total Energy's e-mobility limited, which is the subsidiary has signed an agreement with, uh, they have announced that they want to uh, install 75,000 EV chargers in the country by 2030. Back to you. All right. Thanks so much, Puneet, for getting us those details. Now, with the sweltering summer on the horizon, ice cream chains are gearing up for a busy few months. 
The demand for frozen treats has already seen an uptick leading to top brands uh, expanding capacity. Stacia has more details in this report. Right, oh. ice cream companies are expecting about 25 to 30 percent growth in sales uh, during April and June over the previous year in anticipation of a summer rush. Now, uh, some like Amul has said that they are start starting to see an uptick in some pockets. They've already invested a uh, thousand crore towards expansion. Uh, this includes both uh, greenfield projects as well as enhance enhancement of its existing facilities. Um, the company is also expanding its fairly new retail concept that is Ice Lounge focused entirely on premium uh, ice cream. Uh, 15 such, uh, such stores are launched and 10 more are planned during the summer. Now, Mother Dairy expects uh, stable prices to spur demand. Now, this is unlike the last two years when we have seen companies, uh, they were forced to increase prices due to high raw material prices. However, this year they saw a fall in uh, milk procurement prices and uh, surplus stocks. Now, American uh, chain Baskin Robbins, uh, they are set to open 1,000 outlet in India. The premium brand expects to outpace market growth this summer. Now, if even though ice cream consumption in India is fairly low compared with the global average, the market is highly competitive with a very few big players and a whole lot of small regional players. Now, the smaller companies, they collectively control about half of the market. Uh, other trend that we are seeing is the quick commerce. Uh, this particular channel is driving the in-house cons uh, in-house consumption. Although you know ice cream sales are largely uh, depend uh, on uh, out of home consumption, the traditional companies are uh, also under pressure from uh, due to the rise of protein-rich, low-calorie ice cream brands. Uh, this include Noto, Go Zero, Getaway, and Brooklyn Creamery. So clearly, a lot of competition and companies are gearing. Uh, for a few busy months ahead. Absolutely, and Sesha, you've got me thinking about ice creams right at the start today. Uh, so <laughs> thank you so much for that. I haven't yet had my coffee, but I'm thinking of ice cream. But let's uh, talk about a couple of brokerage notes that have come in. One is, uh, of course, Jeffries on Sriram Finance, and there's also Nuvama on Prince Pipe. So tell you more about what's being said. I'm joined by Harsh Saita this morning. Harsh, what are you picking up? Well, thanks for that, Alex. Uh, so Jeffrey is extremely bullish on Sriram Finance. They've given it a target price of 2750 What they're suggesting is loan growth will continue to be healthy. Along with new products being added uh, to Sriram's kitty, this should, of course, give Sriram a little bit of fillip on growth as well going forward. So that's one positive uh, which Jeffrey talks about. Margins, they believe, is expected to be range-bound all the way through FY26. So no positivity there, but the asset quality and credit costs are expected to be uh, quite uh, uh, robust and solid uh, over the course of the next two to three years. Also, with regard to value unlocking, there's a housing finance subsidiary which Sriram has, which if it raises funds will, of course, unlock some value for Sriram Finance as well. Uh, so that one on the annual, at 1.6 times price to book value, Jeffries is finding some merit in this one. Uh, uh, so they believe that it's largely in line with the five-year average valuations, but the tailwinds are much better. I'll quickly switch over to uh, uh, on, uh, to Prince Pipes. Uh, well, this one's a Novama report. They've reduced the target price on Pimps, Prince Pipes from 772 to 737. They uh, they talk about the acquisition that Prince Pipes has made, 55 crore rupee acquisition, but they suggest that it's a 100 to 120 crore in terms of top line maximum a, a possible top line that can be added as a result of this acquisition and a 13 to 15 percent margin on this particular top line is what they're talking about so no significant earnings re-rating expected from this asset and the company will in fact need to free up bandwidth to revive the unit flat is q4 and they've cut eps estimates by nine percent in fy 24 25 26 cut the target price as well to 737 Thanks, Harsh, for getting us those details. We're completely out of time on this particular edition of All You Need to Know. Up next is India Market Open, so do stay tuned for that. And this is EDTV Profit.
different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. As we've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money, There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. You have a missed call. Let's be real guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term? When to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us... Amongst uh, big developments between yesterday and this morning, Delhi Chief Minister was arrested late last evening for questioning, or rather after questioning by the ED officials in connection with the excise policy case. Uh, good morning, Neeraj. Not market moving, but rather significant development. Most certainly. Everything related to elections and politics will be very significant. So I like we'll how talk. you've attributed this to elections. I'm just saying election. I'm not attributing okay. this to elections. I'm saying everything uh, mm. attributable to or important for elections, politics. politics and macro uh, would help. I mean, there are some positive news flow as well. Uh, there is a note from Nomura which says that we may see a transition from El Nino to La Nina. Uh, but on the flip side, IT and Accenture, uh, and yeah. that's the other big talking point as well. And the big development, Swiss Central Bank went out and cut uh, interest rates. So that was the first of as many. As did Mexico. 
<laughs> it seems like it's going to be an exciting morning. Lots of different cues pointing in various directions. But nevertheless, let's start with uh, where the implied nifty is this morning before we go into all those global cues. And then, of course, I'll toss it over to Neeraj for what's happening locally as we gear up for trade this morning. Uh, that's implied nifty after a pretty solid start to trade yesterday. This morning looks rather subdued. Uh, in terms of stock movements, uh, Asian markets are trading mixed in early trade, except Japan, which is having a good run again. Japanese markets once again have made record highs to trade above levels of 41,000. This comes in as inflation actually accelerated. So most countries or most markets react to a better or a lower reading in inflation. Japan, clearly a different story to tell. Uh, inflation for the month of March comes in at 2.8% versus 2.2%. And the core inflation also continues to rise. Remember, this is the comfort level that the Bank of Japan is eyeing, which is about 2 odd percent. Uh, that is, of course, what's happening in Asia. The rest of those Asian markets looking rather flat. Uh, across uh, the other parts of the world, it was Wall Street that continued its rally in overnight trade. The Dow, the Nasdaq, and the S&P 500 once again closed at record highs. Financials and industrials led the gains this morning in overnight trade. Apple declined quite sharply as the uh, Department of Justice so sued Apple, saying its ecosystem is a monopoly at the expense of consumers. Tech stood out on the downside, and this came in after Accenture lowered its guidance to one to three percent versus two, uh, one to two percent versus three to five percent that was initially put out uh, on back of a weak global outlook. We'll talk about what this means to the Indian IT sector, but. In overnight trade, the ADR of Infosys and Wipro uh, sold off as well. You had the stock media giant Reddit that debuted on the exchanges, opened with a gap up of 38% and went home with gains of nearly 50%. So that was a Reddit story, but apart and beyond that, tech generally having a little bit of a down day. Uh, an interesting uh, central bank action you had, uh, just before I go into the other central banks, it was uh, asset manager Vanguard, Neeraj, and we've been talking about three rate cuts. They've actually come out and said that they do not expect the Fed to cut any rates at all uh, in the current year. So I think uh, while they've said that, markets, of course, not reacting to it. But I'm sure people will take notice as early as next week after all this euphoria dies out. Yeah, I mean, whether you trust the uh, Fed, and, I mean, you know, and most people say don't fight the Fed. So if the Fed is saying that there is a going to be a QT reduction and an interest rate cut, then it doesn't matter what Vanguard says. Let's maybe. not forget what uh, the Fed said late last year yeah, as well, of course. <laughs> uh, but then this is just just news point. This is what asset managers globally really made of that uh, Fed move. Mm. Uh, talking about central banks, uh, very. Uh, you know, very different, unexpected uh, action that took place. Swiss Bank has been, I mean, economists were betting on a rate cut from the Swiss Central Bank uh, only in June. But defying that, the Swiss Central Bank actually went ahead, beat the ECB and the Fed, and cut rates. Uh, that, that was a big move coming in in overnight trade, on back of which the Swiss franc, which is a very commonly traded currency, actually declined. The Swiss dollar pair saw a big move coming in, the dollar picking up strength. You also had Germany uh, send, uh, regulators indicating that Germany could now slip into a recession due to weak consumption and anemic demand. England, on the other hand, which is currently struggling with anemic demand, indicated that they seem to be on the right track. In fact, uh, the Bank of England has said that they could look at cutting rates. They're clearly moving in that direction for now. So uh, lots of moving parts with central bank activity. We talked about this on Monday itself, but by Friday, we've had more, most of those actions out of the way. Bitcoin was volatile. It declined in trade, crude declined in trade, all of this on back of a stronger dollar needed. So I think the currency markets um, must be having the time of their life, very unexpected moves, the Swissy dollar, which is a very popular carry trade currency, would have seen a big, big correction on back of the dollar gaining, right? Yeah, quite interesting as to what's happening there. And yep, Sabina tracks this very, very closely. So uh, refer to her for almost any kind of currency moves, really. But let's talk about the trade setup for the day today and, and try and see what could be happening there. So um, the global queues, as we highlighted, um, are are maybe okay the u.s futures are still in the green so the implied open could be indicating a start which is flattish to marginally higher if you will unless i'm very wrong but i think that should be the kind of start that we should anticipate yeah flattish to marginally lower actually so i stand corrected there maybe courtesy it so lower wix and global queues that's the that, <laughs> first time on the trade setup that lower volatility and global queues may aid the index but it 
will probably play the party pooper. Is likely to be the party pooper, and I think IT has done that. Is 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 playing small sport, and is probably leading the index lower. That's why the implied open seems to be suggesting. Now you know, yesterday the interesting thing that happened was that we kind of closed in on around 22,000, but there was significant call writing at those levels. It's almost as if call writers knew that 22,000 is going to be. A bit of a resistance, and I think that is what is turning out to be because uh, the the maximum OI is there, and the maximum call concentration also happened at 22. So you would think that if the index were to move higher, these guys would have to come and cover. That doesn't seem to be the case today for now, courtesy IT. Let's see if banking steps up and tries to do something. So that's the other aspect, and. From amongst themes to watch out for, and we'll talk about IT in detail. Uh, Samina will start that, but the commodity bounce back that we're seeing. Base metals, crude, rubber, what have you, is probably denting prospects for commodity-consuming sectors. So, sure, metal companies like Sail, Hindustan Copper, etc., may do well. But what about tires? What about auto ancillaries? I think all of those could be under a bit of a cloud because we are, anyways, looking at the margin expansion juggernaut coming to a bit of a halt. If there are corrective moves, then it may impact earnings for sure. So be careful on tire companies, on auto ancillaries, and some others which are commodity-consuming companies. They might be in for a rough ride in quarter four, and if not quarter four, definitely quarter one of F five twenty five. Samina, Neeraj, you talked about rubber prices, and I think crude is also a very critical input for all these companies that are rubber, where rubber is a key input, right? So it's going to be a double whammy. And what I think we've, and I'm glad you brought this up because we've not considered the crude impact. From late 70s or mid 70s, so really late 80s, may not be so much in the fourth quarter, but I think it's important for us to take notice that as we go into the new financial year post the fourth quarter, these are things that could once again impact uh, earnings uh, for a company or at least the bottom line. Uh, well, uh, tech stocks, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Uh, once again, Accenture has uh, is going to lead to a sell-off in IT stocks. This is exactly what we saw last quarter. Where the reporting came in from Accenture, it was disappointing. They seemed concerned about the outlook, and that led to the sell-off getting, getting kick-started in the IT stocks in India. This morning, it's no different. Uh, Accenture has reported numbers. They've said that they've reduced their guidance to one to three percent versus two to five percent, due to uncertainty leading to clients or reducing spending on consulting services. And Neeraj, I think you might have perspective on this as well, right? Uh, what I want to understand is the decline in spend is because of AI and operational efficiency, or is it because companies are actually slowing down? So, is this good for Accenture, or is it bad? If there are lesser seats on back of AI, I'm not sure how to look at this, but because that's going to hit your bottom line straight up. Yeah. So, okay, maybe two, three buckets. Yeah. I was trying to go through it. So, for generative AI business, Accenture has actually had some great deal bookings. So that's part one. That's a good one. thing. Um, are clients not coming out and and spending? So managed services that vertical has seen growth, which is at a decadal low, and that is the key problem uh, for Accenture. The revised outlook, by the way, is one to three percent versus two to five point percent. Yeah. So that's the uh, the, the other piece. And Samina, you very rightly pointed out, Co Accenture last quarter also was weak. Cognizant last month was not mm. that great either. So they also kind of slounged shaky. So. On back of all of that, um, it certainly looks like demand is not coming back in a hurry. And you know, there's a there's there's this note from Jeffries. Uh, we kind of quoted some of this uh, day before yesterday when we were doing talking about IT services on the trade on on the editor's cut. But they point out that the Nifty IT valuations at 26 P, which is a 13 percent premium. To the, I, I think the note will come up on your screen. Jeffries on IT services. Uh, that's the part of my stocks to watch list. But they say that the Nifty IT valuations at 26 PE is at a 13 percent premium to five-year averages and 29 percent premium to Nifty, and that seems rich. So therefore, no reason for Nifty IT to trade at the valuations that it is trading at at a point of time when uh, the outlook seems to be so. Backy and the Accenture commentary, Samina, uh, the CEO Julie Sweet saying that we see pressure in the volume of our smaller deals, and that's why we have that one to three percent guidance for the full year. Unless demand improves at the margin, how will smaller deals improve? And if that doesn't happen, how will the companies be able to give any kind of confidence on the guidance? There's a problem there. There is a problem, and I think uh, till elections in the U.S. are not out of the way as well, non-committal 
is big, it's been the you know the key word that we've seen across. So no green shoots, and even in the last couple of weeks, Neeraj, I don't think we've heard of too many big order wins apart from TCS that got their regional bank in the U.S. Yeah, we have a little bit of activity on Wipro this morning, but honestly, the last six to eight weeks uh, it's been quiet. There have been no announcements to the exchanges of any of the Indian tech companies actually winning big orders. And let's not forget, Jeffries has indicated this, that valuations of the sector are still looking rich. So you've got to be selective in the space. You've got to keep in mind that things aren't improving globally. And we've already seen that. Uh, so lots of moving parts. So after the dollar, that of course, uh, the losses in the IT stocks in India today may be offset by a stronger dollar. But we'll have to wait and see of how trade opens up for this space. Uh, uh, well, uh, moving on from IT, so Infosys and Wipro, both those ADRs were down in the range of one and a half to four percent. These will get uh, gap up, uh, gap down in today's trade. Most certainly. And just that one line before we move that, uh, Samina, the Jeffrey's note also says that weakness in Accenture's EMEA, FS, and the communication verticals has negative read through for Tech Mahindra, TCS, and CoForge in particular. So. Hmm. Uh, while CoForge and Infosys are the top Topics, ideas. Yeah. So I was a little confused about yeah. that because they said this is a negative for CoForge. Yes, but there is a negative for CoForge. So maybe the reading might be negative for the near term for CoForge, TechM and TCS. Maybe those stocks react a bit more. I think it'll be interesting to see. Right. So there's uh, that on the IT pack. That is going to be the biggest talking point in the sector of the day from what uh, we expect. Well, along with that, uh, I don't think we've spent a morning in the last couple of days not talking about Tata's. <laughs> this morning too, we will do exactly that. Tata Communications, they've approved a slump sale of the digital service business to subsidy Novamish at 458 crores. Uh, uh, it'd be interesting to watch out. There's been quite a bit of news flow on Tata Com as well. Yesterday, there were technical analysts giving a buy call on this one. Uh, it'd be good to see how the stock reacts. Neeraj, uh, this would be viewed as a negative or a positive. I'm not too sure. I mean, a slump sale of a, of a failing subsidy uh, to a uh, steward subsidiary Potentially a negative, but because I guess there's an approval coming to do that sale, they could be viewed as a positive, maybe because it comes off their books. Yeah, one that and two, not a very large sum, yeah, for uh, and, and, and yeah. that important a business now in the larger yeah. scheme of things of what they are trying to so, do. So really rather than significant in terms of uh, stock reaction, you've also got Tata Chemicals. Now this is uh, one bad news after the other. Actually, this is the first thing that the company has come out and made an announcement which will impact the counter. The income tax department has imposed a small fine in context or relative to the size of Tata Chem to the tune of 103 crores. Tata Chem will be appealing against this before the appeal against the centre. They expect a favourable outcome on this. Now, whether the markets are going to believe that is anybody's guess, but I would imagine the stock will more than likely get a gap down in early trade. Karnataka Bank, they've also launched a QIP issue last evening to run, raise funds. The floor price was six. It's been fixed at 231 rupees. So pretty much uh, at yesterday's close, about a percent, two percent off from yesterday's closing. Prestige Estates, uh, real estate has been in a bit of a slump, at least in terms of stock performance recently. But Prestige, uh, you know, widening its footprints across the country, have acquired a large piece of land in Delhi NCR. Uh, for about 62 and a half acres for about 468 crores. So activity robust uh, for prestige for now at least, Neeraj. Mm, most certainly. So those are a few things and prestige is in news for more reasons than one. Remember, NDTV Profit has that exclusive over the Marriott tie-up as well. Uh, that aside, uh, LNT, there's a board meet on March 27 to consider fundraising and a debt sale. So watch out for uh, that stock in the session today in case there is a reaction. Uh, Bloomberg learns that Indigo is nearing a decision to order nearly 30 Airbus A350 jets. Uh, remember, plane availability has been a bit of a bummer for Indigo in the recent past as well. But this is the wide body. Watch out for this one. And uh, some brokerage notes before we get into uh, the political development as well. Um, remember, a few days ago, Torrent Power won two projects. Uh, now, Morgan Stanley has come out with a note on those two project wins. They say, that they expect both the projects to have downside risks on the currently estimated capex, which means capex could be lower for torrent power on both of those project wins. They expect both the projects to generate a mid-teens IRR, which is actually pretty significant as well from, from that perspective. And Morgan Stanley believes that our, their FY27 EBITDA can see a 7 to 8 percent upside as both projects get commission. Now, Torrent Power has had a bit of a reaction to these project wins already. Maybe, just maybe, 
there could be some more here. So do watch out. Look at that chart. The last one month has seen a bit of a reaction while the rest of the power space hasn't. So be mindful of torrent power today. And some other brokerage calls, I mean, there are a clutch of them out there, but the CLSA note on Amber, uh, so yeah, we haven't given you the brokerage here, but I'm reading it out, so hear me out. Amber Enterprises has been raised to a buy at CLSA with a price target of 4,300, but this is a great table, by the way. Indian Bank rated a new buy at Access Capital, price target of 600. Sarah Sanitary Wear raised to a buy at IIFL, price target of 8,230. And Siemens raised to an ad at Avenda Spark, with a price target of 5101. Certainly, Amber on CLS Samina seems to be pretty strong because a clutch of brokerages are very bullish on that one. And we've seen that in the stock. The stock has been pretty much on a tear in the last few days. Also, a quick one, I don't know if we talked about this or not, but uh, Sunil Singhani of Abacus has actually gone out and acquired 1% stake in LT Foods. Uh, remember, LT Food uh, runs the brand called Tawat. Uh, they own 50% of the market share, or Basmati market share in the US. So this will be an interesting one. And of course, they've also gone on and said that the stock, uh, uh, the company could see a growth of 4 to 5x going ahead. The stock has also done quite well, so there's no, no questions there in terms of how the performance of the counter has been. Uh, if I have to just pull that up, uh, the stock has gone up uh, pretty substantially. 85% uh, is the kind of gain we've seen on LT Foods. It's the first time that uh, Sunil Singhani has picked up stake in LT Foods. And they've said that, you know, with the, with the, with the industry now moving to becoming very brand conscious and demand shifting from the unorganized players to organized players, LT Foods could be a key beneficiary. You track Sunil Singh Hardy quite a bit near it, so... No, no, I track a everything big, markets, uh, but a yeah, big one. When, when they bought this two days ago when the stock was at 162, since then the stock has actually rallied quite non significantly stop. as well, so interesting moves there for that one. Yeah. Let's wait and watch how this shapes up. But the other big development, as we said, um, as we move on from stocks to um, a quick segue into what's happening on the political side, um, and Arvind Kejriwal getting arrested. Amitabh Tiwari joins in to talk about the significance of this. Amitabh, great having you. Thanks for taking the time out. How did you read into the overnight developments? See, essentially, I mean, uh, it's a big move because now we have both the CM and the former CM of a party which was uh, created out of a movement uh, on corruption now behind the bars. Now, there are uh, uh, many angles to it. One is a political angle, of course. One is a legal constitutional angle, uh, angle and one is a ethical or a moral angle. Now, who will be CM remains a very big, big question because Amadni Party has said that uh, uh, Arvind Kejriwal will continue as CM from the jail itself. But while legally it could be tenable because he continues to be a, an MLA and he has not yet been convicted, whether morally it is correct or not, or whether the LG or the central government will intervene, whether this matter we go to courts, now we'll have to see. See, Delhi witnesses a split voting. That is, it, it votes for BJP in national elections and votes for Aam Aadmi Party overwhelmingly in a state election, which means that it has a lot of swing or a neutral voters. Now, we'll have to see whether this uh, uh, creates or generates any sympathy for Arvind Kejriwal or not. That's what he will, he will or his party will try to do. But we'll have to see whether any sympathy is generated. And even if it is generated, it, it does it work in a national election or does it work largely in a state election? It also seems that uh, this issue could bind the opposition together because it was fairly in, in disarray and uh, ED raids and targets on opposition leaders could, could bind them together. Uh, will it become the topmost issue of the elections going forward along with electoral bonds and all? Uh, I have my doubts uh, over it. Will it uh, uh, be very detrimental to BJP's uh, 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 grand positioning, let's say, or BJP being the favorite in the elections to win? Uh, that's also not very clear at this moment uh, because Amani Party is not a national party. He's not the president of the Congress party that it could have a, a significant uh, impact. Now we'll have to see uh, how does this uh, pan out and how does opposition and the ruling party take forward this, this case.
Amitabh, in terms of what is expected now over the course of the next couple of days, of course, this comes in on the heels of a similar situation that we saw in Jharkhand about a month ago, where the JMM leader and former Jharkhand CM uh, was arrested by the ED in a, in a money laundering case, and they had to go out and you know frantically look for a replacement. Uh, if Mr. Kejriwal doesn't get immunity from the Supreme Court, uh, will the CM be replaced? So the Aam Aadmi Party would not want to replace him. See, again, because uh, they would want him to continue as CM. Is, is that what they have claimed? Now, that's for legal uh, eagles to see because uh, he is a C he is an MLA. He's not yet been convicted of sorts, correct? So he is eligible to be CM. Now, that's a moral or a ethical question. Should he be, should he do so? Because as you said, Hemant Soren uh, resigned and, and, and gave over the mantle to somebody else. In case of Lalu Yadav, he he gave the he passed the mantle to his wife. So this will need to be seen whether he resigns on his own, whether he he puts up a replacement, or if he doesn't, uh, do the courts intervene? And if the courts don't intervene, does the central government intervene? Because the LG and the 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 Amadmi party also do not have a very great rapport, and he could also intervene and 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 take over the reins of the uh, uh, Delhi uh, government. So it's, it's, it's sort of an, a constitutional crisis which has been created uh, by his arrest. Hmm. Amitabh, what, so, so as things stand, what is it that now um, is to be watched out for? Because I heard you say that uh, Delhi has this split vote, swing vote. Does this event bind together the opposition? Does this bring about sympathy votes for Ketriwar? Only time will tell. But in terms of events and timelines, what is it that you are watching out for, considering that we have the calendar out and these developments have happened? So essentially, I will have to see whether he gets, first of all, any legal immunity or not. And then we'll have to see how does uh, Kejri, uh, Amadni party make this a campaign. Because ultimately, any issue, I mean, the political parties will have to make it a campaign to, 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 to reach to the masses and convince the voters that a wrongdoing has been done uh, on uh, them or on their leaders uh, through the uh, uh, help of central agencies, allegedly, by the BJP. So this sort of messaging, now it's all about messaging because it's largely also, first of all, speaking to the converted. So uh, voters who are on the side of BJP, will largely believe that uh, whatever the central agencies are doing is, is right and voters who, who are on the side of AAP will feel that uh, corruption needs to be tackled. However, it's the neutral voter and it re remains very difficult to, to, to gauge now what is the impact of the neutral voter. Uh, we should also keep in mind that corruption as an issue normally works for a party which is in opposition. So BJP used it to the hilt in 2014. If as a ruling party, you want corruption to work in your favor, then that government has to show action. Now, what's action? Is action uh, putting people behind bars or is action getting people ultimately convicted? Because we've seen that the ED does not have a great record of conviction. So that's a thin line of difference. So BJP perhaps hopes that this action shows that uh, or, 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 or strengthens PM's resolves that uh, there is no room for uh, corruption or he has a zero tolerance for, for corruption, whereas the opposition will pitch in the idea that there have been no convictions and these are merely uh, uh, political vendettas. So this is a battle which also now will be fought in a uh, legal court as well as in the courts of, of public. And since Congress and Amadmi Party have an alliance in Delhi, However, numerically, it is uh, it is still uh, weaker than the BJP because BJP had more than 50% vote share in all the seats, and they have formed an alliance in three, four uh, more states, uh, including Gujarat, Haryana, etc. We'll have to see how this uh, uh, issue uh, pans out on a pan-India level. Uh, may not be an issue which significantly tilts uh, 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 the scales in in favor of the opposition at a pan-India level, though at this level.
Right. Thank you very much, Amitabh Ji, for joining us and breaking this down for us and what this really means uh, from a bigger macro political picture. Let's not forget that the AAP is hoping that Kejriwal's arrest will stir the people and further consolidate the 12 year old party. The chance of AAP disintegrating in Kejriwal's absence for now, like even Amitabh indicated, seems very, very unlikely. Well, uh, on that note, we'll take a quick break. Imply Nifty indicates to a flat to lower start. We'll put the spotlight in, on FNO uh, right after this break, so stay tuned. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real guys, there are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term, when to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask. of the day has been or rather the last 12 hours is Accenture cutting its guidance now we've spoken about it in the trade setup let's break it down in detail Agam Johnson uh, for that Agam good morning uh, good morning well so firstly uh, of course Accenture has cut its uh, fiscal 24 revenue guidance to one to three percent from earlier suggested two to five percent what's really worked against Accenture and it's indicative in the kind of price fall that we've seen down 9% in trade yesterday was the fact that their suggestion was that the clients are now very, very tight-fisted when it comes to discretionary spending. Their budgets have also come under substantial constraint and smaller deals are harder to come by. The reason why smaller deals are more important in this case is because revenue accretion is a lot faster as compared to some of your relatively larger uh, transformation deals where uh, revenue accretion is, is well, a lot slower. Moreover, the financial services vertical has seen a decline of as much as 6%. There is weakness in uh, some of your Asian markets as well. And a lot of these factors have a direct implication 
on the Indian IT sector. Now, uh, what does this mean? Is that because of the fact that the Indian IT sector gets the most amount of revenues from the US and it gets a majority of its revenues from the financial sector in the US, this commentary could certainly weigh down on uh, some of your names, which would include TCS as well as Infosys. What are brokerages making off this? We have a city note which suggests that, uh, uh, well, the the forecast suggests tightening in IT spends, and they are also suggesting that the pace of demand and recovery for demand will be a lot slower at the moment. Jefferies, once again, is suggesting that rising weakness in financial services vertical is something which will work against Indian IT companies. And we also have a note from Nomura, where the only positive, perhaps, is that generative AI uh, can, in fact, work in favor of well, uh, the, some of the factors that have done, some of the positives that have come through in Accenture. But all in all, uh, well, they are very, very circumspect on the kind of implication it can, in fact, have on the Indian IT sector, given the slackness in demand, which is ever more visible. Okay, Agam, thanks for putting that into perspective. Maybe you might have a question for Mosha Khatri. He joins in right now, Managing Director, Equity Research of IT Services and Payments at Redbush. Uh, uh, Mosha, thanks so much for joining in. Uh, how did you read into what Accenture has uh, done in terms of its guidance cut and the internals, particularly the managed services business? Uh, first, good to be here. Um, I would say a couple of things. I don't know if they said anything new, frankly, in terms of the comments and in terms of where we are in the cycle. Um, so we knew that budgets had been pushed out probably about, about a month and a half for calendar 24. Uh, typically budgets are done maybe by sometime in mid-February, early February. Now they're gonna be done by the end of March. If budgets are not ready, you have uh, less fresh funding for new programs to start. Obviously that's, that pertains to the discretionary part of the business. Um, and then on top of that, you also have, and I, you know, there's one more thing, by the way, that was positive in Accenture's numbers, which is the bookings, which were very strong. Um, but then you have disparity, the, the disparity in, between bookings and conversion. And I think that's been impacting everybody in the space, including the tier one offshore vendors. So you're getting these huge amount of, um, of, of bookings in the past six, uh, nine, 12 months, but they're not converting on time. They're taking longer to convert. So it's a combination of all these things that kind of told us that the next quarter is not going to be pretty and it's going to be pretty muted for the for the group. Um, we do believe that post uh, this quarter, you know, for Accenture, it was a February quarter and then an August fiscal year. But for the, the companies that you're talking about, this is a March quarter. Post the March quarter, we should start seeing a sequential uptick in growth. And I think the year will be back and loaded. So. It's it's kind of uh, it's a mixed bag because the bookings are here, but you're not converting them, and that's been the issue for about six to nine months now. Um, and on top of that, you have budgets that are not done yet; they're not ready, and that also impacts spending on discretionary. Uh, and I think that's what Accenture's numbers tell you: the bookings again, decent bookings, but will take time for these to convert. And it's been it's been the case for the industry for a couple of quarters now. Musha, hi, it's also Samina joining in. And we spoke to you last quarter around the same time when Accenture had reported earnings. And you had in, and that was very soon after you had made a trip to India where you had met a whole bunch of Indian tech companies as well. And you did indicate that things for the Indian tech companies wasn't as bad and things were not slowing down as badly as the street was expecting or seeing it as. Any updates uh, on spends, on order wins? Because honestly, in the last eight weeks, uh, none of the big tech companies have reported to the exchanges about any big order wins. Yeah. Um, what last we spoke, it was more about the quarter, and I said the quarter was better than feared. And I think that's where we are. We, it, it's kind of we're kind of stalling for a couple of quarters where things are not getting worse, but they're not getting better. In order them for them to get to get better, you need to see these bookings convert, and that's the bigger issue here. Um, you're right; we have not seen any large booking announcements um, year to date. Um, but again, 
you know, the some of the companies will tell you that not, not everything gets released or is announced, and these tend to be pretty lumpy. So, you know, but ironically, even if we see deals announced, they're not converting. <laughs> That's the issue. Um, it's a very unusual situation that I have not seen, you know, throughout the years that I've covered the space. Clients awarding contracts, but they're not converting, and they're telling you to stall until they get a better feel on the macro and, you know, on Fed's cutting rates. Sure, why are they not converting? I mean, the Fed, of course, is not, I mean, we, I read Vanguard this morning and they said they don't even expect the Fed to cut rates this year. You have elections uh, later this year. Uh, if there is a commitment and there is no conversion, how do you read it? I mean, how do these tech companies take decisions, make decisions at this stage? So Chairman Powell did indicate that he expects about three rate cuts this calendar year, later this year. So that it will happen. The question is when. Um, and then the I don't have a good answer for your question. I, I don't know why award a contract while knowingly that you're not going to convert, you know, immediately. And again, it's a very unusual situation. Um, and I don't I don't really have a good answer for that. Uh, what are you doing with the Indian tech companies? Are you constructive? And if yes, uh, anything specific that you like, any specific themes that you're uh, following where you're feeling a little more constructive? Because I do know it's the smaller ones uh, that seem to be uh, maybe a little more frugal and hence better placed at this stage, at least for what we are looking at it from this side of the world. Yeah, we do believe that, as I said, post the, the March quarter, we should start seeing an inflection point in terms of sequential growth in the group. Uh, we like emphasis. We cover it. We have an outperform rating on the stock. Um, we like some of the smaller names. Uh, we like Cognizant. Uh, we like some of the um, names that have more of a global delivery model, including Eastern Europe, Latin America, and India, like a Globant or an EPAM. Uh, but again, the March quarter will be a muted quarter for the group. Uh, and after that, we should start seeing that inflection point. Moshe, just one last question. Uh, people are talking about subsets which might be doing better. ERND has had some order flows, um, LTTS and some others. I don't know how closely you look at them. And some of the smaller names, like the, the ones which are in the enterprise business and catering to the Middle Eastern geography, the Indian banking vertical companies, enterprise businesses, they seem to be doing OK too in terms of order flows and closing products, maybe. Any thoughts on that aspect of the Indian IT space? Yeah. Um, and you are correct. There are some pockets of strength. Um, I mentioned a company called Globant. Globant has an outsized exposure to Latin America and to the media sports <clears throat> and entertainment vertical. And that vertical is doing you know, relatively better than some of the others. So that company, for example, is guided for 16% growth this year. So yeah, um, I think when you look at the group, you have to look at the end market in terms of regions, and you have to look at the vertical exposure. And based on that, that actually should kind of give you a feel on how well this company should do based on their end markets, if you will. OK. Moshe, thanks so much for joining us and giving us this perspective. Um, I uh, really appreciate it, and have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. All right. That's the view from Wedbush on right, yeah, a bit more constructive than what uh, people would have than what I would have thought, uh, but uh, at least Moshe Katri is. Let's see how the stocks behave today and whether they see a bit of bottoming out or no. It certainly will pull out the index lower, Agam, isn't it? Let's get him in now for the derivative cues. We are maybe five, seven minutes late, so viewers, apologies for that. But it was important to talk about tech, and now it's important to talk about the derivative space. Uh, good morning yet again, Agam. Yeah, well, you know, ever since, uh, every, every time you see a little bit of an improvement in the index, uh, you tend to have cues which, in fact, weigh down on them. And today, ID sector does seem like it's going to weigh down on the Nifty. Uh, that said, yesterday was a day of improvement. We saw short covering in the bank Nifty. The Nifty once again reclaimed 22,000. So those are the two uh, small positives coming through. But it does seem like, well, things could perhaps once again get just a tad bit rocky going into today. The Nifty futures saw unwinding, uh, and again, this is playing out to the trend through the last 15, 20 sessions. Uh, the Bank Nifty, again, we did see unwinding, but this was on a bout of short covering. 
Uh, as far as your weekly options go, and we are going into a new week at the moment, with, uh, in new uh, weekly options uh, expiry coming through, uh, concentration is around the 22,000 mark in terms of calls as well as puts. Even if you look at the maximum open interest, your overall open interest distribution, you'll see that 22,000 has the one with maximum open interest in calls as well as puts. What does this mean? It does mean that at the moment and over the course of the next few days, traders are expecting the Nifty to consolidate further, move in and around 22,000 at the moment. In terms of stocks, it was a good day of trade. We saw a lot of longs coming through. Uh, Coal India, LNT, SRF, Tata Steel, Sale, all of them looking at an up move with an addition in open interest. And in fact, even in terms of stocks, we saw decline in open interest had an advance in their underlying. So about a short covering for Glenmark Pharma, PVR, Inox, Indus Tower, uh, Indus, uh, HAL, as well as NMDC. So a whole lot of these companies uh, have seen, well, uh, you know, uh, will flag factors play out. So that's something that we are going to uh, well, be watching out for as we move into uh, today's day of trade. Mm. Okay. Um, that's interesting. Uh, and do we have Amar Dev Singh, in which case we can try and uh, get some of the strategies from him. Um, Amar, I'm sure Agam has questions for you, but very quickly, just an opening here. Um, good morning to you. Are you trading the indices via the options route? Yeah, very good morning. Yeah, definitely. Uh, see, uh, what we are seeing is that uh, the indexes, uh, the indices are consolidating, and uh, that's a good way to play. You've got to watch out for the levels because yesterday from the highs, we witnessed some sort of uh, selling there. Uh, so on the downside, I would say anywhere between 21, uh, 20, 1,800, 850, 900, that's a very strong support zone. So any pullback uh, of 100, 150 points, that's a buying opportunity because if you look at the trend, it means positive. If you look at the derivatives data, that also is, uh, if you look at the next uh, uh, for the monthly series, that's uh, bullish. So clearly tells me that uh, there is uh, some upside, but yes, upside seems to be capped around the 22,200, 250 zone. It's more of a trader's range uh, with no clear-cut trend in the short term. Right, Amar. So can you take us through uh, Siemens? I believe you have a call there, and this one has been showing a lot of strength of late. Uh, correct. So if you look at uh, Siemens, Siemens has been on an uptrend. It did consolidate for a few days. Uh, looking at the, at the technicals data, that continues to be very strong. Looking at the, at the derivatives data, the, there we are witnessing long build-up happening. And the stock is, continues to trade at record highs. So this is one stock one can look at from the futures perspective, March futures, any pullback towards 4,900, 4,920, that's a good level uh, for entry with a stop loss of uh, 4,780 and a target of 5,330 on the upside. And uh, well, the second stock to look at is uh, from the finance space, that is Mutut Finance. Again, this is one stock which has been consolidating last couple of days, the stock has been strong weekly, the stock is up by uh, more than 6%. Monthly, the stock is uh, strong and positive. Daily, also, we are seeing a pullback in the stock. Derivatives data also clearly shows that there is long winter that is happening. So one can look at a bull call spread here, buying a, a 1400 uh, March call option at 40 and selling a 1440 call option at 19 uh, with a stop loss of 10 and target of 45. So th these are the two picks that one can look at. Interesting. Uh, uh, Amar, you know, when it comes to Mudur Finance specifically, uh, do you think that uh, considering there isn't as much time left for in the March expiry, you could perhaps just go ahead and buy a call uh, instead of, in fact, bear, uh, playing out uh, a bull call spread? What is the difference between the two? Yeah, so basically bull call spread basically helps you tide over the time decay to a certain extent. Buying a call is a good option provided your timing is perfect. So if you look at uh, yesterday, the way uh, Mutut Finance rallied, or if you go back, uh, to the previous day. Uh, Mutut Finance, uh, this uh, call was trading around, uh, this 1400 call was trading around 4 rupees and which is currently trading around 40. So major move has already happened in the stock. So so going at a, or going for a bull call spread would be more appropriate rather than entering at the current levels for a, uh, a buy call. All right, Amar. Uh, well, we leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining us and taking us through your views in the markets and also giving us a handful of uh, stock trading ideas. Uh, with that, it's uh, back to you all. Thanks, Agam. Ah, that was the FNO picture, trading calls coming in from Amar Singh Dio. We also have with us Kush Bora, founder at kushbora.com, joining in with his uh, view on the markets. Uh, Kush, morning. Uh, thanks for joining in. It was quite the pullback in yesterday's day of trade. Uh, this morning, though, a little subdued, at least that's what the implied nifty is indicating. Uh, and IT could be one sector that could 
could impact the index. Uh, on the Nifty, what's the trade? Hi, Samina. First of all, very good morning to you, uh, to all the panelists and all the viewers. Well, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it entirely surprising because you know we've been talking about that change of twenty one eight hundred to twenty two thousand two hundred. Now, while the Nifty did dip below that twenty one eight hundred mark, we didn't really close uh, below it. And I think everything happened, you know, that happened in the global space perhaps just you know brought us right back on that uh, twenty two thousand the pivotal mark. From here on, you know, I'd be surprised if Agam already didn't flag off uh, the 22,000 put base that we are seeing for the coming week. Now, that alone for me is, uh, you know, testament to the fact that the market is believing that the 22,000 to 21,800 zone will perhaps be protected in the near term. So I'd actually go out and say, play the range. If you get any kind of dips closer uh, to 21,900, 21,800, you know, again, uh, it'll not be a bad idea to initiate a long position. Just a little wary of initiating it here, because as you said, you know, the IT effect will start playing out. Plus what we've seen is that, uh, you know, uh, during uh, the expiries or at least around the weekly expiries, what happens is uh, the index tends to close around these, uh, uh, you know, these round figure numbers. The next week is a truncated one, so we might see a truncated activity also. So 22,000 remains a pivotal range, 21,800 to 22,200 is the range, and I'll play the range. Bank Nifty has a very strong risk reward ratio uh, going for it. So, uh, you know, 46,400, 46,300, any dip closer to that level, I'll be a buyer for targets of 47,100 and 47,500. So, that's the overall view. Still, I would say it's a buy on dips kind of, uh, you know, a market, but perhaps with a slightly smaller ticket size. Right. You know, uh... Around the second week of March, there were a couple of uh, analysts, uh, Kush, who were giving out buy calls on ITBs. Uh, and of course, there were movements in that space. We did see a little bit of traction too. Now, this morning, if you're still running those positions, uh, what does one do? I'm, I'm a little confused because suddenly the commentary has now you know, gone, it's turned for the bad. It has indeed. And uh, so IT for me is now starting to shape up a lot like metals. Uh, except for the fact that, you know, the metal space is a lot more volatile and, you know, the IT space isn't. Now, if you see a lot of these big names, you know, including uh, TCS, you know, Wipro, some of the names that we've, we've been constructive on, even they've gone into, uh, you know, a sideways consolidation uh, mode with a negative bias. So here, I think, you know, you should hold on to some of these positions as long as, uh, you know, the global commentary remains positive, uh, you know, the hopes of rate cut remains alive, there will be uh, these bouts that, you know, you'll see in the IT space. Now, even the mid-cap space, you know, in the IT names, which was doing rather well, is perhaps starting to give way and, you know, that is a cause of a concern. But on the whole, I will hold on to these positions. Even though there is a negative bias, most of these names haven't really gone into a structural uh, downturn just as yet. So hold on to some of these names. There will be pressure. The movements may not be as sharp on the uh, you know on the way up, but uh, you know constructively, structurally, nothing has changed uh, you know too drastically. Got it. Kush, uh, good morning, Neera Jaya. Uh, what are the stock recommendations for the morning? Morning, Neera. Couple of stocks. Uh, Indian hotels, uh, you know, seems almost unaffected by whatever is happening around it. So you know that stock remains a buy. Any kind of tip, uh, you know, will be an opportunity to add more. From the near-term perspective, 575, 585 are the targets. 555 is where I would place my stop loss. One stock, which is a fairly recent listing, but uh, seems to be, you know, on a very strong footing is Jyoti CNC. This is a cash stock. This stock too, uh, in the near-term, could see an upside to say, you know, um, 655 levels. 620 is where you could place your stop loss. So a couple of uh, stocks. And these are the names where, you know, any kind of dip should actually just prove to be buying opportunity. Okay. Well, uh, Kush, the, while we spoke about IT, the other, the other space which has done really well in trade yesterday were metals. Across the board, there was buying scene. Is this a yet another false breakout? Or do you reckon that the chart showed some more upsides for the metal names? So... Uh, it's a very mixed pack kind of, uh, you know, a scenario. I have a couple of names uh, which, you know, I will continue to buy, continue to hold, even if there is any kind of, uh, you know, uh, averse, uh, you know, a condition that arises globally. Uh, Tata Steel is one of them. Hindalco is one of them. So these names, as long as, uh, uh, you know, my charts don't tell me otherwise and which they haven't been telling me, you know, I will continue to hold. 
can't say the same for a lot of other names so it uh, rather you know metal, my suggestion is it's only for those traders who have a very strong risk management system in place and can handle volatility and be extremely selective here this is not uh, you know like the psu rally that we saw that you know practically everything you bought was about you know what 10% up in two days here the volatility aspect will play out I'm not saying that, you know, uh, even with the kind of moves that we saw a couple of days uh, or rather since a couple of days in the metal name, uh, these names have uh, perhaps resumed an uptrend. So for me, it remains a very selective space. I will focus on the likes of Tata Steel and Hindalco. Everything else will perhaps be, you know, a momentum play, you know, on the day. Yeah. Kusha, stay with us. Uh, we're getting off a pre-open trade as well. It's going to be interesting to see how the Nifty opens up, how the IT pack opens up. In fever Pro, of course, could be seeing a gap down in trade. We'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll continue our conversation. And, of course, we'll also talk to Veranda Learning on their fundraising plans right after this break. So stay tuned. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downward... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. As we've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money, There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Quick updates from Veranda Learning because they expect revenue growth of 100% in FY25 and presume in order to do that, they are pulling out all stops including raising some funds via NCDs, not a very large fundraise and again not an equity dilution but an NCD fundraise but Mr. Suresh Kalpati joins in right now. Uh, Mr. Kalpati, thanks for joining in. Uh, is this the only fundraise that you would do or would you uh, also do an equity fundraise at some point of time? Uh Thank you for the opportunity to be on your channel. Um, first is, for us, it's a reinforcement of faith and the resilience of the platform that we are building, that Bearings Credit would lead this fundraise for us. This is an NCD, it's a debt instrument, so there's no dilution involved with this. This allows us to complete a couple of acquisitions. This adds another set of 20 odd schools and 10 colleges that comes under the management of Veranda Learning, and also through a Acquisition of SmartBridge would make us potentially the largest online virtual internship platform for software training in the country. Uh, it, we will continue to stitch the ecosystem together. Uh, there is also a green shoe option with this that will hopefully part finance the next race that we would do, which would be largely equity-like instruments, uh, convertibles, uh, 
that will allow us to sort of complete this journey of acquisition and fulfill our ability to completely stitch the platform together. So we expect to complete the next one over the next three to four months. Uh, and that will allow us to take our profitability to with the acquisition that we are targeting to potentially about 400 crores of EBITDA for FI25. And we expect our sales to double to cross the 800 crore mark for FI25. Sorry, did I did I hear you say 400 crores EBITDA for FI25? Because from a 233 crore EBITDA in FI23, you're virtually getting to doubling the EBITDA by FI25. Uh, the current businesses that we have will expect us to double our EBITDA going from 24 to 25. Uh -huh. Acquisitions that we are targeting will allow us to reach the 400 crore mark. Uh, we have always believed in acquiring businesses that are having pedigree and significant profitability in the markets. So that would add to the strength of what we are building. And as I mentioned, over the next three, four months, we'll come to an end of our significant acquisition cycle. And post this, it will all be organic. Got it. Uh, uh, Mr. Kalpati, one more question. Did I also hear you say that there will be some equity-linked fundraise that you would do? Uh, may, uh, could you just clarify what's the size of this equity fundraise, if you will? Uh, it would be a compulsorily convertible uh, type of instrument. So uh -huh. there would be, it would be equity. We just want to ensure that we keep our debt EBITDA ratio to probably about 1.5 to 1.75. So we want to stay under leverage. So the next fundraise will be equity like uh, this could potentially be anywhere in the range of between 800 to 1000 crores of rates. Uh, sir, hi, uh, it's also Samina joining in. Early this year, there was uh, news about uh, your, you taking over Tapasya Education Institution. Can you bring us up to speed with what's happening there? Uh, I guess you've already gone out. The first stage is done or will be done in the next few weeks. Uh, when does this turn revenue accretive? Uh, what are the couple of stages and when will this acquisition be completely done and dusted with? Uh, we expect to actually complete the acquisition, Samina, by early next week. Oh. Um, and we expect the full benefit of the acquisition to show as part of our FY25 numbers. And again, Tapasya will allow us to include an additional 23 junior colleges that we would manage and 10 colleges that would come under the management of our underlet. Okay. Well, Mr. Kalpati, we wish you all the best for this and more. Thanks for this quick update and all the best with the tall targets. Hopefully, do even better than that. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Not at all. That's uh, Veranda Learning targeting some pretty stiff growth uh, for the course of the next uh, 12 months. FI25 growth numbers targeted at 100% both on the EBITDA as well as on the top line front, if I'm not wrong. Uh, at least on the EBITDA front, they've just guided us to that as well. Um, it's uh, Pull up the one month chart uh, and the stock has corrected quite significantly. I wonder if Kush, you ever looked at this company. It's not a very large one, 1300 crores market cap, so small cap in that regard. Any thoughts on Veranda Learning? I'd wait and watch a little Neeraj on this one. For me, the support zone comes in at about 182, and then if that is taken out at 166, 165 kind of zones, it's just that, you know, this entire space hasn't really been a great wealth creator. And, you know, I'm talking from, uh, you know, a few years of uh, experience and, you know, a few uh, few other stocks which don't even exist you know, anymore in the markets. So uh, just a little watchful. The stock particularly, as you rightly pointed out, has been a, in, in a bit of a, a downturn. No signs at the moment of any kind of recovery. So I'll wait if the stock does indeed take support at, you know, those 180 levels and does attempt to rebound. Sure. Two big movers from yesterday, BSC and IRB Infra. Uh, do we have a strategy on both these stocks this morning? So well, BSC from a medium to a long term perspective for sure, uh, you know, is a buy. In fact, just as a disclosure, you know, we had recommended this uh, to our clients a couple of days ago. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's a standard disclaimer. From a near-term perspective also, there is momentum, but just that, you know, the kind of momentum that we saw yesterday and today, plus the stock resisting uh, near the uh, 20 and the 50-day moving average, there's a possibility that, you know, we might see some sort of profit booking. But, uh, you know, this stock is for sure, you know, a buy and hold uh, kind of a, a stock. From a medium-term medium -term perspective, you're looking at a target of 2555, 2555. And once that is taken out, even 2700, uh, you know, is on the cards. So BSE uh, continues to remain a buy. Uh, Samina, I'm sorry, which was the second stock that you mentioned? IRB infra 
Kush. Uh, yeah, I'm afraid yes. I'm having some difficulty loading no the chart. Yeah. If you could excuse me on that. Yeah. yeah. Also, anything on OMCs, uh, BPCL, HPCL, IOC, these have also become uh, pretty active in trade as of last as of the last couple of weeks. They have, but I would give it some more. Uh, Time because you know what we're looking at in some of these names is perhaps a rebound play. Uh, the one stock that stands out for me is IOC, and you know, I will have this on my radar if I'm uh, looking at any kind of a fresh entry. But some of the other names, you know, they haven't really broken out of the range or the resistance levels. Uh, then the move that we saw in the last two days could very well be just a dead cat uh, bounce, uh, you know, and might just fizzle out. Or in fact, you know, if not that, the stocks could consolidate, you know, over the next uh, week or so. So for me, IOC stands out. But other than that, I will be a little wary before I, uh, you know, park big money into, you know, some of these names. Mm. Okay. Well, viewers, the pre-open rate is about to kick in. We'll mark chemicals uh, in a moment because remember, SRF for the last few days, for example, has had a good move. And apparently, one of the reasons could be that the prices of BOPP film have increased 10% month on month, which is potentially a positive sign for SRF's packaging films business. Uh, uh, even as the raw material prices of uh, polypropylene have gone up. This is as per a Kotak note. So I'll mark that in just moments from now. But just to tell you what the pre-open rates, they are irrelevant in the first few minutes, but just mark them uh, as a token, well, all over the place. Let's give them a chance to settle and we'll talk about them in detail. Now, here's the interesting note. I will take in Kush Bora's view on that because SRF has had such a good move and also getting a fundamental guest on the same. But the Kotak note states that prices of BOPP film have increased 10% month on month which is potentially a positive for SRF's packaging film business. So watch out for SRF. If you look at the last few days, it's actually had a good run. Um, there is some pricing pressure on certain contract manufactured products, uh, which is a negative for NFIL, which is Naveen Florine. So that's to be kept in mind. Uh, there is a competition for PI Industries um, and its customer because of new shipments by Aztec, so that's brings PI into focus, and last but not the least, just at the risk of making you confused, but making doubt that as well, that there are market reports which suggest there's a shortage of nitric acid, uh, which is a key raw material for Deepak Nitrite and RT Industries. So watch out for RT and Deepak Nitrite as well. Remember, phenol spreads are under pressure. Soda ash prices are under pressure. So therefore, the Tata Chemicals and the Deepak Nitrites of the world might have an issue. So two or three stocks, per se, that stand out in this chemical space. One is Tata Chemicals, soda ash under pressure. Tata Chemicals has come off quite a bit recently. Uh, phenol spreads under pressure and nitric acid shortage. So Deepak Nitrite might have an issue. And SRF has some positives because of the developments that I mentioned on this. Now, Kush, chemicals have been chalk and cheese. Some have done well, some have not. I'd love to understand from you from these three names, which is Deepak, Nitrite, Tata Chemicals, and SRF. Is there a trade possible on any of those? So the only trade uh, that I see on the long side is on SRF. Uh, you know, the stock's actually broken out of a few uh, key resistance uh, levels, you know, 2,500 being, you know, the last one of them. So there's a positive trade that has to be uh, played on SRF, you know, for sure. There was volume-backed move yesterday also. The other two names, not so much, uh, but, you know, along the way, you did mention a couple of stocks. So if I could just get a quick word in. PI Industries 2 actually, uh, you know, has done well, uh, continues to consolidate with a positive buy. So here you could see an up move continue. And RT Industries, the stock that, you know, uh, also was mentioned, it's on the cusp of a breakout. So if I were to rank, then for me, it would be SRF, PI Industries and RT Industries. The other names, you know, I had a, a scan and we've also been looking at the chemical space. Right now, there isn't uh, much to tell that, you know, there's a long trade to be played on the other names. So these are, these are the three stocks that I'll have on my radar. Right. Uh, Kush, what would you... Okay, just stay with us. We'll come back to you in a minute, but it's uh, two minutes past nine. It is going to be the IT pack, like Neeraj said. Uh, Tech, Mahindra, Infosys, Wipro, Coforge, are stocks that are going to get a little bit of a... Um, beating in early trade. Uh, but we've got with us uh, Harsh standing by as always with a quick list of brokerages and their, their, their calls this morning. Brokerages, uh, Harsh, couple of good sort of buy calls coming in on the likes of Shriram Finance, which is a top pick uh, due to its healthy loan growth uh, from, of course, Jeffries. 
Well, yes, uh, absolutely, Samina. Healthy loan growth on the diversification of their portfolio expected uh, by Jefferies, and that's where the positivity is coming through and with regard to comfort on valuations. But let me also talk about some other triggers. One is uh, one commentary coming through is cr they expect credit costs to remain benign over the FY24 to 26 period. So that's one positive. The other positive also that Jefferies talks about is uh, that margins will not road in a big fashion will remain quite stable so that's in a certain sense a positive uh, uh, given the current environment now where uh, your valuations are concerned currently trading at around 1.6 times price to book largely in line with the five-year average uh, price to book that Sriram has traded at and that's where Jeffries is finding comfort what they are suggesting is that in an era where growth is going to be strong uh, as well as uh, there is profitability, lower credit cost, this kind of valuation could therefore leave room for upside. They've given it a target price of 2750, uh, Sriram Finance. Uh, quickly moving on, you have a Kotak institutional note coming in on Brigade as well. They've upgraded Brigade to an ad. They've left the target price unchanged at 1025. What they're suggesting is a 16% correction in the stock price leaves a window for uh, investors to basically uh, take advantage of this correction. Uh, now what they are suggesting is with regard to the construction ban uh, across Bengaluru, that's been the fear and that's been one of the reasons for the correction as per Kotak Institutional. Uh, they are saying that strong prospects on development, leasing and hospitality uh, gives this one a good upside. Uh, currently trading at roughly six times EV to EBITDA on FY26 uh, estimates. They are positive on this one and this could be uh, an opportunity to add actually Brigade. So uh, Brigade 1025 target price, Kotak with an ad. Right, that's the call coming on Brigade. Uh, it's a uh, pretty aggressive target price there as well. Along with that, uh, there'll be a whole lot of stocks that will be reacting in today's day of trade. Brigade is indicated to open flat. Uh, tech really will be grabbing the limelight in early trade this morning. Well, we also have with us Dipin Mehta of Alexa Equities joining in. Dipin, good morning. Thanks for joining in. Dipin, how have you read uh, those numbers coming in from Accenture? And as that as a backdrop, what would your tactical play be for the IT stocks this morning? Yeah, good morning and thank you for having me on your show. Yes, it's a mild disappointment that they have cut the uh, guidance. But beyond that, I haven't gone very deep into the numbers. But this is, I mean, to be expected, uh, given that tech spending has not yet picked up uh, in US and the rest of the world. But I'm I'm cautiously optimistic on tech, and I do feel that uh, second half of 2024 and 2025 year may be good years for the technology sector uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, you know, unlike past uh, situations when the tech sector ha was stressed because of lower spending. This time around, they are sitting on very good order book position, but just the implementation has not yet started. The billing hasn't started. And once I think there's more stability in US and Europe economy, we should see pick up in spending over there, which means that revenues should start to grow uh, in what we expect them to grow at. At the same time, this artificial intelligence thing is another big wave for tech companies like we had from so many waves we have had in the last 25 years or so, right from Y2K to internet to remote uh, management. So there are many such opportunities within the uh, um, AI space, which Indian companies can certainly explore. And that will lead to higher tech spending maybe a year down the line or so. So keeping these two in mind, I'm cautiously positive, but uh, you know, valuations right now are pretty much fair. So at corrections, there would be somewhat a margin of safety. We just mind that at corrections, there could be margin of safety. Dipan is not talking about going in right now. Unless I'm wrong, he's also not very constructive on the markets as well. So that's to be kept in mind. Dipan, good morning. Um, Neeraj here. Uh, we're starting to see uh, sporadic, uh, actually not sporadic, pretty linear set of notes coming in uh, for the banking names, talking about how valuations are the most attractive that they have been today. There's Bernstein, which is coming out and saying five charts and one message. HDFC Bank Circa has never been so attractive as ever before. I'm just asking you, would you put in money to work here or would you say, let the tide turn, it's okay to buy these stocks 5% higher, but might as well buy when the trend is changing? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, good morning. All depends upon the complexion of your portfolio. Hmm. 
And the real problem with HDFC bank and the private sector banks is that they are overowned. So in a portfolio, if you don't have adequate exposure to private sector banks, then this is a good time to add, even though our view on the market may be slightly negative, I do feel that private sector banks will outperform even in a, in a falling market, which means that they will fall less than the overall market. And if you're sitting on extraordinary cash in your portfolio, then it's a good strategy to buy into safe stocks like the private sector banks. I mean, if you're positive on India and Indian economy, then you can't be negative on India's largest private sector banks, likes of HDFC, ICICI, Kotak. And I completely agree with the brokerage note that in terms of valuation, these are kind of historically low valuations for these companies. No doubt growth rates, of course, have uh, petered out. They were not like 25, 30% what they were three, four years ago or so. But nonetheless, I think, you know, keeping in mind that uh, these companies can easily grow in mid-teens or so, the valuations are pretty decent. A lot of these companies are now available at less than two times, one and a half times of price earnings growth, which is amongst the cheapest benchmark if you compare to similar companies of same scale, uh, same potential, and same level of corporate governance. Yeah, that's the call coming in on HDFC Bank. Like Neeraj said, it's uh, brokerages that seem to be of the opinion that private sector banks could be a good play in the market right now. Uh, looking at pre-open, it looks like it's going to be a very rough start for some of those mid-cap IT names. Stocks like L&T Tech, Billa Soft, are all seeing a cut of 2 to 3 percent each at the least. That's, of course, opening gap downs that we are anticipating in trade. On the upside, you've got uh, actually Bharat Dynamics, HAL. Kush, it's been a few weeks. We've not talked about some of these defensive stocks because they all fell 30, 40 percent in the last couple of weeks. But they're once again finding their feet. Uh, on HAL and uh, Bharat Dynamics uh, and any other defense play, do you have a trade for a pullback? So uh, HAL and BEL, you know, these are the two stocks that, uh, you know, have taken support at key uh, levels and have attempted a rebound. So these are the two stocks that I have on my radar. Um, again, you know, despite the kind of uh, dip that we saw in these names, uh, these two stocks, uh, you know, stand out. They haven't been really, you know, as deep a correction, you know, as we've seen in some of the other names. So BEL and HAL are the two stocks that, you know, I will have on my radar. BDL is attempting a recovery, but, uh, you know, the, the move's just not as convincing yet plus on the up move the volumes really haven't been so great so i'll perhaps wait and watch a little on uh, bdl but hal and bel are the two stocks that i have on my radar mm -hmm. dipan um, psus having corrected so much recently do they now start i mean do they now look a bit more attractive or would you still be skeptical i mean i don't know See, if you were skeptical in the past sorry so let me rephrase my question uh, no, no, see, we, have been, we haven't been great fans of PSU for obvious reasons. I think it's a, a bit of a you know, baggage that a lot of investors carry, having seen PSUs not go anywhere for the past 20 years or so. And these companies are really playing a very strong catch-up as of now. Uh, now, certainly the prospects for a few companies has improved significantly, and I would say long-term prospects. Let's say the likes of companies which are engaged in capital goods, be it railways, be it power, I think those prospects certainly have improved. They are sitting on multi-year uh, order book positions, so there's good earnings visibility, and hopefully they are at good decent margins as well. So at corrections, I want to buy into such companies where there's good earnings visibility, and they typically fall into three three buckets. One is of course the defense companies that includes even the shipbuilders. The second is the uh, uh, the likes of BHEL and BEML, which are into pure play capital goods manufacturing, be it power plants or uh, you know whatever engineering they, work they do. And then the third is the railway company. So these are the three I would like to focus on more. I am not that positive on PSU banks. I, as I said, we discussed earlier, I'm more positive on private sector banks. I think uh, if you have to allocate money to the banking sector. Then uh, private sector banks, NBFCs like Bajaj Finance, Chola, I think uh, may outperform on a three-year time frame more than even the PSU bank. So that's the way I'd like to play the PSUs. But even in the even in the capital goods engaged uh, PSUs, the valuations are on the higher side. You want to buy them at around about 15 times, 20 times uh, trailing 12 months. And these companies are quoting at 25 to 35 times. So I think in a correction, you could look at them or then wait to catch up. Dipan, uh, one quick question uh, just before we go into market open. Your top three stocks that you're adding to or will add to your portfolio at tips? 
No, no, I'm not giving that list because I'm not adding anything to my list just now. And as I said, that our view on the market is cautious. And although the markets have been rallying the way they have, and we haven't seen any serious correction, but uh, you know, at this point of time, I'm just holding on to cash and waiting for uh, you know, uh, keeping the powder dry to look for. So, so Dipan, how much dry powder are you currently sitting on, if I may ask? It varies from portfolio to portfolio, but my advice to investors would be that you have to have at least 10% cash in your portfolio and, uh, you know, uh, maybe even higher is better. Uh, right now, I think it's not a great time to be fully invested in equity, but I do have another idea for you that maybe in 2024 and 2025, something which I never bought may do well, that is income funds, because interest rates certainly have peaked out in India and globally, and interest uh, and income funds are quoting, I would say, uh, income instruments are quoting at, I would say, nearly all, at fairly good lows from where you are assured of a fixed income because of the interest coupon. And should there be any cut in interest rates for whatever reason, or even could be even inflows from FIIs, then a rally in the bond market can make income funds extremely attractive. And there's a great deal of safety of capital. So that's one new idea I just want to place on the table. We normally don't talk about income funds or, you know, that kind of allocation. But it's something which has been playing on my mind. Fair call. Um, gentlemen, both of you, thank you so much for taking the time out and being with us. Really appreciate your time this morning. Um, about just five seconds left for the markets to kickstart trade. And uh, we'll have a start which is in the red courtesy IT. The question is, can banks and some of the others uh, recoup that? It's about a third of a percent and, or half a percent and courtesy IT. Nifty IT should come up on your screen. You will see over a percent, or three percent actually, kind of a cut here. Uh, quickly, mid caps also. Maybe a lot of IT names might be in the in the red, and that might be help. Maybe pulling the index a bit lower. But let's just quickly move to the heat map and let's see the space out here dominated by IT losses. HCL Tech four percent, Wipro three percent, Tech Mahindra, Infosys, LTI, TCS. Six of the top ten losers are IT names. The, I haven't seen this rate. Uh, for a while, not even when cognizant numbers were weak. So clearly, there is a larger green, but the index is still in the red, courtesy what's happening to ID. Now remember, this is also the first reaction. Maybe the stocks will be different as the day goes by, but it's evident that there is no demand recovery as yet, as Accenture has said. Remember, there's a note which I read which said Accenture's generative AI order book is more than the combined order book of the top 10 IT vendors in India. So that also tells you a story that that company is still doing well there. Maybe some of the Indian IT companies need to play catch up, but clearly pressure here. Okay, aside of that, um, not too much else. HDFC Life, Tata Steel, maybe minorly in the green, in the red. And what is in the green? Sun Pharma, there is Titan, UPL, maybe a little. Uh, Adani Enterprises up about a percent. There is a note today from Jefferies on Adani Enterprises with the target price higher than the current price uh, as well. ITC marginally in the green, but really not, Samina, there's not much to talk about this Friday morning aside of what's happening to tech. And tech is taking a serious beating. Yeah, but I do think Neeraj with the rupee seeing a gap down and the dollar looking stronger this morning, maybe those losses may recoup a little bit. But of course, for now, it's uh, it's a pretty ugly screen for IT. And those are uh, some of the top stocks on my broader market list as well. Across the broader market tech play, it is a sea of red. So from your Coforge to your LNT Tech to Emphasis to Build Us Off, that whole space is seeing a cut of about three odd percent. So uh, irrespective of what the companies are doing, whether in the service side or the product side, or even if it's ER&D, uh, the markets are doing a blanket sell on tech companies. Remember, it was only a few weeks ago that the biggest buy calls that were coming out from technical analysts were on ITBs. Uh, so that trend clearly changed uh, pretty much overnight for tech stocks. Yesterday was a good day as well, remember, because of the Fed uh, re-indicate, reinstating, reiterating that they will go with three rate cuts, but that excited only last a day with Coforge, Memphis, LNT Tech, uh, Billa Soft all seeing a cut of 3% in trade. Well, you've got a few more stocks that are on our radar. So if I can pull up Tata Chemicals, uh, 
Uh, the reason I'm pulling this one up is not because the news flow is that significant, uh, but it, it's also trading flat. So clearly what we thought was right, the stock not reacting too negatively to getting penalized for 100 odd crores. They are going to appeal the, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the applet court and it'll be interesting to see how that reacts. And the stock might be reacting positively because there's a good chance that there could be a positive reaction to that. Prestige is up 5% in trade this morning. Uh, and now why is that? Because Prestige has been aggressively widening its foot uh, footprint span India from being a south player to now, of course, in the north and in cities like uh, states like Maharashtra. Prestige has acquired 62 acres of land in Delhi NCR. It's a big buy coming for Prestige and the markets seem quite excited about that. So the stock is trading uh, with a gain, a pretty big gain of about 5 odd percent in trade. Apart from that, you've got a couple of brokerage updates. Amber Enterprise, Neeraj talked about this it, this morning. The stock has been on the move in the last few days. Continues to do well, 3.5% on Amber Enterprise. CLSA has increased their target price to 4,300, on back of which the stock is up 3%. Indian Bank has also been upgraded and so has been Sarah Sanitary. Sarah Sanitary is still picking up. It's up about a percent. Uh, it's a buy call from IFL. Uh, over the course of the day, you will see some more buying emerging on this counter from what I what we see it as but Neeraj all in all um, IT is dragging the index and if the markets were looking to take profits after yesterday's rally they found one in the IT pack yeah. you bet and that's what probably what's uh, that's probably what has done this uh, on the index today nifty IT down 3% is a very strong blow and probably an apt reaction to the internals of Accenture 3% lower for Nifty IT. In a bit, we'll get in Gautam Shah and talk to him about uh, his thoughts as well because important to put the charts and a long-term charts into perspective as well. But this doesn't look that great. What else? Actually, let's talk about the positives as well because the, actually, if you go to mm -hmm. see, the mid-caps and the small-caps are not doing that badly. So Sterling Wilson Solar is the top gainer, up about 5%. Today, Metro Brands, which has had a very a week full of ebbs and flows, has has done well. Indus Tower is about two and a half percent. Keep an eye out for that too in the session today. I wonder if Vodafone is active. What should bring up V and see what's happening with that stock. Vodafone is up about a couple of percentage points as well. So keep an eye out for those two names. Uh, there is uh, Sona Comstar, which is knocking on the doors of 700 yet again. Remember, it was up about 4 5% yesterday and up around the 1.6% today. So that's the other stock to focus on. Um, Motila Loswal Financial Services is up a percent and a half at 16.28. Yesterday, MK had a positive note. The stock, along with BSC, was up yesterday and is up again today. Actually, on that note, wonder what BSC is doing. That is up about. 0.7% as well. Just, just a few more, uh, Neeraj, to add to that list. You've got Mazgaon Docs. That stock is doing really well this morning. Uh, Open 2% higher, now trades 4% higher. They've accepted in the offer for land and building allotment. The total allotment has, is, comes in at a cost of 350 crores for a period of 29 years. You've also got Sarda Energy, small stock, but it's up 4% after the JV unit gets uh, a clearance for iron ore block in Maharashtra, 4.3% on Sarda Energy is what we have. Uh, Interglobe Aviation, if we can get that one on the screen, very ambitious plans there and the stock has been on the radar for a number of, uh, you know, brokerages, traders, 1% higher on back of their aggressive expansion plans. But along with that, uh, Prestige has fortunately taken the whole real estate sector higher this morning. You've also got stocks like, um, if we can get those ones, Brigade Enterprise, it would be interesting to see. Prince Pipes had an upgrade this morning, so stock doesn't look bad. SRF Neeraj talked about uh, this morning is seeing a good move as well. Uh, we have it as Gautam Shah, I believe. Yes, we do. So, Gautam Shah, founder and chief strategist at Goldilocks Premium Research, joins us on the show. Gautam, great having you. It's been a while. So, thanks for taking the time out and being with us. Thank you, Neeraj. Good morning. Happy to be here. Yep. Uh, well, happy to have you. Gautam, um, should the markets be happy by virtue of the Fed meet yesterday? Does it change the trend which was otherwise looking Pretty sketchy, particularly for the broader end of the spectrum. Well, I don't think so. I think the market is definitely looking a lot more energized, uh, more US and less uh, world equity markets. But I do believe that we have our own uh, positives. Uh, you know, clearly everybody talks about the liquidity. But at the same time, I think given the kind of uh, crazy up moves that we saw uh, in the last couple of months, I think a cleanup was always required. And I think the market went through an 
uh, absolutely amazing internal correction because when you look at the headline indices, you feel that nothing has happened, but you actually speak to people on the ground and talk about how the portfolios are doing. I think in general, stocks are down anywhere between 20 to 40%. So the headline indices, the mid cap 100, small cap 100, not so much, the NSE 500 have really not got impacted. So this is a cleanup which was very much needed. We are still in a consolidation phase. I don't think we are out of the woods as yet. And the market is likely to spend more time in a range and not make new highs in a hurry because the correction started with the small caps, then moved to the mid caps. And now you are seeing some large caps uh, come under pressure. And uh, till the Nifty does not really get past levels of 22,050 on a closing basis, I would want to believe that the chances of a dip uh, towards, say, 21,500 or maybe even a 21,000 is pretty high. So I don't think this market is running away anytime soon. It is still a very stock-specific market, so the index might not do anything special. But given the big damage that you've seen in the small caps, there are some select opportunities that are coming by. So once again, stay away from the large caps because the Nifty is looking a little uh, top-heavy, but the small cap opportunities remain. Interesting, Gautam, because everyone, uh, this is also Samina joining in, everyone, at least in the fund space, has been trying to rebalance portfolios towards a larger cap uh, space only because, one, they haven't performed in a big way, and secondly, because the risk reward may potentially be favorable. But uh, great point. There is probably more opportunity in the small cap space. Uh, a couple of months ago, I read one of your interviews that said that uh, 22,300 was your working target, and, you know, 20,900 uh, should be a good sort of support. Uh, for the markets. Uh, now, I want to pull out sectors and talk about how you feel about them. Uh, with the way the dollar index has been moving with the Fed's uh, rate decision, it seems like metals are on a bit of a sideline, at least in the last few days of trade. Uh, of course, that's the negative. The positive clearly being that uh, China's stimulus could be helping commodity prices higher. On the metal index and on metal stocks, are you constructive on anything here? See, firstly, don't get me wrong. I think from a medium-term, long-term perspective, we remain a big bull. And I think all of India's positives remain intact. And I think the liquidity, India's outperformance in the world, you know, all of it will play out and will take the markets higher. However, from a near-term perspective, I think there are challenges. And that's probably the reason I feel that there could be some more large-cap correction. I mean, I haven't seen in 20 years that the Nifty has lost 2% and the small caps have lost 12%. I mean, on an index level, forget about uh, individual stocks. So it's a very unique internal rotational correction that we've gone through. Having said that, I think this has become a very stock and sector-specific market, and metals are right on top of our list. I think we, we love the entire space. We think that metals could be one of the best performing sectors this year, along with uh, pharma. And, you know, stocks like Nalco, Sale, uh, JSW Steel, JSPL, uh, you know, Tata Steel, they all look good to us from a risk-reward perspective. Not so much other sectors, real estate, auto, capital goods, I think, which I think have run their course for the time being and need to go through a time correction. So our top two picks right now are metals and pharma. They, you know, those are the spaces where one can hide and apart from these through uh, these two spaces the two other big stocks that we like for this year and we've maintained this for a while now is sbi and reliance and i think both these stocks could really be the trades of the year right. wow sorry gotham did you say reliance and sbi as the stocks of the year Yes, I think uh, we've been maintaining this for a while. SBI, I do see it gradually move to four figures. I think uh, that's a big move if it were to play out. And Reliance is coming out of almost 18 months of consolidation. So I do see a 15% move there. And when you see some of these big stocks seeing such kind of moves, I just feel that the Nifty will stay protected. You know, so you will see phases where there will be a lot of fear. There will be pessimism on the screen. But some of these stocks will bail out the market from time to time. That's interesting. I remember when ITC used to be at Selka 200 and consolidating for such a long time is when Gautam Shah had come and said that there is probably a change in trend being seen. Um, then ITC had had a phenomenal run. I wonder if kind of Reliance is doing that because 18 months of consolidation is a very long consolidation. And, and maybe if you're bullish on the Nifty, at some point of time, Reliance does need to participate. Actually, in that same vein, Gautam, more than Reliance, HDFC Bank needs to participate, right? Every fundamental voice out there Today, there's a Bernstein note which says five charts, and we say that HDFC Bank is the best value that ever has been, something like that. Now, I mean, but everybody's found value in HDFC Bank at 1500, uh, 
1475, 1450 and the stock just doesn't budge. When does it move on the upside if it does? Yeah, I think all all tricks of the trade have been used on SGFC Bank to move and I think it has really worked so far. And I think it's just going to stay in a range because, you know, I think you've got into a situation where anything below 1400 and people will find great value and there will be a lot of buying interest and anything over 1500, 1550, there's going to be a lot of selling interest because just too many people are overly committed into one stock and that's led to underperformance for a lot of people in the market, sadly. So I think HDFC pretty much is going to be in a range 1380 on the downside, 1550 on the upside. And one does not need to overanalyze because if you look at the ratio chart, which is SDFC divided by the Nifty or the Bank Nifty, the underperformance continues. I think the better opportunity is probably in ICICI Bank, which I think could do much, much better. But banks, I think, uh, are in a sort of a tricky space because uh, 46,000 on the bank nifty is very important. If that number were to break, you could actually see a downtick on the bank nifty. So honestly, I'm just looking at SBI and some of the other top two PSU bank stocks, which is Canada and BOB. Apart from that, I'm staying away from banks because I don't think this is a market where you can be in high beta. Gautam, uh, until a few months ago, the start of this year, you were fairly constructive on the IT pack. Of course, uh, news flow like Accenture reviewing its guidance downward, Cognizant not very uh, positive on the outlook, uh, doesn't help the sector, right? Of course, a stronger dollar is one good news. Across the IT pack, uh, will you be constructive even today? And if yes, what are your three top stocks in the IT stack, stocks sector that you would recommend at this stage? Yeah, I think you are absolutely right. I think for three quarters now, we've been very bullish on the IT space. In fact, the IT index got very close to that level of 38,500, 39,000, which was the a lifetime high. And from there, we've seen this correction. The last one week hasn't looked good. Uh, the outperformance has gone to some extent, and this news flow today morning is not helping. So I think even the IT space has got into a bit of a uh, you know, hibernation mode. Uh, but still, from a medium term perspective, I would be a buyer. And but I would I would stay with the big boys. I, I still believe that TCS offers great value at these prices. There is not much to lose, and this this dip today is a good opportunity for investment longs, followed by HCL Tech and Wipro. So I would stay with these three big names, uh, and I would I would actually stay away from the mid cap space where I think uh, uh, there will be greater concerns because they were extremely overvalued. They had run up substantially over the last. Uh, uh, many, many months. So stay with the three big boys. I think that clearly would be the uh, recommendation from an investment point of view. Right. Uh, Gautam, thanks for that. And also pharma, that was the other sector that you alluded to at the start of our conversation. That's a good space to hide, you said. Uh, it's been on a solid footing for whatever it's worth. How much more upside for the pharma stocks? And your, again, uh, if anyone's looking to enter the pharma sector at this stage, at these prices, uh, where would they buy and what should they buy? I think the best is yet to come. I think pharma has been absolutely clean and smooth. We have seen consistently higher highs all along. And it, it is only going to get better and better because our working target is about 19,600 short term and about 21,500 on the index, uh, more medium term to long term. So it's clearly has been the place to hide. And I see continuous trend there uh, led by Sun Pharma, which is our favorite. And we've recommended it multiple times. Uh, Cipla, Dr. Eddie's. Uh, so I would stay with these three big names uh, for the time being. And I would avoid the smaller or the mid cap pharma companies where I think there is no great risk risk reward to be buying fresh at these levels. You know, at a 22,000 index, I want to be in companies, you know, which are super solid on the fundamental side, which are exhibiting relative strength and which have the ability to sustain in case a 5% drop on the Nifty comes, which I think is a possibility. So given that, the three names that I mentioned and the entire pharma space in general look very positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, if I got them just wondering, just dwelling on that point a bit, so U.S. generic companies are splitting as fundamentally. <clears throat> the U.S. generics, the Sun Pharma's, the Reddy's of the world have done very well in 2023. But some of the others, the CDMO companies, DVs, Loras, Granules, etc. haven't. Um, some of the diagnostic names just haven't. So is it only the U.S. generics which have had a good 2023 looking strong? Or is there some buying that could come into some of the underperformers as well? 
No, I think this is the market where you stay away from underperformers. You know, winners continue to win, losers continue to underperform. And we've had some great examples in the form of HDFC, Asian Paints, Bajaj Finance, and, you know, a long list of stocks, you know, which have not done well. DB's Lab and uh, Loris Lab in the same breath, you know, which were the darlings of the market in 2020 and 2021. So I think I'll just stay with the big boys and I like to stay with these US generic companies, which are much better. Uh, diagnostic, uh, again, I was very hopeful sometime back that they could come back but they seem to have lost their way apart from a Apollo hospital, which continues to be on top of our list. But the other names, Lal Path Labs, Metropolis, I'm not too sure. I don't think there's an opportunity there. Mm. <clears throat> Fair call. Stay away from the losers, if you will. So that's the key point. Gautam, you, other thing that has done really well uh, and maybe post Fed 2 is gold. I mean, maybe not as well as Bitcoin, but has done well. What's the sense here for the rest of the calendar year? Well, Neeraj, firstly, thanks for pointing out ITC. Yes, at 200 levels, you know, we did put out a very bold call on ITC that it could be a doubler. It happened. Thereafter, we made the point on your very channel that Coal India could do what ITC did. And that pretty much happened, you know, touch wood for us. It went off really well. And about six to eight months back at levels of $1,900 on gold, we said that it could be the trade of 2024. It could actually beat benchmark uh, returns of equity markets this year. So far, the going has been great. Gold has sustained beautifully, beautifully above levels of 2050. And I do see a move towards $2,500 to $2,700 on gold is coming. Now, that might be tough in terms of returns for the equity markets. And given the Fed's stance, and if you look at the last 20 years, whenever Fed has cut rates, gold has seen its best move. So I think a mega trend has already developed in gold and even silver. I mean, look at the, uh, uh, you know, move in silver in the last 10 days. I do see silver appreciating 15, 20% to levels of $28 to $28.5. So gold and silver, one should be topped up, use every small dip to buy, and it could be as high as 15% of your individual portfolios. One quick question, constructive on any of the Adani group names? Not really. You know, as I said, I want to stay away from high beta. I, I think we've played high beta in the last six months and we've all enjoyed the rally. But right now, I don't think I want to stay with high beta because I feel this is an election year. There's too much on the table and there are much better solid stock specific opportunities in other spaces of the market. Yes, a few Adani group stocks like an Adani port might continue to do well. But at these levels, I'm not willing to, you know, park capital there. Thank you, Gautam. We wish we could have talked to you longer, but we hopefully see you soon again on the channel. It's always great getting perspective from you. Well, that's Gautam Shah. His big bets are SBI, RIL. Stay away from the losers. Stay away from beta. Uh, what you do want to do is uh, focus on the winners, and there is more opportunity in the small cap, in the large cap space. In the meantime, the markets are having a bit of a sulk, thanks to IT. IT sector is down and out with a 3% cut. Uh, from the largest to the smallest IT stocks are seeing a cut of 3 to 4 percent, 3.5 percent now on the IT pack. Uh, and this is all thanks to Accenture, which viewed its guidance downward. But uh, we'll take a break. But Neeraj, anything else that you've picked up? Because right after this, we'll be talking to MGL. Yeah, and it'll be interesting because there are contrasting views at play. Uh, somebody very bullish, somebody bearish, somebody talking about uh, already the price cuts being cushioned by some factors. So. Multiple forces at play for MGL. It remains a conversation that viewers shouldn't miss. So stay tuned. We'll be right back and talk to the management of MGL. People believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money.
headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neeraj Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real guys, there are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term, when to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Stock selection isn't an easy right, thanks to uh, thanks for tuning in back on India Market Open and uh, the management in focus today is Mahanagar Gas. Now, the recent price cuts uh, brought about a bit of a decline in the sentiment and the stock has duly corrected maybe nearly 15-20% uh, from those um, highs that it clocked in. A company remains constructive on its volume as well as margin outlook despite the comments about uh, the recent All Minister comments as well which prompted downgrades from multiple brokerages. Get in Mr. Ashu Singhal, who is the managing director of the company, to try and put into perspective all that's happening around the business. Mr. Singhal, good having you. Thanks for taking the time out. Um, morning. This is, good morning. This is Neerat Shah here. Um, how, how, is, how, is, uh, how is the business uh, environment looking in light of the fact that there are multiple forces at play? One is around pricing, two is around the probability about or whether circles will remain um, the bastions of the incumbents or will new competition come in and disrupt? And of course, uh, the demand picture looking as solid as ever. No, all these things are always at play. It's not that something new has happened in recent market uh, or any disruption has happened as such. In fact, the uh, indications are that the government has been supportive of the CGD sector. A lot of investment is coming up. Almost all of India is covered by the authorization of geographical areas. So coming to your point that uh, there has been market play in terms of how we are competitive with respect to petrol and diesel. So CNG in Mumbai or Mahanagar gas is around more than 50% cheaper as compared to petrol and around 22% cheaper as compared to diesel. So we are always a competitive market where we are playing and in other industrial and commercial also we are competition with other liquid fuels. And in uh, domestic PNG, we are in having competition with LPG. So all that we are placed, well placed in terms of pricing and we expect that the volume growth will continue for the next financial year. Hmm. Uh, in, in a recent investor conference, Mr. Shingle, uh, the company was on record saying that the price cuts have happened simply because there has been a reduction in feedstock cost, if I'm not wrong, and that created the margin headroom which enabled you to do this. Now, my, my question is, uh, would, would this mean that the operational metrics for MGL for the current quarter as well as the quarters ahead would largely be maintained or similar to the average levels that we've seen in the past? Because if you had headroom and you cut it for volume growth, your margin picture should look intact. Yeah, it's very flexible. I mean, uh -huh. the cost of LNG is passed through if LNG or the APM gas. If the cost goes down, we pass on the benefit to the customer. In the same lines, when the LNG prices have fallen down since last four or five months, 
So we have cut down and passed down the prices benefit to the consumer. Therefore, we expect the margins will not shrink as such. We are around 12 and a half to 13 rupees margins EBITDA per SCM. And we expect similar numbers to come in this quarter and the year ahead. Okay. How is demand, Mr. Singhal? I mean, you spoke about the competitive forces at play, which have always been there. I, I would presume and you would probably say the same thing. So how is the volume growth outlook looking like? Because you have sounded off in recent investor conferences, again, that you are confident of the volume growth as well. Talk to us a bit about demand, sir. Yeah, currently we have, uh, since last nine months, we have a growth of around 4%. And this quarter has been better than the Q3. Uh, so we expect to end the year around 5% growth year on year. Next year, we have already launched several schemes of uh, getting more CNG vehicles on road by uh, by giving benefits to the purchaser in terms of discounts on the capital cost and running cost on, uh, in fuels, as well as retrofit market. So we expect that next year, uh, we may have a growth of around 6 to 7%. And also the prices are very favorable, as we have done uh, several cuts since last one year. So they must be attracting more of the volumes on road in terms of CNG, as well as industrial and commercial, we are connecting new customers. Do you sense, sir, that conversions have picked up by virtue of the fact that the discount between the, the price differential between your and petrol, for example, gas and petrol, has presumably widened considerably? Yes, yes. Actually, if you see the data also, uh -huh. last year we had 65,000 vehicles which got converted into CNG. Hmm. And this year in nine months, we have already have 57,000. So last quarter, we expect another uh, around 20,000 or so. So 22,000, we will be hitting somewhere 80,000 this financial year. So that gives uh, a momentum to the convergence and the same momentum we expect with the schemes and the favorable price for CNG to continue for the next year as well. Got it. Mr. Singhal, uh, before I move on to the exclusivity conversation, just one, one more question. Most uh, analysts who track <clears throat> this space and your company very closely are penciling in volume growth of 7 to 8% FY25. They are penciling in that the margins for FY25 and 26 will be at the upper end of the guided range as well. Uh, there are very few where I'm seeing assumptions to be lower than what your guidance would have been. Uh, is it fair to be this optimistic looking at the trends uh, that you may be seeing as well? See, uh, we don't want to commit more than what we can deliver. So right. we are a bit conservative on terms of when we are airing our numbers, but you are right. There's no such threats as such to the business and we expect the numbers to grow in six to 7% on a safe side and it can be slightly higher if things are more favorable. As well as since the prices are in our, our I mean, they are cheapest in the country in terms of CNG and PNG. And the Delta is very uh, handsome in terms of petrol and diesel vehicles. We expect the volume growth to continue as well as momentum to pick up in the next financial year. Okay. While maintaining the margin also in similar range, yes. Okay, I get your point. Now, the, the, the point around uh, the infra exclusivity and across various geographies, what are your thoughts here? I know there is a legal challenge. So I'm not asking you to comment on anything which may be sub judice, Mr. Singhal. But just on the broad concept, uh, because the thoughts are divided there, I'd love your opening thoughts and then I have a couple of other questions on this. See, there are two concepts as per the Act. One is that uh, contract carrier pipeline should be allowed to uh, for other companies to deliver, use those pipelines and deliver the gases to the consumer. The other is, uh, this is called uh, marketing exclusivity, which was in the court in 2015 and uh, stay was granted by the Honorable High Court to not uh, take any coercive action against the CGD companies. That is one part of it. The other part is when a specified period is over, the infrastructure exclusivity also get expired. But again, that matter is again under sub judice. Uh, it's being deliberated and discussions are yet to conclude. But there is a precedence under the regulation that 10-year block extension can be given, and it, which has been granted to some other companies like Gujarat Gas. So uh, post that notice, which has come up recently, we have also applied to PNGRB, the regulator, to get a 10-year block extension, and we are ho very hopeful that it will be granted to us. Hmm. Uh, one of the beliefs, uh, Mr. Shingal, is that even if infra exclusivity was opened up and was not exclusive in that sense 
uh, it will be difficult for a company A to go out and compete with the same ROEs, so on and so forth, in something which has been the bastion of company B and vice versa for B to C and C to A, so to say, hypothetically, I'm just using these as an example. Would you, as somebody who's heading this business, Kankar, that even if some other circle's exclusivity was no longer there, it will be difficult for a company like you to do go out and compete there and vice versa for any company to come in and compete with the right return ratios and the right margins in the domains that you have operated for such a long time. That's very really logical because see, uh, Mahanagar has been operating since the last 25, 26 years in Mumbai and the other areas. Mumbai has developed over the years. Now the roads have been concretized and our assets are depreciated. So any company to enter into a new geography will be a challenge. The overheads will be high. To create that infrastructure and to also deliver the same competent rates will be very difficult. So across globe, it is seen that infrastructure exclusivity is typically extended for a longer, longer period. And uh, marketing exclusivity is wherein the pipeline or infrastructure is allowed by other companies to use is granted by the regulators across the globe. Even if it was not, sir, my final question, um, even if it was not, would it be impractical? I mean, let's assume that in all fairness, things are opened up, let's say. I'm uh, sorry, not using the term fairness, but let's assume that things are opened up for whatever reason, or whatever the reason may be. It'll be difficult for an MGL to go out and compete with somebody else in their areas, and therefore, it's not from a business decision perspective. Even if the option was available, maybe it will not be taken up in, in, uh, in all probability. No, we can't say like that because, see, the modular concept is also coming in CNG. There are different models wherein LNG can be brought to that station and a modular station can be set up. So you don't need a big infrastructure to start working in other areas. So the earlier things were more conventional when the pipeline infrastructure was required and others things were required. Now things are changing a bit. So if the market opens up, it's an opportunity for both the parties, either MGL to go out and work in other areas and vice versa. But the fact remains that the person who has entered into the market has 25 years on the line and created the infrastructure. For anybody else to compete with the rates will be a bit challenge, a big bit of a challenge. But if the marketing exclusivity is gone and the same pipeline infrastructure is given to, access is given to other parties, then it can be done easily. Okay, and, and, on, and on that, sorry, my last question therefore is this, on that, you are saying that uh, as has happened globally, that these periods of exclusivity ideally should be much longer uh, than what they are right now? See, uh, infrastructure exclusivity is a term wherein if the market is monopolistic in nature, but here there is no monopoly as such, one that the GAs have been bidded and the uh, parties or the entities who have got the best rates have got the GAs. Secondly, we have got three segments. One is petrol, diesel, we are competing with CNG. LPG, we are competing with PNG. And liquid fuels and solid fuels are being competed with industrial PNG. So there is no monopoly as such in that respect. And if the marketing exclusivity also goes away, the infrastructure available can be used by paying certain uh, use charges. The other parties can use it. So as such, there is no uh, thing which we can say as a infrastructure exclusivity in strict terms. There is no monopoly in that respect because multiple uh, forces and their price determination is done as per the market uh, price. Your point. Okay, Mr. Singhal, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for taking the time out and speaking to us today. Um, have a great holy weekend. Thank you so much. That's the view from Mahanagar Gas. Uh, optimistic about volume growth, optimistic about maintaining margins despite the price cuts that have happened. Um, the quarterly numbers will put that into perspective as well. Maybe not quarter four, but maybe quarter one, certainly. So it'll be interesting. Of course, the cost of feedstock will play a big determinant into that as well. Now, before we wrap up this show, uh, have to mention IT again, because that's been the big buzzword uh, on a day when the Nifty IT is down 3%. A slew of brokerages have come out with their view on the IT stocks as Accenture cut their revenue guidance. Agam has some details on that. Agam, um, uh, over to you. 
Right, so uh, the reason behind the weakness in IT stocks is the kind of commentary that is coming in from the stable of Accenture, indicating that there has been a tightening on budgetary spends from clients, specifically in the US and a lot of other regions. And that, of course, is weighing on the sentiment of the IT sector. Uh, over the past couple of quarters, we have already known about, uh, uh, well, a weak demand environment for the Indian IT sector, but uh, moving in, uh, well, what we have a handful of brokerages which have also, uh, well, given their own read through as far as the IT sectors, Indian IT sector is concerned, based on Accenture's commentary. So I start off with Nomira, where they, they are suggesting that client discretionary uh, spend has been tightening. Her clients continue to prioritize spending on cost optimization initiatives, but not as much as, as, as expansion is concerned. A positive here, of course, is that there's more opportunity in cloud adoption and data standardization and Nomura has a buy on Tech Mahindra in the large caps and the mid caps a buy on CoForge, Billasoft and eClerks. They do however have a reduce on TCS, Wipro and LTIM. Moving on, we have Jeffries uh, who also suggests that Accenture highlights rising constraints when it comes to tech budgets as well as slowdown in managed services which do not bode well with Indian IT. And uh, we have rising weakness in financial services and verticals and uh, this also has a negative read through when it comes to names like Tech Mahindra and TCS. Finally, we have City on Indian IT, again based on uh, what Accenture has suggested. Uh, they do suggest that uh, the forecast is suggesting tightening of IT spends and the pace of demand recovery uh, will be a lot slower than anticipated. And many of the other factors which are also weighing down on the Indian IT sector today and which potentially could over the next few quarters as well. Agam, thanks for putting that into perspective. As we wrap up the show, a few stocks to monitor. HEG, and I presume even Graphite India might be in the green. So pull up both of those um, up in trade. Six, five, five or six percent higher for HEG, so it's perked up even more. Is Graphite India up about a couple of percentage points? So watch out for those two. Prestige, of course, arguably could be our, if one of the key stocks of the day today, up about five percent prestige estates. Uh, remember, NDTV also had this exclusive about the Marriott Pact being signed and, 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 and the news flow today on Prestige. Amber, CLSA has initiated um, or rather upgraded the stock, uh, if I'm not wrong. The price target at 4300 if I'm not wrong, and Amber Enterprises is seeing some pullback from there, up about 5% on the back of that. Uh, second owner, Trot now, Inox Wind is in the green, uh, 489 and counting 4% higher. For that one, wonder five percent, no, four percent for Inox Wind. Wonder if Suzlon is up because Suzlon was that key price and volume buzzer in the session yesterday. Big price and volume jump for Suzlon in trade yesterday, and Suzlon should come up on your screen next and just see if that stock has any upticks today. No, not really. Just about 0.94 percent. So those are a few names to monitor. Zomato, by the way, just before we wrap up, is at 173. So after the bulk deals and in correcting all the way to 150. 55 or 156, Zomato is back in business, if you will. Take a break on that note. In fact, wrap it up on this leg of India market open. But stay tuned. Up next is Talking Point with Vetri Supermanya. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit.
listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neeraj Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real guys, there are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term? When to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. As we've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. Thanks for tuning in to Talking Point. I'm your host, Neerat Shah. The case for a chat today, you can't take your eyes away from what the Fed has done, but you obviously can't take your eyes away from what Accenture has guided to. So in some sense, there's this push of policy action versus demand. So the case for a chat will come up on your screen next, and we are going to be talking about whether 2024, India remains in the global spotlight, whether outlook for IT remains subdued, whether the Fed action prompts risk asset managers to up their bets on risk assets slash equities per se, and whether uh, fixed income and precious metals become a space to bet on. Uh, the gentleman who is our guest today, back in Jan 2023, had said that there are options beyond equities, and he's self-confessed in a previous interview that in some sense equities still did well, so he said he doesn't want to make any forecasts, but we've gotten him to do precisely that. Vetri Subramaniam, Chief Investment Officer at UTI Asset Management Company, joins us. Vetri, so good having you. Thanks for taking the time out. Thank you. Thanks for having me in this lovely studio. Now, the pleasure is entirely ours. So, how do you feel, Vetri, about, uh, about, about the whole process of investing? Because just uh, the, the volatility news flow always is high, but it's certainly not low this time. Sure. Uh, again, you know, the way I look at this, Neeraj, uh, actually I don't see volatility as being high because if you look at volatility either in terms of historical volatility or in terms of the volatility that we can look at in the options market, both are actually very muted. Sure. Um, I think the definition of volatility sometimes hides the language that we should be using, which is the market's not going up every day. But the market is not supposed to go up every day, right? So I think that's the wrong definition of volatility. The market actually remains very, very low in terms of volatility. And, you know, the bigger point that I would make, and I always tell investors this, if you are going to invest in equities, 
expect that the market will drop at least 10% once every year, expect that the market will drop 20 to 25% every two to three years, and once every 10 years it might even drop 30, 40, 50%. That's going to be part and parcel of your journey. When you look at it in that context, I don't think anything we've experienced in the last few months amounts to volatility. Yeah, no, but just the volatility news flow is what I meant, because there, uh, it's very chop and change for all the hawks around Fed, who and and what the Fed delivered yesterday or day before la last night, I mean, was pretty different from what anybody could have anticipated. So in some sense, there, there is a bit of a chalk and cheese effect. Uh, partly true, but again, I would say, look, you know, in the markets, there's always something going on. Mm. Right? If you were to tell me that there's more news flow today as compared to 2020, when at this point of yeah, time, yeah, yeah. we were all getting locked wrong. up at home and we didn't know where, you That's know, true. the future looked like, I would say that was a lot more uncertain yeah. than it is today. So, yeah, I mean, these are all small things. Look, the Fed policy, uh, MPC policy, these are all part and parcel of the discussion about markets. But mm. these can't be the sole determinant of what investors choose to do. True. So, you know, I treat this as part of the weather. Uh, you know, should you dress appropriately for the weather yes answer is yes but you don't change your uh, you know strategic objective because of what the short term weather forecast is so that's the way i look at it okay and i'll come to the strategic objective as well and earnings growth and other sure, factors sure. but just uh, a word about the weather too i mean does it look like uh, the mood might have changed at the margin because of what the fed reiterated nothing different Correct. Correct. but reiterated sure i think that's a good question neeraj and you know you go back to january and i remember looking at the data uh, people were expecting as many as almost, you know, five to six rate cuts during this year. 140 basis points was what the Fed implied was showing. Uh, that's now obviously down to about 75. Um, and, you know, to that extent, I would say the market's already sort of shifted in its expectation that growth is going to be much better than anticipated. Inflation seems to coming down, not net near target, but coming down. But to my mind, you know, the more interesting thing which actually emerged from the Fed uh, messaging day before yesterday was the fact that they have actually indicated a willingness to walk back on quantitative tightening. To my mind, that was actually the most critical part of the messaging as opposed to anything else. Because I think one of the challenges that the US Fed in particular and the US Treasury in particular faces is that unlike central banks all over the world uh, or governments all over the world who increased their average tenure of borrowings in the post-pandemic periods when rates were close to zero, uh, the US Treasury never did that. And they actually continued to borrow very, very short term. In fact, in the last one year, they have predominantly borrowed treasury bills, which I would actually submit as a very dangerous strategy to follow. But therefore, they will sooner or later have to replace that treasury bill borrowing with dated security borrowing. Now, imagine a scenario in which the US government is continuing to happily run deficits of six to seven trillion dollars a year. Uh, they're going to have to issue long dated bonds. And now the biggest holder of bonds, which is the US Fed, is also saying I need to sell bonds into the market. So if there was a reason to breathe a sigh of relief, it's simply that the Fed for the first time in a way sort of blinked and said, okay, you know, we might have to rethink how much uh, and how aggressively we sell bonds. So that messaging on QT was to my mind the most significant part of what came out. And maybe there is nervousness and rightly so there should be nervousness because I think the US Treasury has played what I would say is a fairly risky game of borrowing so much in T-bills and not in dated securities. So Considering this aspect that's happening in the US, considering that BOJ, albeit in a gradual fashion, but there is a bit of a quote-unquote policy normalization as well correct, that has happened. Correct. So central banks are talking a very different tune than what they have in the last three years. What's the, what's the impact to your mind on risk assets per se over the next nine months, probable impact? So, you know, we talked about Tina versus Tara, and uh, I think in the Indian context, it certainly didn't work. Global equities worked very well. But I think the fact of the matter remains that what we discussed last time in terms of the underlying change in not just weather, but in terms of climate is very, very pronounced. It is pronounced because we've now, it's very clear we've moved away from zero interest rates. Right? Japan is the last one to sort of exit that territory. Um, and therefore, as a result, bonds have become a valid asset class in any global investor's portfolio. And this is already visible in what's happened in the US. So which asset class in the US pulled in the largest amount of money last year? It was US money market funds. They pulled in almost $6 trillion of money simply because people are saying, hey, I can actually get, you know, four and a half, five percent over there. Uh, you know, I'm happy to take that because I haven't seen this kind of...
a you know reasonably safe return on a safe liquid asset for a long period of time. So I think that will continue to remain a challenge that bonds have once again become a valid asset class in the pools of money which are the largest pools of money which are trying to meet retirement obligations and you know you want to use a balanced portfolio of bonds equities so on and so forth the mad rush to go down the risk curve to get better returns that period is now behind us so i think this is a change in temperature that we will have to continue to deal with that bonds are once again a valid investment uh, instrument in uh, you know global investor portfolios and i think that will continue to pose challenges to equities and from that point of view, therefore, high equity valuations, you know, I would be a little bit worried and circumspect because incrementally, rather than people hunting for yield by going down the risk curve, they are going to go back to the stability of what bonds are willing to offer them. So actually, uh, I'd love to understand this from you because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. Uh, higher for longer rates, even if rates yeah. were to come down, therefore bonds and valuation multiples both get impacted. Mm -hmm. but if there is a series of rate cuts, it may not be seven, it may not be six, it may be three. In some sense, if it enhances the appeal of emerging markets by and large, what is that next nine to 12 months of presumably three rate cuts have in store therefore for equities and EM equities in particular, considering the point that you just made in the previous answer versus the appeal of EMs in a rate downward sure, trajectory? Sure. So I think the critical difference here I would submit is that we don't see the long bond yield coming down dramatically. Hmm. And equities are eventually priced relative to the long bond yield rather than to the short term money market rate. Right? So will the Fed cut? Sure, they most probably will cut. It should get cut at some point of time. Likely in India as well at some point towards the end of the year we will cut. But that's not the important number on which people price equities. What they price it on is where is the 10 year bond yield. And I, the key, I think, is that that is not going to come down for the simple reason that inflation looks like it is higher for longer. The West and particularly US has suddenly discovered this new toy called fiscal deficit. No signs of bringing it down. Unlike India, where we are actually continuously looking to tighten fiscal deficit, you know, going into 26. Yeah. And if you look at what the finance minister, of course, you know, new parliament, etc. But the finance ministers actually now even talked, and if you see recent commentary, not just the fact that we need to bring down the fiscal deficit and be disciplined, but also talking debt to GDP. And this is happening in an environment where the US is not even talking about these things. The CBLO is, but you know, otherwise they're not CBO is, but the government is, you know, pretty happy to run fiscal deficit. So I think equities will get priced of the long end, and that is where we need to be cautious. I don't see the long end coming down. Okay. So uh, before we take that break, one more macro question with regards to India, therefore. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, Morgan Stanley reiterated their call that it is India's decade. In some sense, we're talking about a very fiscally responsible uh, finance ministry uh, at the helm of affairs currently. And growth numbers, uh, not anemic, certainly, even if not as strong as the last three years, if Correct. you will. Correct. How favorably does that place Indian equities in light of the fact that the valuations are still high for them? I think you're absolutely right in all our conversations and we you know raise money from a lot of global investors which we manage almost three billion dollars of global money wow. uh, I think there's no doubt about the fact that most people say look India is a very structural component of our portfolio uh, and we want to continue raising our exposure to equity in India simply because we can see the long-term structural opportunity uh, but that's one part of the story the other part is what am I paying for it right and I think that's where it starts to get slightly more tricky because valuations in India are expensive. Equities in general across the world are expensive at this point of time, particularly the US. And in India as well, you are having to pay a significant premium to that. So I think to that extent, the sort of appetite has been a little bit more muted. I would submit more muted than what perhaps people have hoped for. That's been offset by the fact that domestic demand yeah. has been very strong. But I would really interpret the setup to say that if for whatever reason Indian equities were to correct or come down, you will start to see a lot more stronger foreign bid. And just two points I want to make here. You know, Indian equities have reached a premium where it's interesting to just think through the mindset of global companies. We've had two or three global companies in recent time come and say, 
you know what, we are happy to sell down some of our stake in India, right? So when you have these high valuations, it's not surprising that rather than seeing a rush of global M&A inbound into India, you're actually seeing some of these MNCs saying, hey, we can actually sell some of these rich assets in India. The other interesting that I want to point out is that everybody only talks about how much money is coming into the market, particularly the local money is coming into the market. Look at the amount of stock sales which are being made by PE funds, VC funds, promoters, QIPs, OFS, IPO. If you look at that number for 2023, actually there was $45 billion of buying by FPIs and domestic institutional investors. There was close to $38 billion of what I can count of sales of primary fundraising or secondary sell downs by these investors. So, you know, at these valuations, you're also attracting a lot of supply. I think it's a great decade for India as a country, you know, capital availability, economy grows, all of that. Equities, I'd argue that I want, you know, valuations which offer more margin for comfort. If you are arguing, we are listening to it, Vetri. Uh, stay on. So much more to talk to you about. We'll take a very quick break, viewers. My colleague Chinma has done a small story around the piece that Mr. Subramaniam spoke about, which is that we've analyzed what the kind of sales that have happened from the promoter entities in the small cap universe in the last seven, eight or nine odd months. And they have been substantially higher than what you've seen in the recent past. So there is maybe some word of caution warranted. I'm glad uh, Mr. Subramaniam is bringing that. We take a break come back and talk about maybe some micro as well. We've spoken a lot about the macro. We'll try and talk a little bit about the micro on the other side. Stay tuned. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real, guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term, when to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the portfolio manager. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit.
back with Talking Point in conversation with Vetri Subramaniam of UTI. Um, Vetri, we spoke about the macro by and large. Uh, we could go on with that, but have to bring in a little bit of the micro element as well. Um, do you foresee earnings growth to be a challenge in FY25-26, uh, or maybe FY25-26 is too far to put out? And what are the pockets of challenge? Could it be BFSI, which hasn't quite delivered on stockpiles returns, even if the performance has been okay? Could it be technology on the back of even Accenture saying that they don't see a demand, this thing, those are two large ones, or some others? Sure. So if you look at the Bloomberg consensus, it's now penciling in about 14% growth in uh, earnings for the Nifty 50. That's the consensus number for 25. Not too different from what actually happened in 2024. Uh, will happen because we're still huh. at the final quarter numbers are to come in. But I think that's pretty much in the bag. Um, I think the big difference is if you look at the 24 number, uh, Neeraj, uh, the challenge is that top line growth was actually very weak and the entire growth in earnings was actually driven more by EBITDA expansion because the base year actually had a lot of the impact of you know the post Russia Ukraine sort of disruption and supply chain and prices. Um, I think the key for 2025 is that it will have to be more revenue led. I don't think there is scope now for EBITDA margins to expand anymore. In fact, given, as you rightly said, there are some pockets within the economy where for a variety of reasons, things are a little bit tighter. Uh, there is very limited scope for margin expansion. So I think it will have to be now led more by revenue growth rather than by margins. Uh, that's point number one. Uh, the outlook, I think, for revenue growth, reasonably good, though the consumption side of the economy, as we can see most high frequency numbers, is challenged. Investment side, doing better, but I would still submit, you know, it's not necessarily doing great, right? So that whole pickup that we've been hoping for in terms of private capex, it is still something that we are hoping for. It's not yet visible in the numbers at this point of time. It's only the government capex which has sort of held up. But even there, if you take government capex plus PSU capex, the overall impulse is actually more or less flatline now for a few years. And remember, Neeraj, that you're going into continued fiscal compression. Right, 5.1 percent yeah. fiscal deficit this year. Then again, four and a half. So I think the backdrop has certain challenges. We cannot say it's zero challenges. Some of those challenges could be related to global growth. Some of those challenges could be related to NIM compression, which the banks might experience this year. So there are some challenges in getting to 14 percent. But at least the bar is not set at 25 percent earnings growth. So the market's looking at a number which is perhaps slightly more in the realm of what is possible. If, if there is a disappointment thereof indicated by quarter one earnings where we might see maybe margin compression because of higher commodity costs or otherwise, could, th could there be a possibility of a swifter than anticipated uh, corrective move in the markets? Because it also coincides very, very interestingly with true, the election uh, calendar. Yeah. Look, the valuations are rich. Uh, they are slightly rich in the case of the large caps slightly above the comfort zone, but at least they're not blinking red. Yeah. They're far more uncomfortable in the mid cap and the small cap plays. And I would submit that, you know, at these valuations, you really need earnings growth to not only deliver, but even to deliver some upside surprise. Yeah. I think that's a very high bar. So I would be skeptical about earnings ability to sort of really outperform significantly on the upside. You know, whether the market's correct by going nowhere for a period of time, whether they correct in valuation terms by, you know, coming down sharply, that's very hard to predict. But I think people should be aware that valuations are posing a challenge to, uh, you know, the returns that you can get from economies. A lot of the potential of businesses is reflected in their multiples. Mm -hmm. And if it's reflected in their multiples, it means those earnings expectations are baked in. Now you really need something far better than that to give the stock price a lift. Would there be a cushion of domestic flows at the dips? You yourself would be getting in money every month, every quarter. Sure. How sure. strong is that flow to cushion the impact of the fall? Uh, very good question. Uh, two ways of looking at this, and I think everybody should be aware of it. Obviously, the SIP flow, I think, gives us a lot of visibility. But when I peel back the SIP flow and I look at the rate of cancellation of SIPs, it does seem that there is some momentum-seeking behavior visible even in the SIP flow, right? Because how many SIPs are actually persisting beyond one year, two years, three years? The numbers, I must say, are slightly disappointing. They're still good in an absolute sense compared to where we used to be five years ago. But 
if you just look at the headline number, that's a bit misleading because there is a high number of SIPs which are getting cancelled and then, you know, people are opening new SIPs again. My interpretation of that is there is some bit of return seeking, momentum chasing behavior which is there. But I still think the SIP will give stability, it will give support. You know, the mutual fund SAIA program which Amphi has been running goes back now almost seven years, 2017. And I do think in my travels across the country when I meet people, there are a large number of investors who have started to think about this long term. They are thinking 10 years, 20 years. But on top of that, there are some people playing momentum and that's what we should be a little bit, uh, you know, worried about. Got it. Does the commentary from a company like Accenture uh, worry you for what could be happening to what is arguably a very large sector in India, which is in IT services? Because that's, aside of banks, that's the other yep. key conundrum yep. for yep. markets. I think certainly there are challenges on the IT side. It's been visible for a while. Even the you know Indian companies have been articulating challenges over there. They've been winning big deals, but the challenges in many of these cases, you're losing something which was a legacy business, and now you're announcing a new deal. So the net benefit to the company, you have to offset the legacy loss with the you know new deal wins. You can't just keep adding the new deals without recognizing the fact that there is some legacy business which is going away. So I think that challenge will continue. Everything that we hear from the US suggests that uh, you know tech spending is going through a difficult period. This is visible in technology, it's visible in the classic IT services, it's visible in support and it's also visible in the consulting side, right? So the top end of the market, discretionary consulting badly affected, services less so. The only point that I would make Make, Neeraj, is that from a domestic economy perspective, one of the strengths that we've seen in the economy in recent times is not the growth of just the classic IT services, but the rise of global capability centers in India, where you have multinationals setting up their own sort of research units here, doing research, doing coding, and doing a lot of stuff which is core to their own enterprise, and that I think will continue to sort of grow. So. Overall, IT services and you know related exports from India should continue to do well. But the classic listed IT services companies, particularly the ones with a lot of legacy business, I think they are going to struggle a little bit more to handle this transition. Last question, amidst all, amidst this rather, forgive me for using that word, cautious note. Mm -hmm. Where is it that you are the most optimistic on? Yeah. Uh, I should just add one more point on that IT bit, which is, look, these are India's most globally competitive businesses. So our view on IT is really that, you know, buy the dips. If they get cheaper, okay. we are happy to buy them because we think they will eventually come out on the right side of this. Uh, so not that despondent in that sense. Sure. Uh, no, I think equities are just rich. So really what we are trying to tell people is go back to the drawing board, hmm. look at your asset allocation framework. It's very likely that with the strong rally in stock prices, your equity allocation may have moved higher than where you were in your asset allocation framework. Go back to what your framework is telling you to do. So even in some of the schemes that we run, which sort of run our own internal asset allocation models, you know, we used to be at 65-70% asset allocation. Those have progressively kept getting cut and they are down to about 50% equity allocation, right? And 50% in a strategy which can be as low as 30, as high as 90. Right? So that should give you a sense of the fact that you know the equity allocation is somewhere more neutral at this point. And these valuation metrics largely look at large cap, not mid and small cap. If I were to use that, the numbers might look worse, but I don't have 20 years of history. So we run it only on the large cap space. But that's my simple message to in investors. That's been the message from January. Rebalance, rebalance, rebalance. Keeping in mind your long-term goals, rather than falling for the narrative of you know, this is India's decade. It might be, but that's no reason for you to move away from your asset allocation framework. Superb message to wrap this up. Vetri, thanks so much for taking the time out and being with us on Talking Point today. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, the pleasure was entirely ours, I must tell you. And viewers, thanks for tuning in to this edition of The Talking Point. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, 
Kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real guys, there are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term? When to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Benchmark indices trade in the green after a choppy start. Nifty maintains 22,000, while the Sensex remains above levels of 72,700. HCL Tech in fee in the rest of the IT pack trades with cuts of up to 4% as Accenture slashes FI24 forecasts, dimming hopes for demand recovery. And while Accenture's guidance cuts send shockwaves through tech sector, Jeffries warns of client budget tightening and sector overvaluation. The highly anticipated IPL 2024 season begins today at the M.A. Chidambaram Stadium. Super Kings to take on Royal Challenges, Challengers Bangalore. India's top court will hear Arvind K. G. Was plea, cha plea challenging his arrest shortly after Delhi CM booked by ED in money laundering case last evening. Welcome, this is Savina and I'm joined by Agam and we'll take you through all the FNO action in today's trade. The, the market which started off choppy at turn trading flat with a slight positive bias. Uh, interestingly, the breadth of the market's not too bad. It's really the IT sector that's push, putting pressure on the index. So OMC is undoing too badly, tech stocks are losing and you've got lots of stock specific trade like Sardai Energy that are up and about in trade Agam. <clears throat> right, uh, well for now of course the indices are holding on to the green and uh, it's been a 
well, a, a reasonably good morning, uh, considering we started off in the red, and uh, a lot of that weakness, as far as the IT sector is concerned, has been uh, well soaked in, and eventually we have started to see advances. Uh, of course, the Nifty IT uh, index continues to be under pressure, but even that is off days lows at the moment. Uh, you know, if you consider what the, what's happening with the Nifty, let's take the take a look at the constituents there, uh, because uh, well, naturally names like TCS and Infosys, which are correcting by as much as 2.5-3%, uh, will be weighing on the index there. In fact, the, it's the, the top four names are weighing down the index are from the information technology sector. On the other hand, you're seeing gains in Reliance Industries, l and and ITC, along with ICICI Bank, which is keeping the index higher at the moment. The broader markets are also doing reasonably well this morning as well. And there's been a little bit of an outperformance coming in. The mid-cap index is also marginally in the green, as is the small-cap index, which is up as much as 0.7 percent. Very, very quickly take a look at how futures are panning out. Uh, over the last few days, we have had some unwinding coming through in the index futures, and today is no different. Today is a decline of 1 percent in open interest for the Nifty futures, and the bank Nifty futures are also looking at uh, well, uh, largely, uh, was some amount of traction as far as open interest uh, goes. We'll, let's pull that up. There you have it, a decline of around 4.3%. And uh, moreover, as far as your option market is concerned, uh, we are looking at a consolidation, further consolidation around the 22,000 mark. The Nifty is just about there, and traders are expecting the Nifty to uh, remain range-bound over the course of the next few days. So that's something that we will be watching out for. All in all, uh, when it comes to the markets, well, there's certainly been an improvement uh, over the last half an hour, Samina. Indeed, it's actually not doing too badly, and that's because I think the breadth of the market wasn't bad in, from the get-go. It was just the IT pack that was putting pressure on the index. OMCs, interestingly, are doing well. Remember, crude prices have eased off uh, in overnight trade on back of a stronger dollar, and that's uh, turning out to look good for a whole bunch of these OMC names. Apart from that, uh, you've also got uh, stocks like Sarda Energy, that's up 14 uh, percent. You've got uh, prestigious states on back of the land acquisition in Delhi. NCR is seeing a 5 percent rally in trade. Along with that, uh, some other names from the broader markets that aren't doing too badly in terms of this morning is stocks like Amber Enterprise. Uh, the stock's been on a roll in the last couple of days. Now we've also had a CLSA upgrade coming in on the stock, and that's leading to a pretty sharp rally on that counter too. Well, apart from that, all cargo logistics is up 6%. Lakshmi Organic Industries is trading with an 8% gain. Uh, Brigade Enterprise, it's not just prestige. Real estate as a pack is seeing a very sharp recovery in today's day of trade. Indus Towers is up 3 odd percent. Some of your sugar names aren't doing too, too badly. Tata Chemicals, despite um, an order to pay up about 100 odd crores from the regulator, uh, is doing well. It's up 2.5 percent as we see it. Some of your banks are doing well. Defense, like Bharat Dynamics and HAL, are having a positive morning. Aditya Agarwala and Aditya Arora joining with their FNO strategies. Uh, uh, Aditya Agarwala, I'll start with you. How would you approach and play the Nifty and Bank Nifty today? Uh, morning, Samina. Morning, Agam. Thanks for having the show. Uh, I, I believe uh, markets have entered into a consolidation phase. Uh, markets usually are trading into a narrow consolidation. It's just that the range shifts. Uh, once it, it is at the upper end of the range, the next time it's at the lower end of the range. So at the moment, uh, Samina, I believe uh, 22,100 is the hurdle on the upside, and 21,900 to about 21,800 is the support on the downside. I'll closely monitor if the index actually takes out 22,100 on the upside. Uh, that could trigger uh, next uh, leg of rise for the index. Uh, for at least 150 points on the upside to 22,300. I, I don't see markets going beyond 22,300 in a rush anytime soon. And on the downside, anytime if market slides closer to about 21,900 or 800, you'll again see buyers emerge and push the market higher. So it's a very narrow band, Samina, in which markets are trading at the moment, and I believe it will continue to do so in the coming weeks as well. It's more of a consolidation on the broader markets 50 that we're looking at at the moment. Mm. All right, uh, Aditya, uh, uh, Aurora, good morning <coughs> to you as well. Uh, your view on the benchmarks, how are you trading them? Uh, very good morning. Uh, I think uh, markets are, uh, you know, seeing signs of accumulation across the board. Uh, we were talking about how Bank Nifty is seeing good accumulation at the lower levels. We are talking about the components 
the day before yesterday when Nifty shot up 500 points yesterday. So I think uh, HDFC Bank uh, is uh, clearly being accumulated and the strength is being seen in Kotak Bank, ICIC Bank, Axis Bank, Indescent Bank. So I think the components are doing pretty well. And today the fall in IT is a buying opportunity because all the stocks are trading at important support levels and the sentiments are pretty positive. If we look at NASDAQ, then it is trading at multi-week high uh, and whereas uh, Nifty IT index is trading at multi-week low. So there's a big uh, gap to catch up. And if that catch up trade happens, it would uh, give a big fillip and support to Nifty, which could take Nifty to 22,500 to 22,800. And uh, equally strong is Bank Nifty, wherein we talked about uh, very positive data and a lot of, uh, you know, banking names, private banking names. So we can see long buildup also in a lot of banking names. So I think the target over there is uh, 48,000 to 49,000. So both the indices are buying opportunity today and stop loss must be maintained at 21,850 for Nifty and for Bank Nifty, the stop loss must be maintained at 46,000. All right. Uh, so since we are talking about the IT sector, uh, let's take stock of what's going on there and uh, see if things have in fact changed uh, dramatically uh, for well, for the worse. Uh, so for now, of course, the index is down around 0.2%. Uh, Aditya Agarwal, uh, your view on the sector and have any names stand out for you in terms of shorts or longs at the moment? How are you reading into things? I remember it's difficult to play IT, no doubt about that. Uh, it's all over the place. Uh, but uh, as Aditya also pointed out, uh, that it's a good time to accumulate IT stocks because you notice every time you have a, a unperformance or maybe a result which is disappointed, all this entire IT pack falls. Uh, and then you see a buying pattern emerge in the IT pack. And then uh, these stocks usually tend to uh, catch up and, and then again, uh, they face resistance. So it's more of a, it, I wouldn't say it's buy and hold uh, yet. So buy and buy on all declines for the IT index. It's a selective buy uh, in that entire gamut of IT space. Uh, it starts with the mid cap IT and then usually it will trickle down to the large cap IT names. Uh, we had correction in the names like LTI and CoForge, uh, Mind Persistent Systems, all of them corrected. I believe it's good time to start accumulating into some of these names uh, to name a few persistent co-forge ltim these three stocks uh, could be looked at at current levels i believe uh, one uh, one can see a good short covering rally in the next uh, one or two weeks in, in mid cap it names then it could be followed by large cap it names uh, the likes of uh, tcs infosys and hcm technologies again uh, closer to about when the results will come for these uh, large cap it names you will again see profit booking in and most of these names uh, so it, it's more of a buy on decline and sell on a rise if you are a savvy trader you can do that agam then it's not a bad idea to look at it stocks because every now and then you have bouts of profit booking in it index and that will continue to do so i believe uh, in the coming uh, few weeks and or maybe for coming few quarters as well Aditya Arora, you talked about Bank Nifty, but uh, any specific trades on banking stocks? I mean, an ICICI bank, an Axis, uh, even an HDFC for that matter. When can we expect that one to wake up and smell the coffee? Because fundamentally, the number of calls coming in are pretty aggressive on the long side. Uh, so I would start with a disclaimer that we have recommended private banking names to our clients. So you must consult your financial advisor before going ahead with any uh, investment decision. I think ICIC Bank is a buy at this price, uh, 1092.55. This could be bought at this price. And stop loss must be 1070. And target is 1120 to 1150. So that is one. And uh, second one is Axis Bank. Axis Bank could be bought at 1046. Stop loss must be 1029. And target is 1060 to 1070. And I think HDSC Bank is taking a lot of time to consolidate. Maybe it could underperform, but that will also shoot up. But the lead is clearly taken by ICIC Bank and Kotak Bank. So I think the big moves could come in both these counters. Okay. All right. That's your view of where we have. Uh... Uh, well, your standpoint on uh, the IT space as well as the banking space, but uh, we slip into a short break on that note. Don't go anywhere. On the other side, we talk about stocks and a lot more. Stay tuned in.
different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. You have a missed call. Let's be real, guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term, when to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Welcome back to the FNO Show. We take a look at all the stocks which are buzzing in trade in the future space. Take a look at where there is uh, an increase in open interest towards what potentially could be longs. Not so many longs in the top five at least. Well, we have Ipka Laboratories which is uh, looking at uh, a 3% increase in open interest even as the underlying advances by around 1.3%. Longs there and BPCL as well. It seems like there's some strength returning to this one. And Dabar on the other hand along with United Breweries and MRF are under pressure. At the moment, uh, well, marginal declines for most of these counters, but uh, a little bit of an increase in OI all the same. What about stocks which are seeing unwinding? Let's pull that list up as well. And that's where we are seeing a little bit more coming through. About a short covering for Coal India. Now, the underlying has uh, not moved at, as much, but the change in OI is quite substantial, a decline of 38%. And Tata Steel, LNT, along with Indusin Bank, all of them are looking at a short covering. Sale is once again marginally in the red. And that's where, well, you could categorize that as some amount of longs and winding. But on the whole, it's been a relatively quiet day for the futures and options space. That said, let's take a look at what our experts are recommending uh, in today's day of trade. Aditya Agarwal, uh, well, your stocks on your radar today. Uh, so I've got a couple of buy recommendations, Agam. The first one is an l &T. Uh, After a good consolidation, looks like stock is getting up for a nice leg of up move. Uh, at current levels, I would recommend a buy for a target of 3720 on the upside. The stock was at 3550 on this on the downside. I see a bank uh, from the banking space is looking interesting, uh, and and I believe it's time to look at ICSA Bank apart from some of the other uh, PSU and uh, large cap private sector names. Uh, for a target of 1150 on the upside, ICSA Bank is a buy with the stock was at 1060 on the downside. Yeah, Aurora, uh, the clearly ICIC Bank seems to be a common uh, recommendation coming in from a lot of the technical analysts. And I think that's why Aditya Agarwala had that smile on his face when asked Aditya Aurora. Aditya Aurora, what about you? What about uh, your trade recommendations this morning? Yeah, so uh, although I like, uh, uh, I think buying is across the board, but let's stick to IT today. Uh, Wipro is a good buy at this price. 
480 put could be sold at uh, 4.55. This is March contract. Nine is stop loss and zero is target. So it's a bullish strategy. And uh, Infosys is second one, which also looks good at this price. 1520 put March contract can be sold. Currently trading at 16.40. 30 is the stop loss and zero is target. So both the stocks are with bullish bias. Okay, uh, do remember that in this case, uh, Aditya Arora is recommending a naked short of a put. Uh, should there be volatility where you must adhere to stop losses? Uh, of course, uh, in, in certain cases, Aditya, Agar, uh, Arora, uh, coming back to you, in certain cases when there is a sudden lack of liquidity, uh, it's, it is, isn't always a case that you, in fact, get to exit at the stop that uh, you have decided to or have put on. Uh, uh, if I were to convert this into some sort of spread, how would you do that? If I had to convert this into a spread, then uh, I would shift to uh, April contract with because very uh, little premium is left in March contract. So in April contract, I would sell 500 uh, put option in Wipro and I would buy 450 put option in Wipro. Uh, so that would be a good credit spread with a lot of premium. Uh, so that would be in the money shorting of put. So uh, that is aggressive buying over there. Uh, that would be the strategy in Wipro. And same uh, for uh, Infosys, we'll do it in April contract. We'll sell 1550 put option and we'll buy 1480 put option as hedge. So that would again be uh, aggressive buy on Infosys. Right. Uh, Aditya Agarwala, a quick one from you on real estate. Those counters are seeing a pretty big leg up today. Uh, any trades there, uh, a Prestige, a Brigade, some of the larger ones too, not doing too badly? Uh, so, Samina, I believe uh, the one which uh, definitely stands out for me is uh, Obera Realty. That is one uh, which has been showing strength for some time, not only just today. It's been last uh, few trading sessions that the stock has been inching higher gradually. Uh, with a good support at 1040, 1035 on the downside, uh, sorry, 1400, 4, uh, 1390 on the downside, I believe this is one to look at, uh, can easily test levels of 1550 to about 1600 on the upside. So we have to pick one, it has to be a uh, overall reality. Uh, a prestige estate also uh, doesn't look that bad, uh, but again, the upside will be capped to 1150. I I'm in a cautious stance as far as uh, real estate is concerned, and I'm going to watch wait and watch mode. There are a few pockets which are definitely outperforming, so I would like to stick to them uh, and again the top bit would be over reality from that entire real estate pack all right uh, that's uh, coming in on uh, well uh, the realty space we actually had a viewer question from ask profit from a couple of sessions ago and this was around kotak mahindra bank now uh, this particular viewer of course uh, held a significant amount of kotak mahindra bank in, in the cash market however since it hasn't really moved and it's continued to consolidate over the past uh, not just few weeks but months and perhaps even years uh, the question really was here that uh, how is it that a trader or, or an investor, in, in fact, can take advantage of Kotak Mahindra Bank? Uh, so, Aditya Arora, this question is for you. Is there a way by which one could, in fact, go ahead and sell a call or perhaps buy a put? How would you continue to do if, if you actually come across a counter like Kotak Mahindra Bank, which really isn't doing anything, and how would you go ahead and hedge and perhaps make for, uh, you know, uh, some sort of uh, that lack of movement or in, in or in for that matter, decline coming on? All right. So in case of Kotak Bank, as he's bullish in cash market, uh, so the only option if he wants to make money from the other side is by okay. selling call. If he sell put her... Uh, sell put so he would be again bullish uh, so now we need to also consider the trend stock has already took uh, multi weeks and multi months to consolidate so, so the last offer seen in may 2023 now already one year has passed my personal outlook on the stock is that stock could make a new uh, multi week high of around 1920 to 2050 so from here the stock could actually pick trend uh, from here and pick momentum from here uh, i think uh, if he has to you know cover up his lost opportunity cost then he can sell put option from this price uh, that is 17 20 17 40 he can sell little out of the money put option with a 100% stop loss 
then if, if he's selling 20 rupees put option, he can keep stop loss of 40. If he's selling 40 rupees put option, he can put stop loss of 80. Now uh, we'll uh, create the strategy in terms of the current trend. As the current trend is bullish, I wouldn't advise selling the call option because uh, somewhere he'll lose money in call option and uh, he'll lose the gain. So he can sell put option with uh, defined stop loss. Thank you, Aditya Garwala and Aditya Rora, for joining us today on the show. Uh, before we wrap this edition of FNO, uh, FNO Show, there's a slice of the conversation my colleague Neeraj had with uh, AMC's Vetri Subramaniam. Uh, listen into what Vetri had to say to Neeraj. I think certainly there are challenges on the IT side. It's been visible for a while. Even the you know Indian companies have been articulating challenges over there. They've been winning big deals, but the challenges in many of these cases, you're losing something which was a legacy business, and now you're announcing a new deal. So the net benefit to the company, you have to offset the legacy loss with the you know new deal wins. You can't just keep adding the new deals without recognizing the fact that there is some legacy business which is going away. So I think that challenge will continue. Everything that we hear from the US suggests that uh, you know tech spending is going through a difficult period. This is visible in technology, it's visible in the classic IT services, it's visible in support, and it's also visible in the consulting side, right? So the top end of the market, discretionary consulting badly affected, services less so. The only point that I would make, Neeraj, is that from a domestic economy perspective, one of the trends that we've seen in the economy in recent times is not the growth of just the classic IT services, but the rise of global capability centers in India, where you have multinationals setting up their own sort of research units here, doing research, doing coding, and doing a lot of stuff which is core to their own enterprise. And that, I think, will continue to sort of grow. So overall, IT services and you know related exports from India should continue to do well. But the classic listed IT services companies, particularly the ones with a lot of legacy business, I think they are going to struggle a little bit more to handle this transition. Last question. Amidst, all, amidst this rather, forgive me for using that word, cautious note, mm -hmm. where is it that you are the most optimistic on? Yeah. Uh, I should just add one more point on that IT bit, which is, look, these are India's most globally competitive businesses. So our view on IT is really that, you know, buy the dips. If they get okay. cheaper, we are happy to buy them because we think they will eventually come out on the right side of this. Uh, so not that despondent in that sense. Sure. Uh, no, I think equities are just rich. So really what we are trying to tell people is go back to the drawing board, hmm. look at your asset allocation framework. It's very likely that with the strong rally in stock prices, your equity allocation may have moved higher than where you were in your asset allocation framework. Go back to what your framework is telling you to do. So even in some of the schemes that we run, which sort of run our own internal asset allocation models, you know, we used to be at 65-70% asset allocation. Those have progressively kept getting cut and they are down to about 50% equity allocation, right? And 50% strategy which can be as low as 30 as high as 90, right? So that should give you a sense of the fact that you know the equity allocation is somewhere more neutral at this point and these valuation metrics largely look at large cap not mid and small cap if i were to use that the numbers might look worse but i don't have 20 years of history so we run it only on the large cap space but that's my simple message to in investors that's been the message from january rebalance 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 keeping in mind your long term goals rather than falling for the narrative of you know, this is India's decade. It might be, but that's no reason for you to move away from your asset allocation framework. People believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. 
And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards, simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future, as we've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? First, decide on Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money. Join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks. On your show, Hot Money. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. You have a missed call. Let's be real guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target? What's good for long term? When to buy? When to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the portfolio manager. Welcome you watching the small and mid cap show. I am Mahima Vachrajani and with me is Harsh Saita. Well, before we move on to our management for today and we've also um, have a lineup of interesting um, analyst views on the IT sector for today, uh, let's talk about how the markets are panning out to be. Uh, well, in terms of benchmark indices, Nifty 50 is up around 0.1%, uh, uh, very near to how it started today. It's only 35 points away from its day's high. Uh, well, the benchmark uh, Sensex is trading pretty much flat around 0.07%, around 148 points away from its day's high. And if we talk about the advanced decline ratio, well, um, the advance decline ratio is around 35 advance and uh, 17 decline. And uh, in terms of um, the um, broader markets, well, the Nifty mid-cap 150 is around 0.12% higher and uh, the small cap 250 is around 0.65% higher. But more on the sp uh, stock specific actions, Hirsch, how is the uh, small and mid-cap stocks doing? Well, yes, uh, you know, let's pull up the mid-cap index. Uh, essentially, it's trading pretty much flat, at least the mid-cap 100, uh, uh, pretty much flat uh, as we speak. There you go, just about a tenth of a percent higher. Uh, if you can pull up uh, uh, also the small cap index, which was flashing on your screen, uh, that's showing some amount of zing, around two-thirds of a percent higher on the nifty small cap. So. Uh, that's one end, uh, one space that we need to look out for. But first, on the mid caps itself, um, you know, uh, there seems to be specific pockets where there seems to be movement. Let's pull up something like a brigade. Positive note by Kotak, the stock is up 6% on the back of that. Now, it's not a very, uh, a very sharp upgrade by Kotak. What they've only done is they've upgraded their rating. Uh, they've not really upgraded the target price. Uh, so. Uh, it's 6% higher uh, on the back of that simple rating upgrade by Kotak. 
The other one I want to quickly flag off, maybe not in the SMID space, but is Sriram Finance, which is up around 1.7%. Outside of that, Prince Pipes also up roughly 1.6 odd percent in trade today. So those are some of the positives. PB FinTech, let's also pull up something like a Paytm, see what some of those are doing. Those have definitely, uh, or rather, Paytm definitely in the SMID space now. So that's something we can cover down around, a, you know, uh, two thirds of a percent or thereabouts. Uh, let's pull up something like a Prestige because that's the top gainer on the Nifty mid-cap 100 at least today, 4.5% higher. Vodafone Idea seeing good traction, 3.5% also an equal traction seen in HDFC EMC, 3.5% higher. Indus Towers, plenty of news in that one as well, 3% higher in trade today. CG Power down 3%, you also have a Coforge which is down roughly 3 odd percent. Uh, LTTS... Uh, no surprise uh, with some of these IT names, uh, essentially, but we'll, we'll cover IT in the latter half of this show. We have an analyst lined up to give us views, especially on a small and mid-cap IT. So that'll be an interesting chat to have. But, uh, you know, I want to shift focus. Deccan Gold uh, was in focus last week, uh, or rather in the current week, the sh shares of the company uh, rose, have, has gone up roughly 8% over the last five odd trading sessions. And because they've discovered gold and lithium reserves in Tanzania, now uh, we have the management with us to try and break this down a little bit further. Uh, Dr. Hanuma Prasad Modali, who's the MD of Deccan Gold Mines, joins us live. Uh, good morning, sir. It's, a, it's, it's good having you here. Well, good morning, Harsha, and uh, good morning, uh, Mahima. Thanks for having me on this show. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mudali, talk to us about what this means for Deccan Gold. Uh, what I, I'm not sure if there is a reserve uh, which you've already found or, uh, uh, or you have a quantification of how much of reserves are there. Uh, but give us some perspective on what this means and how quickly can you start extracting and a broad ballpark on how much would you expect in terms of revenue from this, uh, this new find? Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, please, uh, I mean, I start with a caveat. I mean, it's not a reserve as yet, uh, because uh, in the geological parlance, it is still in the very initial stages. Uh, Tanzania has been uh, one of our main focus, key component of our strategy. Uh, we have these licenses for last few years, but in the last one year, we have intensified our exploration activity in uh, Tanzania. We had licenses for gold, and uh, that's where last one year we have been exploring, and we have uh, discovered a few quartz veins. I mean, if I sound a bit technical, we found quartz veins with very high-grade gold in it, uh, but it requires a lot of exploration. In the last next, uh, next one to two years, we'll be exploring, and a lot of drilling activity has to be done. So it's not that uh, uh, the reserve has been quantified in that sense, but uh, it's a potential area which we'll be developing in the next two years. So simultaneously, what we did uh, in the last couple of years, we have seen this the critical mineral sector is going to be very critical for us, uh, particularly for India. Uh, and we have started diversifying into the critical mineral sector. As a part of that, uh, we already acquired a uh, license in Chhattisgarh that is for the nickel, which is probably one of the first nickel licenses to be acquired in this country through auction we got last year. Uh, so we, we are trying to expand the critical mineral portfolio of the company. So in Tanzania, which is again a good jurisdiction, it's known for its mining activity, and there is a there are potential areas. So we have done a lot of, uh, um, if I say that's the desktop studies we have done, and also a little bit of field work we did, and we have identified a few potential areas for the lithium and associated metals. Uh, and we have applied for the licenses. Actually, we got the license now about 100.49 square kilometers of license. But again, it would require a lot of exploration. I insist again and again on this. Uh, it is not reserved. At, it, is, uh, it requires a lot of exploration, but it is a very potential ground. So once we start the exploration, what happens is in these critical minerals and also minerals like gold, it would take about two to three years of intense exploration. If we discover the deposit, if we discover the deposit in that way, then uh, we need to uh, set up a small processing plant uh, in the, on the site. So the idea is we set up the uh, 
uh, processing plant, prepare the concentrates, lithium and other associated metals, and those concentrates probably will bring it to India. And that is where the market is going to be. Right. So that will take about two to three years for us. Right, right, Mr. Modali. So I just, I'm just trying to understand your business. You said that you've already acquired the license for lithium. Uh, your exchange filing said that uh, you know this has been recommended for a grant. So I just wanted to understand that uh, you know when you try to explore these mines, a lot of expenses will be incurred. So does this mean that you will be getting grant for this? And uh, if yes, this grant will be, um, I mean, offered by the Tanzanian government. How does this work, and how will this affect your PNL? See, it's uh, um, initially when we applied, it was recommended for the grant. That was what the BSC filings we did. And actually, yesterday it was granted to us. So once we have the grant, then we'll go and spend the money for the grant. I think in the next three years, roughly around eight to $10 million we need to spend on the exploration. Once that is done, as I said, uh, uh, we'll apply for the mining lease based on the uh, resources and the reserves it pays. It will, uh, in terms of uh, thing, uh, license, uh, conversion of the mining lease, it is uh, seamless there also in Tanzania. So we hopefully, once we identify the reserve, we'll get into the mining stage. And in terms of PNL, if I just give a ballpark figure, uh, our target is like producing about 30,000 tons to 75,000 tons of lithium concentrate. So if you are able to do that uh, through our processing operations, I think uh, we would be looking at anywhere around 20 to 40 million dollars of revenue on the annual basis with uh, that's how it would look like and the concentrates will come to India. Sure, point taken. Uh, how quickly will you get there? I think it will take two to three years, not before that. And this is only lithium, uh, if I understand correctly. Uh, no, no, not exactly lithium. Lithium is the main component in it. But sure. generally, these kind of deposits, that's the strategy we have. Uh, these hard rock lithium uh, mines, particularly in Africa, they will have lithium, tantalum, and cesium. Some of those are used for the processors and those kind of things. So lithium would be the main revenue uh, bearing uh, metal in it. But sure. we will have a significant amounts of tantalum that will come out as a byproduct, which is also a very valuable metal, in fact, that is used in processors semiconductors, et cetera. So that's a strategy, geological strategy, if I say, that's what we have in mind. Right, but, uh, so, sorry, yeah. but, but your revenue guidance is with regard to only lithium, is it? Uh, yeah, as and today, that's what we are, uh, because sure. lithium and cesium, tantalum and cesium, it could, uh, I mean, we do not know exactly what are the percentages of those metal available in this. So I am not projecting any of those revenue. Right, so, uh, Right. So for the revenue guidance that you've given, what does your margin look like then for the next two to three years? Uh, from the Tanzanian operations, you mean? Yes. There are two to three years, we are not going to get anything out of Tanzania. That's so, for sure. Because uh, exploration takes two years, another one year, setting up the plants and all. It will be after three years only we will have these kind of things. Uh, revenue coming out of that place. Right, so if, if, even after three years, what does the margin in your business look like? Just trying to understand that. Yeah, I mean, as I said, around 50% EBITDA and uh, then the tax on that. Um, around 30% is the tax on that. So sure. uh, if you start off at in the peak stage, if it is going to be $40 million is the revenue, then I think you can work out uh, based on that. Got it. And, and with regard to, uh, uh, you know, your capex plans there uh, how mm -hmm. do you plan to fund it because i've seen over the last couple of years your borrowings have started to inch up you have mm -hmm. operations outside of tanzania which is in india etc starting to come mm -hmm. on stream probably in fy25 uh, so mm -hmm. how how should one look at uh, your numbers starting fy25 because it will probably be the first year where you're going to start recognizing a large chunk of revenue right Yes, exactly. Uh, this year, uh, the plan is to bring two of our mines, one is in India and one is in Kyrgyzstan, onto the, to the product. So I think from next year onwards, we start uh, realizing some revenue out of these two mines, and which will be pumped back into this uh, exploration and also further capital requirement for this uh, uh, lithium and those kind of things in Tanzania. 
So there will be some money required and we are uh, trying to raise, uh, I think we would require about $25 million, but it's in a staged manner. Uh, that's what we are going to raise in the next one year. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So that's all that we have in terms of Deccan Gold. Thank you so much, Mr. Mudali, for speaking with us, giving us that perspective, uh, and uh, wishing you all the very best uh, for uh, uh, how FY25 pans out. Uh, you know, with that, let's slip into a very quick break. On the other side, we're going to sp be speaking with Sandeep Agarwal of Sovilo Investment Managers on IT stocks, especially with regard to small and mid-cap IT, uh, given the latest Accenture guidance. So stay tuned. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me Neeraj Shah on my show Talking Point. Let's be real guys, there are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term, when to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite oh, simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. As we've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. And on... you're watching the small and mid cap show well the nifty it is under pressure if we can pull up the nifty it charts you'll see that uh, it's still uh, two percent down today and we had a very interesting note of jeffries on the it sector well they've said that the growth was at midpoint of guided range and managed services slow down to decade low the, cli the client's budget are getting tightened and so they've cut their FY24 guidance by 100 to 200 BPS. Well, they've also said that negative read-through for uh, stocks like Tech Mahindra, TCS, CoForge 
and the sector valuations are right now rich and there is no recovery in sight at present is what they've said. The Nifty IT valuations are 26 times uh, in terms of PE and 13% premium to its five year average. Now, 29. Pre, uh, this is 29 percent premium to Nifty, and uh, th they have, of course, mentioned the stocks that they are uh, selective of. That is Infosys, Coforge, which remain their top picks. Now, uh, a downward revision in terms of guidance by one to two percent in FY24 is what they've mentioned, and uh, they've also mentioned weakness in banking, financial, and communication verticals. Um, but uh, Harsh, I mean. Um, just just to you know understand how the IT space is moving today only because of Accenture's guidance what do you have what are your views on it well yes uh, so IT of course uh, it's had a very strong run-up let's pull up the six-month chart of the nifty IT and what we'll therefore see over the last six months is uh, that the nifty IT has done fairly well seven and a half odd percent higher uh, and in fact from the bottom much much better uh, uh, in terms of its performance uh, and therefore, you know, the important piece here is to try and understand what impacts both IT stocks in India as well as the small and mid-cap IT stocks uh, in India from that Accenture guidance. So this, to try and break this down and more, we have Sandeep Agarwal, who is fund manager and co-founder of Suvilo Investment Managers, joining us to discuss, uh, uh, joining us to discuss exactly this. Uh, firstly, welcome, sir. Uh, you know, try and help us understand this, uh, Mr. Agarwal. So BFSI uh, seems to be facing some headwinds. Also, we have, uh, uh, you know, telecom facing some headwinds. Apologies on that. Uh, what's the sense with lega regard to large cap? Where do you think valuations are currently and is there some concern? Because clearly market's correcting on the back of that. So thanks, uh, and you know, uh, good morning, and thanks for having me on the show. I will just give us a, sm a small perspective before I can answer your question. See, in technology, what happens? We are the only destination in the world with highest market share in terms of executing at a at a lower cost and at at a scale. So you know, our strength is outsourcing and managed services. So if you just compare Accenture results Apple to Apple with us and expect the similar kind of impact, I think that is little, little uh, unjustified. Uh, we compete with Accenture or we are comparable to Accenture on, only in half of their business, that is the outsourcing or the manage, managed services piece, which is 50%. So if you see even yesterday's commentary of Accenture on the managed services piece, they believe that they will grow in mid single digit. While consultancy, which is a discretionary business and which is 50% for them, there they are seeing flattish or negative growth. For us, uh, for our large companies also, even TCS and Infosys, the consultancy portions are much smaller than Accenture. So I don't think we will see that kind of impact. Second, uh, the thing is that, you know, the US economy has undergone a lot of uh, interest rate hikes. And because of that, you know, uh, some, some uh, impact of that has to show up in the client budgets. And I think that is now showing up. And this is probably the last leg when, you know, you come to cut guidance or you postpone the wage hikes or we postpone the bonuses. They, we have always seen last 22 years of my experience in technology, I have seen that this is the always the last leg post which, you know, things recover very fast. So I think we should not be too much worried about what has happened with Accenture. It is a small cut and more related to discretionary. Indian IT, particularly the large names, they are at a very fair valuation. And I think this is the time to accumulate for the investors. Right, Mr. Agawal. Uh, well, Mahima, this side. So, um, what are your top picks then in the IT sector? See, we run a PMS, so it is very hard for us to call out any specific names. But I would say that, you know, you should, wherever there is value, like, you know, uh, TakeM, HCL, Wipro, these are all trading at a decent multiple or a reasonable valuation. They may undergo pain for another one quarter. That always happens when a new technology comes. Because in, take what happens whenever new technology comes, because we are the outsourcing service provider, we have to train all our resources in that new technology and deploy. So the most important number always is how many people you have been able to uh, uh, to train in the new technology. So if you see Accenture's yesterday's number, they have mentioned they have trained 62,500 people in generative AI. So that number will be lower for us. And as things progress in the next one or two quarters, we will also 
train large part of our workforce or the required workforce in the new technology. And when that happens, you will also see growth momentum pick up. Today, growth is not picking up in because the in those technology, we don't have manpower at scale. All the companies are training their people. It always takes one to two quarters. So whenever a new technology disruption happens, you know, Indian IT companies, the particularly the large cap, they suffer revenue growth for some time. And then when, you know, their workforce is trained in that new technology, they see a sharp jump in the growth and the profitability. So I think we are a quarter or two away from good numbers and good commentaries. So I, it's possible, uh, uh, and I'm just going to try to play devil's advocate here, Mr. Agarwal. You're still probably at least one quarter away from a possible rate cut in the US. Um, do you therefore think that there is going to be a lot more pain over the two quarters and there are going to be more buying opportunities over the next two quarters within IT before it starts to get better? See, it is very difficult to call exact bottom, but let me put it this way that if you compare, for example, actual problem or hard landing of the economy was supposed to happen in the US. Rate hikes have happened in the US, which are more severe than India. Still, if you see how NASDAQ has performed, it has gone up from 10,000 odd levels to 16,000. Microsoft being a trillion dollar company has gone up by 67% in last one year. And so is all other large companies within the top seven has gone up substantially from 20% to 300% in terms of return. So I'm saying the economy where there is maximum problem for the take those in that economy, the index itself has gone up by 50, 60% and the stocks have gone multifold. While we are the service provider, or we are the low cost executors for us, never the pain will be as strong as what happens there. And despite that, our stocks have not done well. So I believe that, you know, for us, uh, the problems will be much lesser, number one. Number two, even if it is for one quarter more, I think, you know, you have to accumulate beforehand because when things uh, change, like what we saw after in during COVID, just when people were guiding for negative growth and suddenly they started guiding for positive growth, the stocks went through the roof in very small time. So for a long-term investor, it is always better, you know, that if valuations are comfortable, which I think at least in few large names is now, then you should start accumulating at that point of time. Right, Mr. Agawal. So uh, from if, if you have to pick from, let's say, large, medium and small cap stocks, which one do you think will outperform in FY25 in terms of the IT sector? See, the cycle, in the disruption cycle in technology is generally very small. So you get a window of three to six, uh, you get the longest window in the large cap. So because, you know, large caps number of employees who are working is very high. So they take a lot of time to train their whole workforce. So generally, I have seen in last 22 years, four or five cycles of technology, which have been deep. And I have seen that four to five quarters it takes for the large caps to bottom and then start doing well. While for mid cap, what happens because their workforce is smaller and they are more, more agile, they are able to, you know, stop recruiting and cut down their losses in just one quarter or two quarter time. So uh, it will be difficult for calling full FY25, but I think large caps will start turning around maybe after June or September. After June, I'm more optimistic about June. And mid caps may see post that one quarter of dip, sharp dip in their utilization levels. And then mid cap should also start doing well. So the cuts will be sharp in mid cap. But I think mid caps will fall probably once large caps stabilize or they start gaining ground once their workforce is uh, trained in the new technology because mid caps workforce will be will lag in terms of training the large caps. So that is the way I will put. I think there is lot the valuation comfort is not there in the mid cap today. Uh, once that valuation comfort comes when you know utilization falls, then that is maybe the time to relook at them. Today large caps make more sense. Okay, understood. And the select large caps you've already spoken of. I want to try and also try and cover this ERD space, right? You have several names quite expensive in terms of their relative valuations, Tata Tech, KPIT, all of which are trading at expensive valuations. Your views with regard to that space to play IT, is that also a great way to play IT or do you, do you want to refrain from that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of uh, play? So see what has happened in ERD is that if you in the IT services piece, which is the traditional IT that is infra management services and the system integration, all those have been there and they have been outsourcing for a long, long time. Last three, four years, what has happened in the ERD space and particularly post this Russia-Ukraine conflict and other things, if you go and see the, the manpower availability in the ERD space has always been limited because there you need dual skill set of software engineering, mechanical engineering, software engineering plus automotive engineering. So you need the core industry expertise plus the software skills. 
that manpower is very limited across the world, even in India. So that because of the demand supply uh, mismatch and massive mismatch, the pricing and the growth was much better in the ERN and ERND outsourcing is one tenth of the outsourcing which has happened in the IT services. So it is a new industry which has picked up and the natural beneficiaries has been all the names you have called. The growth for this name should be good going forward also. But I believe at this valuation, it is a little uncomfortable to be with them. Right. Well, those were some really interesting insights in the IT sector. Well, thank you so much, Sandeep Agarwal, for speaking with us at NDTV Profit. Thank you. Right. Well, that's all we have for on the show. We're completely out of time. So stay tuned for more on NDTV Profit. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite oh, simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. We've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Decide Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks. On your show, Hot Money. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. You have a missed call. Let's be real guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target? What's good for long term? When to buy? When to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve? Welcome, you're tuned into Ask Profit on NDTV Profit. I'm Smriti Chaudhary and with me is Alex Matthew. And on this show, we'll take all your stock-related questions and get them answered by a fundamental and technical guest. But before we move on with that, let's take a quick check on where the markets are faring at. Alex, how does it look for the markets? We're seeing the benchmark index up about three-tenths of a percent. But do tell us more what stocks are moving and how does the broader market look? Absolutely. In fact, let's pull that up. Uh, and give us our viewers a sense of how things are looking, as Smriti pointed out. Gains of about a third of a percent, not too much to speak of. And in fact, the broader market's also doing reasonably well. So the Nifty 50 at uh, above 22,000 and holding, and you have uh, uh, the broader markets also that are gaining a little bit of ground. In fact, the advanced decline ratio 
should suggest uh, gains at this juncture and that the advances are in fact you have the nifty bank of course that is gaining about four tenths of a percent the advanced decline ratio in favor of the advances right now now uh, let's pull up the heat map because that will give you a bit of a perspective of what the texture is at least for the benchmark index and on the top of the screen you will have the likes of uh, bajaj auto as well as uh, hero moto corp and a couple of other names but at the bottom of your screen you have in a line you have wipro hcl tech infosys uh, LTI Mindtree, TCS, all of them losing ground. In fact, if anything, they are off the low point of the day. In fact, let's pull up the intraday chart of the IT index and you will see that at one point early on in the session, it was down about 3% or thereabouts and it's now significantly off that low point of the day and trading with cuts of about 1.8%. To tell you why that is, Agam is joining in uh, to give you some perspective. As you can see, as I was pointing out, 1.8% or thereabouts. To tell you what this is all about, because you had Accenture that came out with the revised guidance for the current financial year, and it was a bit of a disappointment, but what does that mean for IT companies and IT stocks in general? Agam, what can you tell us? Right, so let me start off with uh, what Accenture has suggested. Like right, right at the top, where we do understand that the company has cut its forecast for uh, fiscal 24 in terms of its revenue growth to around one to two to three percent from two to five percent earlier. Now the company has seen a decline of as much as two percent in its new bookings, and the company says that they see pressure in volumes for uh, some of your relatively smaller deals. Uh, well, they have seen uh, continued influx as far as your larger deals go, but the revenue accretion is not as fast as what you see in smaller deals. Uh, more importantly, they say that financial uh, services vertical has seen a decline of as much as 6% and the health and public services on, on the other hand has seen a growth in 10%. But clients uh, have seen a restriction in terms of their budget. Uh, discretionary spending has been uh, extremely limiting. and. Uh, there has been a, a slackness when it comes to the demand scenario. Based on that, we've had a couple of brokerages who have come out with their own read-through on the impact on Indian IT sector. So, uh, well, we have Jefferies, which suggests that Accenture has highlighted a rising constraints in tech budgets, and there has been a slowdown in managed services. And what will also not bode well for the Indian IT space is a rising weakness in uh, the financial services sector. Based on that, they also are negative on Tech Mahindra, CoForge and TCS. They also mention uh, a thing on the valuations where we understand that the uh, IT valuations stand around 26 times at the moment. That is the Nifty IT index, which is at a 13% premium to its five-year average, and it is also at a 29% premium to its uh, through the, to the Nifty 50. Uh, and that does mean uh, just a little bit of an overvaluation as compared to the rest of the market. Moving on, Nomira also has uh, suggested that uh, client discretionary spending continues to tighten. Uh, clients continue to prioritize spending uh, or not spend and rather optimize their costs going in. And uh, well, based on that, there is a little bit of an opportunity when it comes to cloud adoption and data standardization. But uh, they do like CoForge, Billasoft, Neclux, but they have a reduce on something like a TCF, Wipro, and LTI Mindtree. All right, thank you, Agam, for that. Uh, now, on that note, let me introduce you to the guests for today. We have Ashish Maheshwari, Director at Aryahant Capital Market, and Swati Hotkar, uh, Senior Equity Technical Analyst at Nirman Bank Securities. Uh, thank you so much to both of you for joining in. And uh, Ashish, I'll start with you. you we've heard about uh, Accenture's commentary on IT. And it seems like this recovery that, uh, pe that analysts were predicting for Indian IT is probably not not going to happen at least for a while. So basis this now this commentary is in and we've seen there's going to be some impact on the Indian IT companies like Jeffrey's mentioned TCS, CoForge and Tech Mahindra. H how are you seeing this kind of play out and are there any names that within the IT space, space that you're still constructive on? Yeah, first of all, uh, even after the lackluster performance of uh, Accenture, I'm not that bearish on uh, IT indices now. First of all, already Nifty IT indices, if you will see, it's already 3,000 points below 50 to be high. So, uh, already uh, slower growth in this particular sector is, uh, you know, factored in. 
Second thing, in spite of billing, winning a deal of 21.6 billion dollar, which is recorded the second highest record uh, deal winning, Accenture is still uh, highlighted that uh, growth will be uh, in one to three percent range. Uh, this same similar thing happening with uh, TCS and Posis also. They are also winning uh, uh, decent size uh, wins, but showing uh, uh, you know the guidelines in similar territories. So I'm not that bearish. Uh, if you ask me, in my view, what were the knee-jerk reaction uh, we have seen today? Uh, what bottom of uh, Nifty IT index was made today? Already it has retraced by 600 points from there. And uh, in my view, uh, at this point of time, we should uh, selectively accumulate good uh, large-cap IT plays like uh, TCS or Tech Mahindra, along with uh, mid-cap IT play like Emphasis or uh, O4 and Persistent Systems. So those are the names based on the fundamentals that Ashish has mentioned. Swati, I very, very quickly want to come to you as well on the technical uh, indicators that you're seeing for IT. Intraday, of course, we've seen a retracement as Ashish has pointed out, quite a sharp one at that. Would you say from the technical indicators that a bottom has been found? See, if we are looking towards the uh, longer term horizon on the emphasis, yes, definitely we have seen that the stock has tested its 200 day moving average, which comes to at around 2300 levels. And we have seen a bounce back rally in this particular counter. So we might witness some pullback rally and the stock has taken already the support on the technical ground and this uh, rally is likely to be extended towards 2550 to 2600 levels on the emphasis part. But uh, looking towards the uh, Tech Mahindra charts as of now, I believe that uh, the bottom has not been formed yet. We might witness some more selling pressure because there are the cluster support levels at around tw uh, 1220 levels. So up to that level, we can witness a correction into the Tech Mahindra charts. So one should wait for a long positions. Any deeps, if we are getting towards to 1220, one can take a long positions. On the higher side, the resistance, the stock is facing at around 1300 levels. Once it manages to clear that resistance level, then only we can witness some fresh buying in this particular counter. So I will suggest just to wait and watch on the tech mantra, but definitely one can go for a long into the emphasis because the risk reward ratio is favorable in this particular part. All right, thanks Swati for that. Uh, now let's uh, jump into the questions, but uh, let me remind you first that if you haven't already uh, written to us your questions, you can write to us on the WhatsApp number that's on your screen or through any of our social media channels or the YouTube live chat. But let's start off with the first one. This one's from Sujay from Kolkata and uh, they're talking about AU Small Finance Bank. Now they've bought the stock at 569 a piece. It's uh, slightly uh, elevated from where the price is currently uh, the price currently is now basis this they want to know the view for one year in terms of one year uh, Ashish how does it look based on the fundamentals on this uh, smaller bank a smaller player within the space as far as AU small finance bank uh, is concerned after uh, many years of uh, good performance in capital markets now we are witnessing a lot of pressure and this uh, the reason the stock is near 50 to week low also so I'm not advising AU small finance bank to uh, purchase at this price. We have seen some slowdown in their uh, growth also. Last quarter was not that great for the bank. So my suggestion will be uh, you can exit from this bank and look at um, other private sector bank like uh, Catholic Syrian Bank or DCB instead of AU small finance bank. Okay, fair point. Uh, I'm going to take a relatively shorter term question now. It's from Akil and he's asking about Canra Bank. He's holding 2,000 shares at levels of 590, and he hasn't really given us a time frame, so I'm going to interpret that as a question on whether or not he should continue to hold. Swati, based on the charts, what should he do? See, Canada Bank is really definitely a good counter on the banking front because we, in this particular year, we have seen that in 2023, we have seen the breakout of head and shoulder formation. It has given a very good rally up to from 250 to almost 570 levels. No wonder we might witness some profit bookings after such kind of a steep rally within a very short period of time. But uh, as of now, if you're looking for a longer term horizon, at least for one to two years, definitely this particular counter looks really good upside, I believe. It has a potential to reach up to 650 to 700 levels further. So one can look for a, a portfolio. Definitely this particular counter can hold. And if he's looking for any trailing stop losses, I will suggest to keep maintaining the long positions by keeping a 540 stop loss. And for the short term purpose, the target will be at around 640. 
All right, understood. Next up, uh, we have a question from Nandan from Bangalore, and uh, this is on Delta Corp. They've bought the stock from a longer-term perspective at 189 rupees. It's currently trading at around 122. From a longer-term perspective, Ashish, something like a Delta Corp. We've seen some uh, GST demands come in for this as well. While that continues to remain an issue, how does it look based on other factors, other fundamental factors for Delta? Accord. Yeah, this again the lower, like uh, the less performance stock. If you see in hotel sector, and uh, continuously we have seen sell off in this stock, and uh, uh, stock is also at near 50 degree close. So I'm also not great fan of uh, Delta Corp. If we see, you know, even the performance quarter over quarter, uh, their net profit dipped by from 16 to almost 34, 35 crore which is very low profit looking at the market cap of company. So instead of this, I'll suggest you invest in elementary hotels uh, at this price because uh, the way tourism is uh, growing, uh, this company has a very good potential and I'm expect, uh, and if you sell the uh, Delta Corp elementary, uh, maybe in six months, I'm expecting 170 plus in elementary. So better to swap the elementary with Delta Corp. Okay, interesting. Uh, we've got another question on Titan and uh, Vinay has not specified what really he wants to know about this. He's simply uh, given us a stock name, so I will take the liberty of uh, uh, you know, interpreting that as a, a question on the levels to consider when deciding whether or not to get into this stock. The stock is up about a percent and a half and trading very close to that 3,680 level. Swati, on the charts, how does it look? This Titan really looks very good on the technical front for a larger degree. As of now, it's just 200 points away from its all-time high. Uh, the weekly charts, it's really a bit showing a cautious sign because the counter is just showing a negative divergence from the overbought zone. So some sort of a profit booking can be witnessed in this particular counters. Uh, but uh, I'm assuming that probably he's going to held hold for the long-term positions. I believe this stock has a very good potential to reach up to 4,000 levels and beyond that levels. But as of now it has a very cluster supports level of 3500 level so as long as it sustains about that level i believe the overall technical setup of this particular stock is really uh, on a positive end and once you hold the long position all right got it next up we have a question from john and uh, they're talking about the counter natco pharma now, uh, the question here is, uh, Swati, uh, will it go down from here on? It's uh, trading at about half a, with half a percent gains. Uh, if we can pull up the five-day chart and see how Natco Pharma has been doing in the last year. It's down uh, in the last uh, couple of sessions, a bit of a chop and churn there. But is there a, a particular uh, sort of level where you would suggest accumulating the stock? See, uh, Natco Pharma has shown a very good rally in the la in the month of the February or such, from 8:30 to almost 1100 levels, and from there onwards we are continuously witnessing a profit booking or say the selling pressure, and the stock is trading in the formations of the low tops and low bottom formations. I believe as of now it's not showing any kind of a reversal from the low sides, but yes, it has a very good support at around 9:30 levels. So one should wait for that levels, then only if and if the particular counter shows any kind of a at that point, 9.30 levels, then we can initiate a buy call. But till the time, I will suggest to wait and watch. Don't create much long position in this particular counter. Buying positions can be attracted only if the stock manages to give a breakout of 9.90 on the higher side. And only we can witness some fresh buying positions, which might take a counter to us to 1100. But as of now, the view is a little bit cautious. Stay away from this particular stock. Absolutely. Considering the kind of run that it's had over the last 12 months, 70 plus percent of gains for Natco Pharma. We have to slip into a very quick break, but we got more time on the other side to ask all of your questions, so do stay tuned. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today.
Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. You have a missed call. Let's be real, guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term, when to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Stock selection isn't an easy task. Welcome back. You're watching Ask Profit. Let's dive into the questions again. Uh, this one's uh, from Amit Rastogi. Now, Ashish, uh, this is an interesting question. Now, uh, Amit says that uh, he's been holding HDFC Bank and Kotak Mahindra from a long time and uh, with both both with minor losses at this point. And he wants to sell one of them. So if you have to pick one from HDFC or Kotak, which one would you continue holding and which one would you sell? In fact, uh, coincidentally, both these stocks are underperforming. Mm -hmm. If you see uh, overall the banking sector performance, uh, so if you ask me, uh, you can exit in fact in both these stocks and swipe to performing banking stocks or where the good potential is there. So I'll suggest uh, again the frontline banking stock, uh, which is uh, Indescent Bank and Axis Bank. You can invest money there, and uh, there uh, at least uh, uh, more momentum will be there compared to. Uh, IGFC and Kotak. And in fact, if you want to still retain one, I'll just suggest you can retain IGFC Bank and exit Kotak Bank. Okay, but I'm surprised that you haven't spoken about ICICI Bank, Ashish. Is there a reason why? No, ICICI Bank is uh, again a performer bank, but I'm looking for uh, higher alpha, so of uh, which I found that the investing bank can offer better return. So read between the lines, viewers. That's what Ashish is uh, saying about the private banking space. Uh, the upside potential for ICICI Bank is limited, and that's my interpretation. Uh, maybe Ashish can correct me if I'm wrong. All right, but the next question is on Patel Engineering, and we've got Thomas from Kerala who's asking about this. 1,000 shares is what he's bought at a price of 72. I must point out that we've got uh, a conversation with the management lined up, if I'm not mistaken, at 12.30 today. At some point, you will see it over the course of today and tomorrow, so watch out for that. Uh, but uh, he's asking Thomas uh, whether he should exit or hold at this juncture. So, Swati, I'll come to you on the charts. Uh, should he hold? It's at 57 or thereabouts right now. See, currently, as of now, if we look on the technical front, yes, definitely the view is a bit cautious because it's showing a negative divergence from the overboard zone. That's why we are witnessing some selling pressure in this particular stock. But I believe the previous low, which comes to it around 53 levels, it might hold that level and we might witness some turnaround or say the pullback run in this particular stock towards 265 to 70 levels. So I will suggest to hold on, take a maximum risk of more three points from here onwards. That is 53 rupees stock 
plus you can keep and carry the long positions if you're getting any uh, high rise towards 265 260 levels one can exit the long position all right next up uh, we're talking about the counter uh, hudson agro foods this one's from um, vijay kumar from tamil nadu now the question here ashish is uh, from a longer term perspective, would you suggest buying the stock? And uh, if you look at the the how, how the stock has performed in the last couple of days, it has been uh, under a little bit of stress. So maybe this sort of correction, would you say, is a good uh, buying opportunity into the stock? Yeah, the stock is uh, very good. In fact, 25,000 crore market cap company, this is valuations are quite rich. Uh, only last quarter performance were not up to the mark where we saw some decline quarter over quarter in the performance. Uh, but nevertheless, as a company, a very stable placed company um, and uh, uh, in this summer, because this is going to be record summer, so uh, there will be good demand for uh, dairy-based product where Hudson Agro will do well. Along with Hudson, if you want to uh, add any stock in this particular sector, I think Parag Milk Food uh, uh, is another good company uh, where you can bet on. Uh, uh, Hudson Agro? Yeah, you can continue to remain invested if you, uh, you have already invested. Is my okay, fair point. Uh, no specific target, uh, but continue to hold based on the fundamentals is the view. Suntech Realty from the real estate space is what we're focusing on next. And this is a question from Jay Krishnan. He's writing in from Kori Kori in Kerala. And he has bought at levels of 477 for the medium term. He's wondering whether to hold average or shift to another stock. Uh, and if you are suggesting a shift, Swati. He's asking you to suggest a name. What's the view on the chart? As yeah, so of now, the view is a bit cautious on the monthly chart. The stock has given the formation of the cup and handle formation, but it has not given the breakout of the same levels. And we have witnessed a huge sell off from almost 500 to 380 levels. As of now, I will suggest to hold this particular counter because we have seen a major sell off in this particular stock, and probably we are going to witness a pullback rally towards to 440 to 460 levels on the higher side. So I will suggest to hold this particular counter, don't enter into this um, another pick but definitely you might witness some pullback rally in this particular All right, got it. Next up, uh, we have a question from Shri Kishore Sharma from Bihar. Now, we're talking about two counters here, Karnataka Bank, uh, where he bought uh, 450 shares at 440 apiece, and Polycap, where he bought the stock at 4,700 levels. Now, Ashish, from a longer-term perspective, this is for two years. Uh, Karnataka Bank, I think there's a QIP uh, that they have announced, and Polycap was, uh, th there were some, uh, there were IT raids, and the, from what I know, I don't think there is a demand notice yet into uh, from the, the that the company has received now from these two perspective uh, from a longer term perspective based on fundamentals of the company would you suggest holding on to these for the next two years yes i'll advise both these stocks you should remain invested for next two years karnataka bank again 8000 crore market cap uh, bank and doing very well and uh, i don't have any doubt that uh, they will have any issues raising capital by QIP also, and this is just 50 rupees away from uh, 50 rupees high. So good time to accumulate uh, good quality bank like Karnataka Bank at this price point. Two year my target will be around 350. As far as Polycap is concerned, we have seen a big major reaction where stock went down by almost 2000 rupees from the highs. But after that, we have seen continuous consolidation and the stock is continuously moving up. So from 3700, the stock is already almost at 5000 rupees. And uh, this particular quarter, I am expecting very good set of numbers from Polycap because of the, the way copper prices have moved up, they are going to have a lot of inventory gain. At the same time, they have taken price hike uh, for uh, their uh, cable products. So uh, for result also and otherwise also, I am bullish on Polycap. And uh, next two years, again, you will see 6,500 kind of target possible here. Quite, quite a significant upside uh, potential based on what Ashish is looking at. Um, Hudco is the next counter. Let's pull up the chart. In fact, the year-to-date chart of Hudco. We've got uh, Naga Sudarshan Rao, who's uh, writing a question from Hyderabad. And he's uh, wondering what the outlook is on the stock. It's gained about 50% or thereabouts in the year-to-date period. Swati, on the charts, is it still a buy for you? Yes, the, the view is definitely positive. If you look on a larger degree, on a weekly or the same monthly chart, the stock is giving a formations of the flat pattern. And it's 
on the verge of giving the breakout. Uh, as of now, from the last few trading session, we are witnessing very sideways momentum or say the consolidation momentum in this particular stock and the stock got stuck within the range of a 200 to 170 levels. Once it manages to give a breakout of 200 levels on the closing basis, I believe we are going to witness very massive momentum on the higher side towards at least 242 to 50 levels. So one should definitely carry the long positions in this particular counter by maintaining at least strict stop loss of 170. All right. Thank you so much, Swati, uh, for answering the questions that you have. And thank you so much, Ashish, as well. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time on this edition of Ask Profit. But uh, we, we'll be back on Tuesday and uh, we'll take more questions. But until then, have a happy Holi and thank you so much for tuning in. Stay tuned. Lots more lined up on ADTV Profit. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy a nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. We've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money. Join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks. On your show, Hot Money. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. You have a missed call. Let's be real guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target? What's good for long term? When to buy? When to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? Benchmarks recover after choppy start. Nifty maintains 22,000, while Sensex remains buoyant at 72,800. ACL Tech, Infosys, R, and the rest of the IT pack trade with cuts of up to 3% as Accenture slashes 25-24 slashes, uh, forecast, dimming hopes for demand recovery. While Accenture's guidance cut sends shockwaves through the tech sector, Jeffrey warns of client budget tightening and sector overvaluation. The highly anticipated Indian Premier League 2024 season begins today at the M.A. Chidambaram Stadium, Chennai Super Kings to take on Royal Challengers Bengaluru.
And India's top court will hear Arvind Kejriwal's plea challenging his address soon after Delhi CM booked by ED in money laundering case last evening. Hello and welcome. This is Hot Money. I'm Agam Akhil and this show we take you through all the stocks which are buzzing in trade as well as those which have been the flavor of the season. But before that, a quick look at the markets and uh, at the moment we are looking at gains coming through. Uh, well, all the... The, the losses and the weakness has been uh, bought into and at the moment we are seeing the Nifty advance. In fact, the Nifty is near day's highs and, uh, and it's once again uh, reclaimed 22,000 comfortably above the mark and a lot of that is on account of a whole host of counters uh, from the banking space all the way to Reliance Industries in ITC and l &T, all of them advancing and giving that that uh, you know that that impetus upwards. Of course, on the losing end, we do have names like uh, Infosys, TCS, and HCL Technologies weighing on the index, and uh, well, that's something which has been through the course of the day. Uh, of course, a lot of that is to do with the, the kind of commentary that Accenture has come up with in terms of expectations from clients and their sentiment around uh, the information technology sector and which has had a weighing impact on uh, the sector. And we are going to talk about that in just a bit. But before that, uh, let's also take a look at how the broader markets are faring. And broader markets are also moving largely in the green at the moment. The mid-cap index is up around 0.4%. The small cap index is around, up around 0.9%. Uh, uh, so gains all through and through. Uh, even in terms of uh, the, the broader markets, let's take a look at all the uh, well, stocks which are advancing in trade. So uh, we do have gains in a whole host of companies like Trident. That's up around 6% right now. Trident is one of those counters which uh, will usually tends to be a lot volatile but uh, is on the higher end today. Prestige Estates is the other one as well. We're going to talk about Prestige as well. Uh, that's up around 4.6%. We have an, another company update there. Vodafone Idea is up around 4.3% as well, up and, up and about. And then we have Loris Labs. Now, this one has also seen a bout of uh, covering of sorts, considering it's been, again, one of those relatively volatile counters. What's losing out today is a little bit of weakness in CG power. That's down 3.3% as we speak at the moment. Coforge is the other one. In fact, it's not just Coforge. It's a whole host of mid-cap companies which are also taking cues from uh, Accenture's commentary. So Coforge, Persistent Systems, l and Technology, Emphasis, all of them are looking at cuts of anywhere between one9 to two and a half percent. We continue to keep an eye on the IT sector, and uh, you know, speaking of that, let's take a look at all the stocks and themes that we want to address in, uh, in today's show. Uh, well, we do start off with Indian IT based on what we have in store as far as Accenture is concerned. And uh, most of the companies, of course, are in the red at the moment. Then, then of course, we have Prestige Estates with the company update coming through. Muthut Finance has also gone ahead and made a small acquisition in the company. Uh, then, of course, we have Tata Chemicals, which it seems that at the moment it has spawned caused its deep decline of late. Uh, we're talking about Zomato, which is at a life high, uh, a lot of improvement in sentiment around there. And then, of course, we're talking about private sector banks too. But uh, right at the top of the list, let's start off by taking a look at what's happening in the Indian IT sector. Now, Accenture had come up with earnings, and it's also cut its uh, uh, gui you know, overall guidance. But uh, uh, while it has cut its overall guidance of for, for fiscal 2024, uh, well, uh, that is coming in around 1.1 1 to 3% as against 2 to 5% earlier. Uh, what is really perplexing for the IT sector is the kind of commentary that is coming through. So Accenture has said that at the moment, a lot of the clients are tightening their spends. Uh, the, the discretionary spending is at a low and demand environment continues to be very, very slack for the entire sector. Uh, based on that, 
uh, well, uh, they are suggesting that there could be further weakness. Don't forget that for Accenture specifically, the financial services sector out of that vertical has seen a decline of around 6% in revenue. And uh, the managed services sector is also showing a lot of weakness at the moment. So uh, in overall, that has had a bearing uh, of, uh, you know, to the, to, to the tune of about, uh, about 100, 100, 200, 100 basis points uh, d decline coming through. And uh, because of that, because of that bearing, uh, well, we have weakness in uh, a lot of these companies, which would include something like a TCS and Infosys from the frontline names. Uh, we, of course, also spoke to uh, a handful of analysts earlier on in the day, uh, one of them being Moshe Khatri uh, of Wedbush Securities, who's also taken us through his view coming in. Uh, this is what he had to say, listen in. Um, what last we spoke, it was more about the quarter, and I said the quarter was better than feared, and I think that's where we are. We, it, it's kind of we're kind of stalling for a couple of quarters where things are not getting worse, but they're not getting better. In order them for them to get better, you need to see these bookings convert, and that's the bigger issue here. Um, you're right; we have not seen any large booking announcements um, year to date. Um, but again, you know, the, some of the companies will tell you that not, not everything gets released or is announced, and these tend to be pretty lumpy. So, you know, but ironically, even if we see deals announced, they're not converting. <laughs> That's the issue. Um, it's a very unusual situation that I have not seen, you know, throughout the years that I've covered the space. Clients awarding contracts, but they're not converting, and they're telling you to stall until they get a better feel on the macro and, you know, on Fed's cutting rates. Okay, so let's talk about these stocks and themes. And uh, we have with us Asta Jain, Senior Research Analyst at Game Securities, who's joining us on the show. Asta, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining in. What is your take on the Indian IT sector? You know, I was looking at valuations too. Uh, the Nifty IT valuations are, are not only at a, a premium to uh, their five-year average, but they're also at a premium to the Nifty 50, and that is by uh, a good 29-30%. Uh, what's your stance on the Indian IT sector? Circumspect, uh, if you are circumspect, what pockets do you like? What pockets would you like to go ahead and, in fact, still place bets on? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, see, uh, valuations are nothing, but it is a game of expectations. If you expect something from a company in the form of their earnings, then definitely that company or a stock command greater valuation. So here the whole game is of expectation. Now, if I talk about Indian IT sector, there is nothing wrong with the Indian economics as of now, but Indian IT sector, which is a uh, globally uh, dependent sector, and what we have seen, the macroeconomic conditions, especially in the America and the Europe, are not that strong. Uh, we all know that most of the companies, they derive majorly their revenues from the North America, and there's the situation we really need to see how it's going to do uh, going to be work. Right now, we what we have seen, that uh, definitely the deal wins were resilient because what we were seeing at the commentaries which were given by these IT companies' management in their quarterly earnings, that is basically of quarter 3 of FY24, that deal wins were resilient but definitely delay in the decision making is what markets are not liking because it always creates uncertainty. So there is a delay in the decision making, although deal wins uh, were resilient. But now what we need to see that how the automation spent, especially in the America and the Europe, will going to shape out. And that will really help the IT companies to post stronger performance in case if it works well in their favor. But right now, what I think and what even I have heard that um, um, there are some situations which many of analysts have not seen uh, since uh, so many years. But here I want to make one more point that every sector has its own uh, cycle. And what we have seen that there was a decay of a decade of a good performance by the IT industry. I think it will be a 10 or 15 years from last 10 uh, years or 15 years, we were seeing IT stocks performing good. So now there is a cycle for every sector. And that is why I am thinking that this cycle is taking some sort of a halt. It will turn positive, 
but maybe it will take at least uh, FY25 for the Indian IT companies to uh, show that kind of a strong performance which they used to show in the past. So we uh, believe at HIM Security that Indian IT sector will perform good, but not in this year. Maybe FY25 is the year when we uh, uh, can see some sort of uh, improvement in the financials. So right now, our stance on the IT sector is just hold. Uh, we really are looking after the situation, how the economics pan out um, in the US. US and the Europe, and then only we should take some step. So my stand here is just wait for the um, uh, all the investors to uh, make any entry into the IT stock. Wait and watch. Okay, it's a wait and watch on the entire sector. That's uh, the view coming in from uh, Asta. Uh, but we move on to the chemical sector. And uh, once again, we had a monthly export data, uh, which does show uh, well a, a bunch of surprising uh, par parameters coming through. In fact, uh, we also have a Kotak Institutional Report, which has put out its own analysis on this one. Let's get in uh, my colleague Vasha to tell us a little more about what's happening in the chemical sector, what's buzzing, and what Kotak Institutional has to say. Vasha. Thank you for that. So as you know, chemical export data is out and Kotec uh, came out with that report. So let's see what are the highlights for the same. India's export of organic and inorganic chemical jumped 23% month on month and 33% year on year in Feb 2024. Now the leading specialty chemical companies do not seem to have experienced a pickup. But the reason for the spike in monthly exports is not yet apparent uh, or clear as, cate as category-wise breakdown is not yet available. Now, commentary from global companies suggests that a demand recovery is not apparent for the near future and besides Chinese overcapacity is an overhang. Also, speaking of chemical price trends, chemical prices remain soft in general as per Kotak and prices of BOPP film increased 10% month on month, potentially a positive sign for SRF's packing film uh, division according to Kotak. Now, also there may be some pricing pressure on certain contract manufacturer products which can affect Naveen Florine and SRF for the same. Also, few months back, we did hear increasing capacity in a herbicide product which is a key product for PI industries. Post which, if you see, PI stock was down almost 9%. Well, Aztec has started shipment of that same product. Now, this is a sign of looming uh, competition for PI industries. Now, market uh, reports suggest that there might be shortage of nitric acid, which is a key raw material for Deepak Nitride and RT Industries after a planned shutdown by a key producer. Lastly, if you see, Kotec expects, overall, if you see, Kotec expects sluggish performance in general for next quarter or two. So this is the chemical um, export data overview by Kotec Institution. Right. Varsha, thank you so much for getting us those updates on the chemical sector. Asta, if you can come in on this, uh, your view here on the sector, your preferences, also what you make of the current trends. Yes, the global chemical sector is not performing good. But uh, the reason behind this is about, uh, again, Europe and America. So we are seeing continuously global, uh, um, and uh, the demand from those economies are not uh, that strong. So that is one of the major reasons. But India, uh, Indian chemical sector was standing on the strong footing because we are seeing that the companies from the Europe and America, they are now looking towards the India in order to de-risk uh, de their supply chain issues. As well as we are seeing uh, even capable is also picking up in some of the chemical uh, um, industry uh, chemical companies in India so that is one of the major uh, reason but again I think it will take a whole lot of a year to show a strong performance by these chemical companies especially if I talk about the calendar year 24 so we are expecting that in the second half of uh, calendar year 24, we can see some sort of a improvement in the performance. So again, even we agree with the Kotak report that for coming up uh, one or two quarters, we will not see a strong performance by these companies. In fact, what we are seeing that, uh, especially the commodity chemical, there are certain sort of volatility in the commodity chemical due to the volatility in the prices globally. So in fact, commodity chemical will also be dependent on those volatile moves. And I think uh, due to those reasons, they might not perform that strongly. So for the chemical sector also, we are not very much positive at this current point of a time. And we are expecting that maybe it will take another uh, six months or so in showing strong performance. So might be actual two of calendar year 24 will be a stronger one for these chemical companies. But um, I mean, recently uh, for coming quarter one or two, even we are not very much positive. So again, we are advising 
not to invest in the chemical stocks as of now. But uh, PI Industries is what we have a contrary view to the Kotak because we are liking this company. They have strong, uh, they have shown strong performance, financial performance, and now even they are diversifying the non-agro space also. So that will be the trigger for the company. And I think PI Industries uh, will continue to maintain its margins uh, of around uh, more than 21%. So in the whole chemical stocks, PI Industries looking good to us. But for the long term, for the price target of 41. 25 to 4200. All right, uh, uh, fair enough. Uh, that's the view as far as the chemical sector is concerned, preference towards PI industries. And uh, we shift focus from there on to prestige estates. Now, in the latest update, the company has acquired about 62.5 acres in uh, the Delhi NCR region. This is for uh, some total of 468 crores. Uh, now, the company is saying that they, it is going to develop a project here, and this will be under the brand of uh, the Prestige City format, where they are looking to put out an area of about, two, about 10 million square feet. Moreover, they're saying that the gross development value could be over 10,000 crores, and that could give you an idea about the kind of revenues they could potentially garner from this particular plot. And they say that they are looking to launch the project over the next two quarters, and it is likely to take about four years. Uh, Asta, that said, how are you looking at Prestige Estates? Uh, it's built its, uh, uh, you know, uh, area, and it's it's actually building on to f uh, markets just beyond just Bangalore. In fact, it now has a reasonable amount of presence in Bombay, and of course, uh, uh, we are also looking at the presence in NCR too. Uh, what's the way forward here? And if there is an alternative name as well in the sector? So talking about this counter, although this counter uh, has performed strongly a few uh, months back, but afterwards we have seen a, uh, a fall in the stock prices. And I attribute uh, that fall majorly to the valuation of the stock because it was trading at a higher premium to its peers. And that is why we have seen a strong correction. Now talking about the fundamentals, fundamentals seems to be okay because their pre-sales were strong. In fact, uh, uh, they have launched uh, a uh, new project in the residential space also so the, and their launch pipeline was also strong but major concern was of the valuation and that is why we have seen a correction in the stock prices also so prestige estate is just a hold for us at this moment of a time we are not recommending a new buy uh, we really want to see how the quarter four of fy24 will pan out for this company and then we'll give a call right now those who have the stock they can hold the stock for the price target of 1200 to 1250 but uh, we are not recommending a new buy on the stock as of now okay and uh, then we have an NBFC, which is on our radar, and that's Muthut Finance. Now, here we understand it's, cover, it's acquired an additional 4.5% stake in Bellstar Microfinance. Uh, they have acquired about 60 lakh shares for a consideration of 300 crore rupees, and they've increased their stake of to around 63.5% from an earlier 59%. Uh, the acquisition has been carried out through subscription to Rice Issue by uh, Bellstar Microfinance. So it does seem like uh, Muthut Finance is looking in for some inorganic growth as well. Uh, that said, it also stands to be a beneficiary as we, we understand that you know just a few weeks ago, we had IFL Finance, which has run into some regulatory trouble. And uh, of course, one company's loss perhaps could be another company's gain. Uh, could that be the case, Asta? What's your view overall on Muthut Finance, uh, your view on the gold lending sector as well? Uh, how, what's your place here? So I think the gold loan growth has already shown some sort of improvement when the company has posted its numbers in the quarter three of FY24. So that was one of the case. And uh, in fact, we have seen some sort of decline uh, in their asset quality also. But we were not very much concerned about it because uh, some of their stage three assets were backed by high collateral. Uh, and in fact, the management was also positive because they have given the guidance of 15% uh, of their um, AUM growth. So looking after all these factors and the recent news flow, we still think that the stock can show some sort of upward momentum and we are positive on this counter. Positive not for the buy, but for the hold. So here also our stances hold the counter for the price target of around 1530 to 1550 and uh, wait for the results also. Okay. All right. Uh, well, Asta, hold that thought. We'll slip into a short break and uh, don't go anywhere. On the other side, we get to you the balance of that list that we want to talk about. Stay tuned in.
different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real, guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target? What's good for long term? When to buy? When to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you... The Welcome back to Hot Money. And the final stock that we have on our radar is Zomato. It's making a new life high right now. There has been increased traction, especially since it came out with a reasonably good set of numbers in the quarter gone by. And uh, it does seem like the management is uh, very focused on turning operationally profitable. In fact, uh, uh, they do suggest uh, a continuation of the trend going into the next few quarters. And uh, you know, that always bodes well for a company uh, like Zomato, especially given the fact that it could have uh, one of its peers list very soon on the markets. And by that, I mean Swiggy. Uh, the only difference is that Swiggy is still uh, struggling in terms of its bottom line, uh, whereas Zomato could potentially change things around on a consistent basis. Um, that said, it's uh, on a six-month basis up as much as 73%, as you can see on your screen. And, of course, it is trading at a life high. It's also been a multi-bagger over the course of the last 12 months. Uh, so the question really is that what do you do with this one? Asta, what is your view on Zomato? How are you regarding this? So we are liking this talk. First of all, um, the uh, results which they were posted were good. And in fact, management is reaping the guidance of uh, giving the uh, revenue growth of 20%, oh, sorry, 70%. So that is very strong. Now here, uh, what is working positive for the Zomato is the Blinkit, because Blinkit's performance is really very good. We are expecting Blinkit to be um, break even by Q1 of FY25. So there are various reasons that Blinkit's performance has outpaced the industry because of the geographical experience expansion because of the improvement in the audio frequency also and the higher take rate. So what we are expecting and due to that we have seen the margins also expanded. So I think for coming a uh, few quarters also Zomato will continue to perform strongly on the bourses and we are remaining uh, positive on this counter. Our price target is 210 in the medium term. So we are uh, giving uh, buy as well as hold rating for this counter for the possible price target of 210 to 212. Okay. All right, well, that's the view on Zomato coming in. Well, on that note, Asta, I'm going to take a moment to uh, thank you 
for joining us and taking us through your views on the various stocks and themes that we had in focus today. And we also wrap the show. But before that, here's a slice of uh, the conversation my colleague Neeraj had with UTI AMC's Vetri Subramaniam. And this is what he had to say about the IT sector as well as several other factors playing out in favor and against markets. Listen in. I think certainly there are challenges on the IT side. It's been visible for a while. Even the you know Indian companies have been articulating challenges over there. They've been winning big deals, but the challenges in many of these cases, you're losing something which was a legacy business, and now you're announcing a new deal. So the net benefit to the company, you have to offset the legacy loss with the you know new deal wins. You can't just keep adding the new deals without recognizing the fact that there is some legacy business which is going away. So I think that challenge will continue. Everything that we hear from the US suggest that uh, you know tech spending is going through a difficult period this is visible in technology it's visible in the classic IT services it's visible in support and it's also visible in the consulting side right so the top end of the market discretionary consulting badly affected services less so the only point that I would make Neeraj is that from a domestic economy perspective one of the trends that we've seen in the economy in recent times is not the growth of just the classic IT services but the rise of global capability centers in India where you have multinationals setting up their own sort of research units here doing research, doing coding and doing a lot of stuff which is core to their own enterprise and that I think will continue to sort of grow. So overall IT services and you know related exports from India should continue to do well but the classic listed IT services companies particularly the ones with a lot of legacy business I think they are going to struggle a little bit more to handle this transition last question amidst all amidst this rather forgive me for using that word cautious note mm -hmm. where is it that you are the most optimistic on yeah. Uh, I should just add one more point on that IT bit, which is, look, these are India's most globally competitive businesses. So our view on IT is really that, you know, buy the dips. If they get okay. cheaper, we are happy to buy them because we think they will eventually come out on the right side of this. Uh, so not that despondent in that sense. Sure. Uh, no, I think equities are just rich. So really what we are trying to tell people is go back to the drawing board, hmm. look at your asset allocation framework. It's very likely that with the strong rally in stock prices, your equity allocation may have moved higher than where you were in your asset allocation framework. Go back to what your framework is telling you to do. So even in some of the schemes that we run, which sort of run our own internal asset allocation models, you know, we used to be at 65-70% asset allocation. Those have progressively kept getting cut and they are down to about 50% equity allocation, right? And 50% in a strategy which can be as low as 30 as high as 90, right? So that should give you a sense of the fact that you know the equity allocation is somewhere more neutral at this point and these valuation metrics largely look at large cap not mid and small cap if I were to use that the numbers might look worse but I don't have 20 years of history so we run it only on the large cap space but that's my simple message to in investors that's been the message from January rebalance 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 keeping in mind your long-term goals rather than falling for the narrative of you know, this is India's decade. It might be, but that's no reason for you to move away from your asset allocation framework. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Oh, it's simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty Call Option. But if you think the market could slide downwards, Simplifying Futures and Options Trading.
Don't worry about the future. We've got your options covered. Future is an option strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show Hot Money. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. You have a missed call. Let's be real, guys. There are many financial experts out there. conversation today is credible India enterprising West and that's probably because we're at a Western CII event so of course the focus of the Western region uh, is important um, I'm from this region and anyone who is is extremely proud but the fact is that credible India or I would say incredible India is the story of the moment and this is not something that just we are saying um, you'll pick up any report right now, and it's talking about India's decade. In fact, a Morgan Stanley report earlier this week talked about how this is India's decade for several reasons. It's a confluence of factors and right place, right time in a sense, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's demographic dividend, whether it's credible macroeconomic performances time and again. So we're going to talk about a couple of themes over here. We have a goal set for 2047 for a Viksit Bharat, a developed nation. And while that sounds great to everyone, you know, it's India's time and place. Couple of things. Do we have to wait for 2047? What does our version of Viksit look like? Because there is a very standard definition of what a developed nation is. Are we adhering to those norms or do we have our own path to chart? And that's what I'm hoping to capture with some people on and everyone, this excellent panel today. So let me kick off with that and let me start with Dr. Praveer Sinha and his views on this subject. Um, so when we talk about 2047, Viksit Bharat and uh, of course, a credible India with the role of the Western region, if you may like to add. I want to understand what is your take on what this Viksit Bharat looks like? Thank you, Tamanna, and uh, such a pleasure to be part of this uh, discussion. Uh, well, I, I think uh, let's try to break this. While we have the long-term plan for 2047, we also have short-term plan for 2027 and 2030 and 2040. And I think um, if you see how uh, things are evolving, where we want to be 5 trillion by 2027, and uh, by 2030 we should be 7 trillion, uh, there is definitely a directional roadmap that has to be set. And uh, the way things are today geared up in the country, and let me talk about the power sector, uh, there is huge amount of interest. Uh, the type of investment that we are looking at uh, between now and 2030 is nearly 5 lakh crores. Uh, and that's the type of uh, investment that will happen. And uh, this will happen in the energy transition space where there is a lot of push uh, and government has committed, Prime Minister himself has said that we'll have 500 gigawatt of clean energy. Uh, on non-carbon energy by 2030. And people ask me that, is it feasible? 
and I tell them that it is definitely feasible. And why do I say this? A uh, few data points, uh, 2000, we were 100 gigawatt. 2010, we became 200 gigawatt, we doubled. But it is not that it was a one-time thing, 2020, we doubled it to 400, and today we are something like 440. So it's definitely something that we have done, and notwithstanding the COVID two years that we had, we still added capacity. So I think uh, becoming, uh, uh, adding 500 gigawatt of uh, clean energy is definitely possible, considering that our clean energy portfolio today is just 170 gigawatt. So I think uh, this is the best phase. India is poised to leapfrog because we don't have a baggage which many other countries have, Europe and US and all that. They created a lot of inherent capacity which they have to close and then start uh, uh, into the clean energy. For us, uh, our demand is increasing now, and that's where we will be able to create de novo, a fresh new energy transition solutions. And um, uh, I'm very confident that if uh, in clean energy, the type of investment and the type of technology that is happening, and I'm not just talking about uh, just solar and wind, but also talking about the nuclear small modular reactors, nuclear reactors, uh, so many other areas where plasma technology and some of the uh, other technology interventions are happening. So I, I think that if globally any country which has so much of potential which is there, uh, India is the place and uh, there is no way that anyone can miss this opportunity and make things happen. Uh, so, in a sense, we're not late to the party, we're arriving at the right time in terms of sustainable energy is concerned, but, uh, you know, just a quick follow-up to, to what you said, uh, Dr. Sina, before, of course, I move on. The challenge, or I would say the push and pull for India has always been, we are an energy-hungry nation, and we want the cheapest, fastest, and most reasonable energy, which is why we've seen that in the last few years. Our coal imports have gone up. We will need to do that. There may not be a situation where you will never use thermal energy at all. In that sense, do you think that in the larger picture there will be a longer way to move to sustainability or can we manage it with the goals of development we have? I, I think um, uh, energy, <laughs> In India, and we are to that extent very fortunate, especially in our energy transition. And that's why we talk of energy transition. We don't talk of a knee-jerk reaction that something will happen tomorrow or day after. But in next 10 to 15 years or 20 years, this transition will take place. Just to give you again a perspective, today we have nearly 70-75% of our energy which comes from thermal energy, whether it is coal or gas. Uh, Going forward, this will change. This will change to maybe about 15 to 20 percent. So, so that's the transition. We are not talking about that it will become absolute zero, but majority of it will come. And many a times the question comes is that uh, your clean energy, solar or wind, is infirm power. And how do you make it firm? How do you make it 24-7? You can't have scenarios where factories run when the sun is there or when the wind is blowing. So you have transition technologies, whether it is battery storage, pump storage, and the nuclear reactor. So I think uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And today, the way the changes are happening, the, they, the way the Technology is changing. I have seen in labs globally, people are working on plasma technologies, nanotechnology. And uh, by the end of this decade, we will have very good 24-7. So I want to be 100% sure that uh, we will not have only uh, during the period you have sun or wind, but during the period you want energy that you will have clean energy. And, and this is something which is a necessity also. Uh, considering the type of climate change, the type of sustainability issues. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, report. Uh, there was also a report uh, where it talked about we have uh, amongst the top 
83 uh, top 100 uh, cities in the world, 83 are India, which are the most polluted cities. So, so this is a reality which is staring on us. This is a reality that we had had in last 10 years, 54 extreme weather conditions. Uh, we have short memories. So I think it is a necessity. It will happen. And we are at the right time. And fortunately, in India, uh, sun is there right through the year. Uh, so s I always tell sun is the new oil for India. Yeah, uh, that's uh, Praveer Sinha, foremost voice on, uh, you know, energy transition in India. And uh, thank you. That's going to be a big part of the path that we want to chart. And very rightly put that 2047 right now is the phrase we're talking about. It's a target set, but we need to move there quickly and on the way. Um, Mr. Sanjeev Puri, let me come to you on, on you know, your vision of what a developed nation would look like because the parameters that are globally accepted is also about per capita expenditure, per capita income. And as India grows and the world is watching with awe at how fast we're growing, the question about whether it's equitable growth for everyone is always a very key question. Yeah, a very, very good point. Uh... Uh, it has to be, you know, uh, development has to be on the bedrock of inclusive and sustainable growth. And before I come to the piece on uh, the, the point that you made on per capita, let me just uh, take a moment to talk about sustainable growth. You know, for sustainable growth, there is one facet of energy transition, decarbonization, and then, you know, the, uh, the, the world cooling down. But as much as we would like it to cool faster, the reality is that it's going to take a long time before it starts cooling. Because the temperatures will increase, extreme weather events will increase. And you cannot talk of a developed world if the world continues to be devastated by floods, heat waves and droughts. And, and challenges of uh, agriculture, productivity, shortages of water. You're seeing it in Bangalore today morning. I was seeing Johannesburg has the same issue. So forget per capita income. If, if those basic necessities are not met, what do we mean by a developed world? Forget Avikshat Bharat, okay? So I think the first and foremost issue that we need to uh, build a very strong foundation is of sustainable growth is really the piece on nature and adaptation. We need to get our act together as far as adaptation and nature is concerned. We need to work out the methods of living comfortably in the hot new world, in the world that will have more extreme weather events. So I think that's, that's a very important fundamental pillar. If it is not done, it's not going to lead to great quality of life. And, and we know that health also, you know, is, is going to become an issue with global warming. And we have seen some of the consequences of the uh, fashion of development that world has adopted. You know, COVID is a consequence of that. Ultimately, it's, it's a consequence of our developments. So I think that part needs to be fixed. If you're really to talk about a developed nation or a developed world in 2047. The second is that it's important that, uh, you know, it's, it's not about averages of per capita. It's about inclusivity. It's about inclusive growth. How, how well are, is every participant of the society benefiting from the progress that the nation makes? And that's the vision that uh, Honorable Prime Minister also speaks about sustainable and inclusive growth. And it's about uh, women power. It's about incomes in agriculture. It's about gainful employment for people who want it. So it, it will be about uh, us getting competitive in large manufacturing sectors which employ a lot of people. It's about also, uh, you know, playing to our demographic dividend by really accelerating skilling and education so that we have a competent workforce that can deliver for the world. And it's a plus for us because the whole world has a demographic challenge. So it's a big, big opportunity for us. It's about being able to develop sectors like tourism, which have huge economic multipliers, so that gainful employment is found. So it has to be on the bedrock, bedrock of sustainable growth, strong foundation for adaptation, and inclusivity, where every member of the society can participate in, in the progress.
different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be... Where our growth story is going, I would say, and I'll come to Mr. R. Dinesh on this, is absolutely the supply chain, the logistics part of it. And we are at this um, sweet spot. You've had uh, the um, uh, freight corridors finally on now. You have connectivity like never before. You have a Gati Shakti scheme on. And we're, that confluence is happening. What is the kind of game changer this is going to be, sir? Thank you, Tamana. So if you look at it, I think let us step back for a minute. What does this infrastructure really mean for India? If you look at every time where India has had the opportunity of potentially being part of global supply chains, you would have run into this, I would call it, oft-repeated issue of saying, oh, India is not competitive enough. And the reason why that is that has been is because we didn't have the physical infrastructure available in, I would call it, enough scale. You had sporadic uh, attempts being made at that. I think over the last five, seven years, you actually see not just the physical infrastructure having been invested in, and obviously you know the amounts and the value which has been invested in, and I think that sets a very strong base for, I would call it, the ease of being part of global supply chains. But the real value is what India has done, is how we have digitally managed this flow of information, which is what is the reason why I would call it companies are coming in to invest in India, and India has a great opportunity to be part of a global supply chain. So that digital infrastructure, I'll give you an example. Today, every movement of goods from point A to point B in India is actually mapped and visible real time. I can tell you no other country in the world has got that kind of a data available with a government agency to be able to track and actually add value. So if you look at the Gati Shakti program, one of the, while that is on the infrastructure investment side, if you look at the reverse side of it, I know that actually there are uh, what they call hotspots in terms of wherever delays are taking place in terms of transportation, road transportation for example, or where there is a problem with regard to goods being stuck is today visible at the Logistics Division Secretariat. So that kind of digital visibility is why I believe that India has, I would call it, genuinely graduated to being able to be part of this global supply chain. That's point A. Point B, which is equally important, is I would call it the strategic shift and the positioning of India as being a partner who can be trusted and therefore people coming in and investing in and working with 
themselves or working with Indian companies to be part of this. The final point I'd like to make here is the challenge is how do we make sure that our Indian MSMEs, our, uh, I would call it tier two, tier three suppliers, actually start becoming integrated into that global supply chain, but that's for later. Yeah. Uh, no, quick follow up over there because you talked about, uh, in a sense, the China plus one factor. And if India is being positioned as the nation that can reach there, we need to be as competitive. In your view, where do we stand in terms of being competitive enough in connectivity, in those logistic supply chains, which will make your MSMEs also competitive when it comes to exports? So uh, that's a very good question again, but I don't think the right comparison is China. The right comparison are other Asian markets. And uh, I would also not say that it is China plus one. In fact, I've officially stated it even before. I believe people come and invest here because they are interested in the domestic market and also are interested, I would call it, in strategically diversifying away from one country. It could be China, it could be any other country with whom they have invested with. So, because the China plus one is a limited window of opportunity. This is a much larger window of opportunity, at least five, seven year window of opportunity. So you are right, we will need to be competitively benchmarking ourselves against other Asian countries. The cost of doing business, as I said, the ease of doing business is much better in many ways. But I think the real issue we'll have to work with is at the state's level, is at, I would call it, the ability for each of these states to become integrated, like in the Gati Shakti program, to actually be there visible and the investments in CapEx, which is now taking place, be actually tracked to see the best value. The last comment I will make, I think uh, you asked earlier about what is going to be India's differentiator. My view is India has got to invest in all of these infrastructure, whether it be uh, physical or uh, digital or digital, to really make your utilization of this far higher. I'll give you an example from the transport sector. Suppose we say a, a truck is being utilized 80%. It's 20% based. You may say global benchmark is whatever, 68% or 72%. But I believe India can set the standard because of this digital physical coming together to say that our utilization is going to be best in class across, which will then significantly reduce your cost. So rather than work on what I would call the supply side, I think we will need to work on the utilization side. And uh, transportation becomes important not just for goods and services, but for people as well. So, you know, that's my segue to speak to Vinay Dube. And uh, Vinay, I'm glad to speak to you uh, today because uh, you run, I think, one of India's youngest airlines, also fastest growing. And I think it's right time, right place for you guys as well, right? You, you, your airline trajectory uh, is matching along with the speed with which Indians are taking to the skies. The growth in passenger numbers, yes, you know, the COVID period had that setback. But post then, the pickup that we have seen uh, has coincided with uh, Akasa's path as well. And uh, has that been a happy coincidence for you? Th thank you for that, Kamana. Yeah, happy coincidence certainly. Um, but when you when you start an airline, you don't start it coincidentally, um, especially when you start an airline in the midst of COVID. So I would say this is an anticipated event. Um, you know, you're sitting in the middle of COVID, um, and you can feel pal palpably that this is a temporary phenomena. As a as a human race, you could feel we're going to get over it. And as Indians, you feel you're going to get over it, which is why it felt like the best possible time to actually start an airline. Uh, and this growth is not for one or two years. You know, we're talking about 2047. We've got maybe 500 flying aircraft today. In 2047, we could have 3,500 flying aircraft with a woman CEO of Akasa. Um, we, also, we also talk about energy, just to give you a sense. Um, we don't have statistics on the world's greenest airline. We, we don't, at least I'm not familiar with it. So I'm gonna make a very provocative statement here that I believe India as a country, but Akasa also specifically has some of the world's greenest airlines. So in India, you've got a, uh, a, some of the largest fleet 
of modern aircraft, whether you look at the 320neo, whether you look at the Boeing 737 Max, whether you look at the 350s, um, we've got the largest percentage of modern fuel-efficient aircraft in India. And, and at Akasa, it's 100% of our fleet are modern fuel-efficient aircraft. On top of that, we've got flight attendant uniforms that are made out of recycled marine waste. The soles of our shoes are made, made out of recycled rubber, the packaging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd say when it comes to airlines, we should take great pride in India from an energy perspective because we're running the youngest, most modern fleet here. Uh, having said that, uh, Vinay, uh, I mean, every activist who is pushing for sustainability worth their salt will say flying is the worst thing that you can do for the environment. So till you fly on ATF, can the airline industry truly be sustainable? And what is the future? Is there an alternative in sight is what I'm wondering. Sh sure, sure. I mean, there's sustainable aviation fuel. Um, we don't have it across the world uh, at a point that is either abundant or affordable. But that's coming. That's absolutely coming. But let us also look at the flip side. Again, we're talking about industry progress. Um, there's a piece of our growth that is highly linked to growth in GDP, urbanization, growth in GDP per capita that is, re that is reflective of our economy. But I can promise you, without strong transportation links, whether it's uh, airplane, whether it's rail, whether it's road, train, without transportation links, we can't maintain this. So, you know, infrastructure implies transportation infrastructure as well, and that's what we need for growth. So we have to find a balance between the two. I just wanted to take a minute to say that there may be places where um, we might be behind other countries, but when it comes to you know, sustainability in aviation. I just want all of us to be proud of what India has today. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, and I think the Indian aviation industry is one of eternal optimism. Uh, people keep uh, starting airlines. Those who uh, have not managed to come back to try it again. So that, that actually, I think, in a sense, shows faith in the Indian passenger that the moment there's an opportunity, she will fly. So I think that's, that's interesting as well, definitely part of the bigger story. But uh, uh, I don't think we can talk about a Vixit Bharat without the idea of inclusion. And let me come to you, Ms. Salgaukar, for your views on this. Uh, how does that tie in and how do we ensure that diversity and inclusion is not just something you put in your you know, marketing material and you actually do it? in the boardroom. Thank you, Tamanna. I think as the only woman on the panel, it's appropriate that I would I'm ask here the, as well, the so. diversity <laughs> question. Um, but I do think it's you know something that we have to look at holistically. It can't just be to tick the boxes, you know, just because the government has mandated one woman director on a board, or just because you know you're trying to to uh, look good to you know external investors or your other stakeholders. But I think there really has to be a, a holistic way of thinking about diversity in each of our organizations. And I think CII, as uh, an industry body, and each of our members, the onus really is on us to look at it not just in terms of leadership, not just in terms of you know at the shop floor. Um, but look at you know the gender balances in each of our companies. And I think it has to go beyond just women. How do we look at the whole LGBTQIA community? How do we look at those who are differently abled, uh, you know, physically, mentally? Uh, how do we look at inclusiveness? It can't just be, um, you know, employees from tier one institutions from, you know, sort of uh, urban India. But really, how do we look at uh, Vixit Bharat from the, you know, with the lens of uh, a, true, a true sense of uh, inclusion across the country? Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right. Some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk. Others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. 
We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards, simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. We've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Stock selection isn't. Benchmarks recover after a choppy start. Nifty extends 22,000 levels while Sensex remains buoyant at 72,800 mark. Well, HCL Tech, Infosys and the rest of the IT pack in focus. They're trading with cuts of up to 2% as Accenture slashes FY24 forecasts, growth estimates, dimming hopes of demand recovery. While Accenture's guidance cut a cut sent shock waves through tech sector. Jeffries warns of client budget tightening and sector overvaluation. The highly anticipated Indian Premier League 2024 season begins today at the M. A. Chidambaram Stadium, Chennai. C. S. K. to take on the Royal Challengers, Bangalore. India's top court hearing on Arvind Kejriwal's plea challenging his arrest is underway. This after Delhi CM booked by ED in money laundering case last evening. Good afternoon and welcome. You are watching Market IQ here on NDTV Profit. I am Harsh Saita. With me is Smriti Chaudhary. We're going to take you over the next half an hour on some of the key stocks which are buzzing in trade. But first off, two markets. Let's quickly take stock of where the Nifty is. We're building on uh, yesterday's gains. We're up again today around half a percent higher on the Nifty 50 as we speak. And the day's trade, as you can see, we've built from the bottom up. So we've opened slightly lower. And we've built from there and we've consistently gone up through the day. So it's looking like an increasingly strong day of trade already. Uh, let's quickly pull up uh, what's aiding the Nifty 50 in terms of contributors. And, uh, you know, we have ICICI Bank, ITC, LNT, Maruti, all four of which are uh, pushing indices higher, 100 points up on the Nifty now. And in terms of the losers, no surprises. The IT pack dominating the losers. All four of the top four contributors on uh, the Nifty 50 being all IT. Let's pull up sectoral indices, see uh, the texture of the market in terms of sectors. Uh, there you go, the Nifty IT in focus, but outside of that, you're seeing good traction in auto realty. Realty was up 3% yesterday as well, so 1.5% up today as well. That's another positive. You're seeing good traction on pharma and some of the PSE names as well. But let's pull up the Nifty IT because pretty much all the uh, IT constituents in the decline. You're seeing uh, the leader among that is Wipro in terms of declines and persistent in fee not too far behind. Uh, but outside of that, 
You're also seeing a 1% plus decline on a TCS and LNT tech and emphasis. So it's pretty much secular, whether mid cap or large cap, pretty much all IT stocks in the red. That's where we are seeing it. But some specific stocks in focus as well, Smriti. Yes, definitely. Uh, let's start off with something like a brigade enterprise. Now, this comes, if you can pull up the chart and see where the stock is at. This obviously comes on the back of a Kotak upgrade. It's up uh, over f about 5%. Now, Kotak uh, has upgraded to add. However, the target price remains unchanged at 1,025 rupees. So not a lot of, uh, not a lot has happened in terms of target price because that remains unchanged, but definitely an update and that's probably why we're seeing uh, action in the stock today. The next one that we're talking about is man infra construction. And uh, this stock is budget on the back of acquisition of a project in Mumbai to develop residential property. The stock is up about 2% in trade. Now, the company says that they expect um, to generate 4,000 crores in profit, profit before tax from this project itself. So quite a big number there uh, from man infra constructions and which is uh, uh, and we're seeing that impact in the stock. The next one is uh, Prestige that uh, is also buzzing in trade today. That comes on the about 5.5% up in trade. This is on the back of acquisition of 62.5 acres of land. Acquisition for township project in Delhi NCR and we're seeing that impact. However, the cake, uh, IT takes the cake away today and that is the bu buzzing sector in trade today. Now this comes obviously on the back of extension guidance last uh, night and uh, that sort of impact we're seeing that in if you can pull up the constituents in the nifty IT and see what stocks are being hit by this commentary of Accenture. So all of the stocks in red today, no advances at all in the IT space. Now, just to give you a little brief on what Accenture said, that it, it has lowered its fix, uh, 2024 revenue growth forecast. The company saw a decline of 2% in bookings, and especially there is some stress in smaller deals. Clients are tightening their budgets, and uh, that's that, that's that sort of uh, impact is going to take over in the Indian IT as well. That's what analysts are saying. But uh, we have Agam joining in to tell us the impact of this commentary from Accenture on the Indian IT space. Uh, Agam, tell us more about the impact on the valuation side of the IT index as well. Right, so let me start off with uh, what Accenture has suggested. Like right, right at the top, where we do understand that the company has cut its forecast for uh, fiscal 24 in terms of its revenue growth to around 1 to 2 to 3% from 2 to 5% earlier. Now, the company has seen a decline of as much as 2% in its new bookings, and the company says that they see pressure in volumes for uh, some of your relatively smaller deals. Uh, well, they have seen uh, continued influx as far as your larger deals go, but the revenue accretion is not as fast as what you see in smaller deals. Uh, more importantly, they say that financial uh, you know, services vertical has seen a decline of as much as 6%, and the health and public services, on, on the other hand, has seen a growth in 10%. But clients uh, have seen a restriction in terms of their budget. Uh, discretionary spending has been uh, extremely limiting, and uh, there has been a, a slackness when it comes to the demand scenario. Based on that, we've had a couple of brokerages who have come out with their own read-through on the impact on Indian IT sector. So, uh, well, we have Jefferies, which suggests that Accenture has highlighted a rising constraints in tech budgets, and there has been a slowdown in managed services. And what will also not bode well for the Indian IT space is a rising weakness in uh, the financial services sector. Based on that, they also are negative on Tech Mahindra, CoForge, and TCS. They also mention uh, a thing on the valuations where we understand that the uh, IT valuations stand around 26 times at the moment. That is a Nifty IT index, which is at a 13% premium to its five-year average, and it is also at a 29% premium to its uh, through the, to the Nifty 50. Uh, and that does mean uh, just a little bit of an overvaluation as compared to the rest of the market. Moving on, Nomira also has uh, suggested that that uh, client discretionary spending continues to tighten. Uh, clients continue to prioritize spending 
uh, or not spend and rather optimize their cost going in and uh, well based on that there is a little bit of an opportunity when it comes to cloud adoption and data standardization but uh, they do like coforge billasoft neclux but they have a reduce on something like a tcf wipro and lti mindtree um, what last we spoke, it was more about the quarter, and I said the quarter was better than feared, and I think that's where we are. We, it, it's kind of we're kind of stalling for a couple of quarters where things are not getting worse, but they're not getting better. In order them for them get, to get better, you need to see these bookings convert, and that's the bigger issue here. Um, you're right; we have not seen any large booking announcements um, year to date. Um, but again, you know, the some of the companies will tell you that not, not everything gets released or is announced, and these tend to be pretty lumpy. So, you know, but ironically, even if we see deals announced, they're not converting. <laughs> That's the issue. Um, it's a very unusual situation that I have not seen, you know, throughout the years that I've covered the space. Clients awarding contracts, but they're not converting, and they're telling you to stall until they get a better feel on the macro and, you know, on Fed's cutting rates. Okay, uh, that's all on IT. Uh, tons happening there in that space, but let's quickly move on. Uh, let's pull up something like a Grower and Veal. Uh, that one is uh, up around four and a half odd percent. Uh, you know, they've had a technology transfer agreement with OTMK GmbH. Valid for 10 years, uh, that stock is up and away. It's a stock on the Bombay Stock Exchange, if we can pull that one up, uh, Crower and Veal. Uh, but outside of that, uh, uh, you know, let me also pull up some other ones uh, which are buzzing in trade. Uh, you know, we spoke about some of the real estate counters, but we also have Prince Pipes, again, on uh, the infra side of things, 2.4% higher. We have a Novama note buy call, 737 rupees a share on uh, the stock. And uh, what they're suggesting is that uh, the acquisition should add maybe 100 to 120 crores, uh, uh, which Prince Pipes has made, uh, 100 to 120 crores in terms of top line and 13 to 15% in terms of margins. They've, in fact, reduced their target price from 770 plus to 737, but nonetheless, it still looks like a very, very strong upside from here as well. So that one, also a Shiram Finance, 1.2 odd percent higher in trade today. Um, this has been a consensus buy of sorts. At least that's what Macquarie's note earlier in the week said when they went and interacted with certain investors in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, pretty much a consensus buy is what they are calling uh, Shiram Finance among the investor community. Not that they are ascribing to that view. Uh, today we had another note coming out talking about Shiram Finance, bullish on Shiram Finance, suggesting that uh, there could be a large-ish upside on Shiram Finance. 2750 was the call made uh, on Shiram Finance. Uh, also, let's pull up something like a Torrent Power. Morgan Stanley, not exactly the most bullish on uh, Torrent Power. Uh, 963 is the target price that they've given. Stock, obviously, uh, was off uh, to a weakish start, but has since then done fairly well in trade today. Two projects. One, what Morgan Stanley seems to suggest is there is a downside risk with regard to the investment that they are, or the capex that they are going to make on both these projects with a mid-teens IRR. FY27 EBITDA, they are seeing a 7 to 8% upside uh, on both projects post commissioning. So somewhere they are seeing a bit of an ups upside, but nonetheless, they believe that valuations are already quite stretched. So those are, uh, you know, three, four other counters which are in focus uh, today on the back of both news as well as uh, notes. Indus in Bank, ICICI Security is also very positive on that one. 30 plus percent upside expected from here. 2000 is their target price. They believe that uh, uh, there is quite a few things changing on that one. If I can also pull up Bharat Dynamics, that one is buzzing on the back, back of uh, stock split. 1.7 percent higher on Bharat Dynamics as well. So several of those uh, counters are doing fairly well in trade today, Smriti. Yes, definitely. Just one more stock, which is ABB India. It, uh, it's uh, at, an, at a lifetime high. 
and uh, if you can pull up the chart for that yes it's uh, abb india is what is the stock that we're talking about it's at a lifetime high and it's trading at a uh, uh, 5950 a piece it's up about uh, 1% in trade doesn't seem to have a uh, news flow around it but uh, seems like a recovery in this specific stock but uh, let's uh, Go, uh, go for a quick break for now, but do stay tuned. We'll be back with the latest update on Delhi CM Arvind Kejriwal's arrest last night. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real guys, there are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term, when to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Welcome back. Thanks for staying clued on to Market IQ. Uh, you know, we'll switch focus here. At the CI event, uh, my colleague Tamanna asked ITC's MD Sanjeev Puri about the kinds of rural incomes and how strategic investments can positively impact rural economy. Listen in to what he had to say on that one. If I specifically was to focus on rural incomes, you know, now, rural incomes are in three parts, and each one is nearly equal. One is off-farm incomes. That is indexed to connectivity to urban centers. That is indexed to uh, growth in manufacturing and real estate particularly. That is one. Second is rural wages. And third is farm income. So, so three parts of it. The first is independent. The other two are a little bit connected to agriculture. And as I said earlier, that uh, if we, if we, uh, weather events are, are if, if they do happen, uh, they can cause problem. But there are solutions available. I think I would, I would also compliment the national agencies that have also started to provide this information, some solutions to, to farmers. But the effort and the scale and magnitude of what is happening needs to be multiplied and it needs to be done in a spirit of public-private partnership. Enterprises, government agencies all need to come together. 
And there are successful models. I'll, I'll give you example. Uh, I'll give you our own examples. Several years back, when we started climate smart agriculture, in in 70 percent of the districts we started, all these districts are today classified as high yield and high resilience. GHG emissions there have dropped by as much as 60 percent. Farm incomes have improved by as much as 90 percent. So what is good for the farmer is also good for the planet. Okay. So there are there are solutions available. They may not solve. All, all of the issues, but maybe 60, 70 percent. So we should implement these while we continue to work on developing solutions for the or the pathways for the unsolved problems. So we need to implement that, that at scale in a spirit of public-private partnership. So we'll have to do something about it. The good news is work has started, but I think the journey is, is a long one. Well, big news uh, on the political side of things. New Delhi Chief Minister has moved to the Supreme Court court against uh, a high court order denying him protection against uh, coercive, coercive action in the liquor case. In the latest, AAP ministers Atishi and Saurabh Bhardwaj were detained by the police on Friday morning during the party's protest against Kejriwal's arrest. Sources have now told NETV that Kejriwal has withdrawn a Supreme Court petition against his arrest and, uh, now, uh, and will now approach a lower court. But uh, let's shift focus to something else, which is uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Modi has arrived in Bhutan today for a two-day visit. Bhutanese tea sharing uh, Tobge welcomed Prime Minister at the Paro airport. My colleague Saurabh Gupta from Bhutan has this report. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Bhutan is being looked at very closely given the fact that this is going to be perhaps his last international visit before the elections. And it's significant because Prime Minister Modi, after taking over Prime Minister for the first time in 2014, also chose to visit Bhutan as is as part of his first official foreign tour and therefore there is always that special element in that bhutan india relationship in the bhutan india friendship that the two countries have focused on now there are of course strategic issues boundary issues uh, uh, economic partnerships including uh, the focus on the happiness city of Kelifu, where uh, there are going to be investments there's going to be the development of a new city but the city will of course be a mindfulness city which is a key element of Bhutanese thought and therefore India Bhutan partnership has several layers to it there is of course the strategic part but there is also the economic part and there is going to be a lot of focus on the economic part as well for example India Bhutan uh, you know focus on uh, information ICT is also something that a lot of uh, experts uh, look at from the perspective of Bhutan but there are several other areas of cooperation economic cooperation between India and Bhutan and the Prime Minister of course is going to spend the entire day it's a day of packed engagements he also has an engagement with uh, His Majesty the King of Bhutan and as he arrives there's going to be a grand welcome and also all along the roads of Bhutan and the places that the Prime Minister is, you will see pictures like this. This is, of course, uh, the photographs of His Majesty the King of Bhutan and uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, Honorable Prime Minister of India. And also, uh, the message is very clear, apart from the two flags and the two, uh, you know, uh, respected leaders, you also have the key element in the center of that uh, photo, and it says, uh, Bhutan... Bharat, Maitri, Amar Rahe, or Long Live Bhutan, India Friendship. So that is going to be the focus as Prime Minister Modi arrives in Bhutan. He's going to have a series of discussions, series of, uh, you know, events. And there are going to be, uh, obviously, a lot of, uh, you know, perhaps uh, other elements to that visit. But this is a very, very important visit of the Prime Minister to Bhutan. And, of course, the Bhutanese people always say that the India-Bhutan friendship is special. And that special friendship, the deep bond and connection that India shares with Bhutan will also be seen. And, of course, it's very clear that uh, in the last decade, the India-Bhutan relationship has also made giant strides. And that is something that both these leaders would want it to continue. So, Prime Minister Modi in Bhutan for what is perhaps going to be his last official foreign trip before a new government is sworn in. 
Okay, we'll stick to the north. Switch focus though. Climate activist Sonam Wang Chuk's hunger strike enters day 17. Educational reformist Wang Chuk has been demanding statehood and constitutional safeguards under the sixth schedule for Ladakh. For those not aware, Wang Chuk is the popular Three Idiots character, Fung Suk Wangru, and is based, and that character is based on Sonam. And he is known for his innovative ideas and education reforms in Ladakh. So he is on a fast, and uh, that's what, in terms of visuals, is what you're seeing. Right. Uh, let's uh, get back to the. Here in Mumbai, we're feeling the heat harsh already. And uh, with sweltering summer on the horizon, ice cream chains are gearing up for a busy few months ahead. The demand for frozen treats has already, uh, has already seen an uptick, leading top brands to expand capacity. My colleague Sesha is joining in with more details on this. Ice cream companies are expecting about 25 to 30 percent growth in sales between April and June over the previous year in anticipation of a summer rush. Now, some are expecting a surge in demand already, like Amul MD has told us that they are starting to see an uptick in some pockets. They have invested rupees 1,000 crore towards expansion of its manufacturing cap capacities. Uh, this is through a mix of greenfield facilities as well as enhancement of the existing facilities. Amul is also expanding its fairly new retail format, Ice Lounge, uh, focused entirely on premium ice cream. Uh, they have opened 15 such stores and 10 more are planned during summer. Mother Dairy is saying that, you know, they are betting on stable prices to spur demand. This is unlike the last two years when we have seen that companies were forced to hike prices because of the higher raw material prices. However, this year they, they are seeing a fall in milk procurement prices as well as surplus stocks. Uh, American uh, chain Baskin Robbins, um, they are set to open 1,000 outlets in India. The premium brand expects to outpace market growth this summer. Now, even though the ice cream consumption is fairly low compared with the global average, the market is highly competitive with a very few number of big players and a whole lot of small regional players uh, you know, um, fighting for a market share. The smaller companies rather collectively uh, control in half of the market. Another trend that we are seeing is the emergence of quick commerce channels. Now, these channels are driving in-house uh, consumption for major brands. Uh, however, we are seeing that the traditional companies are under pressure due to the rise of protein rich calorie uh, low calorie ice cream brands. Uh, this include Noto, Go Zero, Get Away, and Brooklyn Creamery. So all in all, uh, high competition is there. Still, companies are gearing for very few busy months ahead. Well, thanks for that, Sessa. It's gotten me hungry, and I'm probably going to call up Sessa and ask her for what's the best ice cream to go have. Uh, but with that, we're completely out of time on this edition of Market IQ. Stay tuned to NDTV Profit. More on the other side from Smithy, myself, where we want to put the show together. Thanks so much for watching. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit.
listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neeraj Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real guys, there are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term? When to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks and small cap stocks. Hi, thanks so much for joining in. You're watching the Mutual Fund Show on NDTV Profit. My name is Alex Matthew. Now, what we normally do on the show is bring you concepts that you can understand in the mutual fund space, and we give you actionable insights so that you can take your investment decisions with confidence. Now, we normally discuss one or two topics, but there's so much happening in the space of late, so we decided to take a number of topics today. Among them, uh, incremental investments in mid cap and small caps. What should you do with them if you get a large amount of money towards the end of the year, as quite a few of us do? For example, if you've got uh, your reimbursements that have piled up over the course of the year, and like me, if you're claiming, uh, it's not efficient, but like me, if you're claiming towards the end of the year, how do you deploy that if you're saving about 40% of it, which is a good practice to have? If you are looking at thematic funds, if you're looking at sectoral funds as a tactical allocation, where should you look? Is an SIP approach the right way to invest in these thematic funds? That's something that we'll discuss today. Uh, overnight, or la rather last evening, there was also an announcement uh, or a message that was sent out to mutual funds about investments of fund of funds into overseas ETFs. Those are going to stop, inflows are going to stop from the 1st of April. If you are planning on investing in some of these schemes, what should you bear in mind if you're looking for a slice in the overseas equity pie? So all of those aspects are what we're going to discuss today. We're joined today by Himanshu Kohli as well as Amol Zoshi. Uh, and thank you so much, gentlemen, for taking the time as always. And pleasure having you on the Mutual Fund Show. I'm going to start with the first conversation, which is, and I know that it's been spoken about quite a bit in the recent past, but we have to talk about it, mid-cap and small-cap investments, but incremental investments. Uh, a lot of people receive money towards the end of the year. How should they deploy it? So the big question I think that, that I'll start with, Himanshu, is um, what are you advising your clients to do at this juncture when they're talking about their incremental investments? So, Alex, uh, as we all know, mid-cap and small-cap have had a good run in last 12 to 24 months. In fact, today when we see the valuation of this, it is almost two standard deviation above what it should be as a ratio to the large cap. So last uh, a few months have actually taken the valuation up. And today, a lot of people, they are seeing the recency bias of mid and small cap, and they are moving towards it. While our advice is actually contrarian, and we are saying, uh, don't put any fresh money into mid and small cap. In fact, uh, if you are overexposed, sell it and move it to either asset allocation funds or maybe towards a large cap, but uh, don't put any fresh inflows into mid and small cap funds. So the fresh money we are recommending to go into uh, asset allocation funds. 
which have a huge advantages because they can actually protect you while there is a downside which is happening. And when the upswing happens, you can also get the uh, positives of that upswing. And also the fund manager has the flexibility to move the equity portion uh, to a more large cap companies over there. So this is something which we feel is best at this point in time, uh, in case you have any scope for growth in your portfolio. At this point in time, prefer for a conservative growth, which is coming through asset allocation funds. Uh, before I go to Amol with the same question, I want to elucidate that point that you made on standard deviations just a tad bit. You had, in fact, sent us a couple of charts and I would request my producer to put them on the screen. Uh, for those that are not statisticians and those that don't understand standard deviation, why is this significant, Himanshu? Because standard deviation, uh, uh, Alex, is a measure of risk, volatility. So higher the volatility, the higher the risk. So if you see today, they are trading at a huge uh, premium compared to a large cap. I do not know if you can just put up the graph over there. I'll be able to explain it through that graph. Uh, so it really, is, I don't uh, have it, Himanshu, so we'll have to just explain it with the numbers. Okay, so today there is a higher volatility which is attached with mid and small cap funds. And uh, since there is a higher risk premium which we are uh, paying for it, uh, it's better not to consume it. It's something like this, so let's say if your cup of coffee cost me 100 bucks, uh, but all of a sudden the price goes up to 150 because of huge demand which has come up. Maybe I, rather than having two cups, I will restrict it to one cup or reduce the consumption. Same is the case with mid and small cap. Today, the price earning ratio of this has actually become very expensive. So I'm paying a higher price to consume a mid cap or a small cap uh, stock. So I should consume, ideally consume it less. That is something which is uh, this model actually talks about. So if you see this blue line, that's the ratio between a large cap and a small cap, historically. That's the historical ratio. So today, if you see this yellow line, it is actually at the two levels above this, which is the higher standard deviation, which is what we are paying. And if you see historically also, there are three or four instances when it has touched uh, one or two standard deviations. And uh, if you would have bought it at that point in time, there's a huge downside which happens immediately after that. So this is the period uh, uh, which is, uh, uh, Caution is advocated and that's essentially what yeah. you've pointed out. Amul, do you have a similar view? And incidentally, uh, this morning I was looking at a notification from the largest small cap actively managed scheme, Nippon, which has put further restrictions on inflows. They've said now 50,000 rupees incrementally for fresh applications of SIPs and STPs is the limit per day per pan. And they've also said that the exit load of 1% is now applicable if you sell units within one year, which is quite significant. Uh, right, hi, uh, Alex, good afternoon. Thanks for having me over on the show. Uh, so to answer the first question, yes, my view would be uh, similar because there is no arguing with valuations. Uh, it's a no-brainer actually that if you buy any asset at an inflated or at a premium sort of a valuation, uh, you will make money only when valuations further improve or earnings improve drastically. Now, if you are a believer in any of these two, and it is, uh, it looks difficult, it's not to say that uh, this segment, mid and small caps, will really crash from here, but uh, do not go or enter uh, in mid and small caps with the kind of returns expectation that you have seen over last three years, CAGR, or even for last one year. Uh, something very important, Alex, in your question, I liked uh, what you have asked me. Uh, you are speaking about incremental flows. Now, incremental flows simply means that you already have an existing asset allocation or rather existing as allocation towards mid and small caps. Incremental flows always should be decided upon the factors like uh, what's the kind of asset allocation that you started with and with the great run-up that we have seen overall into equities as well as mid and small caps, if there is a place to tweak that allocation. If there is, if the mid and small cap exposure is beyond what your asset allocation permits you, then obviously incremental flows should not go uh, into the mid and small cap segments. Not Last but not the least, uh, additional point over here is you should not decide your investments based on the recent news flow. Uh, 
or the narrative. Why we are talking about it is regulatory entities have been highlighting about the froth, so to speak, in mid and small caps, and the funds uh, have responded by uh, 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 giving out some restrictions in terms of exit load and in terms of the uh, restriction of flesh inflows or placing some limits. Mm. This is a part of a news flow. News flow should not decide your investment strategy. What should decide your investment strategy? It is your investment horizon. It is your risk appetite and your asset allocation. Okay, so speaking of risk appetite, that takes me to the next aspect, right? So we've spoken about incremental flows and both of you have said that you need to be a little bit cautious. That's uh, the sum and substance of what you've said so far. Uh, but what about if you've gone a little overboard and there are quite a few people that have piled into both small caps and mid caps and particularly small caps. If you just look at the flows, you're talking about over 40,000 crore over the last one year and most of those are retail investments, right? So, Himanshu, the question to you is how do you identify how much risk you currently have in your, uh, in your portfolio? Because I've had a few conversations over the past few weeks with individuals uh, and I've asked a simple question, are you comfortable with the market for or your portfolio falling 50% tomorrow? And the answer was a very vociferous, no, absolutely not. So, so how do you understand if you've got too much risk in your portfolio? So, uh, Alex, there are two R's. One is the return aspect, second is the risk aspect. So risk profiling is extremely, extremely important for any investor. Let's say we talk about a mod moderate profile who has a 50% growth portfolio, which is, let's say, equity side, and 50%, which is a more preservation portfolio, which is fixed income side. Today, if we see this, most of the clients, they are higher than 50% because last 12 months, equities have done better. So one logic which will come on the basis of risk profile is fresh inflows which are coming in, I will not add more towards equities. Rather, I will move more towards fixed income so that I can rebalance the portfolio to 50-50. There is also, this is all called as rebalancing, but there is a concept called as reallocation, which is nothing but saying if something is expensive, consume it less. So today, our model, which is basis, the price earning, the yield gap, price to book, market cap to GDP, on this four parameters, we arrive at what should be the strategic asset allocation. So today, against 50%, our model is saying we should be somewhere about 43%. So maybe fresh inflows will go more towards fixed income or other asset classes and less towards equities, or maybe I need to sell some equities. And within equities also, let's say for historically, or our base allocation towards mid and small cap is 25%. Today, our model is saying we need to be 15% over there. So if I have to do some profit booking, I should do it from the mid and small cap. If I have to add something more towards equities, I should add it towards a large cap side. Or if some fresh inflows are coming, I should build up my fixed income portfolio. So that's the concept which we follow. And uh, it's very, very important in the short run, this risk profiling will go against you because today, let's say if someone does it and markets still see some run-up happening you may feel that you are missing out but over a complete cycle you will see the advantage of this whole strategy there is a concept called as process alpha which can be created by doing this dynamic asset allocation within each asset class also not only at the broader asset class level but even in the asset class across large cap multi cap and mid caps one can actually apply this uh, pure mathematical tool, which is as boring as possible, but it creates an alpha and most importantly, it reduces the risk which we measure in terms of standard deviation. Okay, so to add to that then, uh, Amol, we're talking about a situation where people have to book profits and the FOMO aspect, which we've spoken about in respect to so many investments over the past three years, uh, whether at one point of time during the COVID pandemic, it was Bitcoin, which has come back over the last few months as it has hit fresh record highs and uh, you know people have said have i missed the bus and therefore where do i buy bitcoin i don't think that that answer go or that 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 problem goes anywhere so how do you identify and fix problems in your portfolio as of now do you suggest as himanshu has suggested moving incrementally more towards fixed income we're talking about aggressive hybrid and hybrid in just a bit but how do you cre cre correct problems in your portfolio right now 
uh right there are two three ways of correcting the problem the top of the mind uh, you can say that see you always start investing with certain assumptions you are in uh, in your mind those assumptions are related to what would be your future expenses uh, what would be the inflation what would be your investment uh beat via sips or beat via uh, lump sum going into next 5 years 10 years similarly there is one more assumption related to the kind of returns that you expect from the market now if the market has front run uh, a large distance and you have got maybe two or three years return or a six years return in four year time frame that's one good aspect or that's one very good indicator that will tell you that you should be able to book the profits but i also want to go to the heart of your question you have asked how do you determine if you have too much risk in your equity mf portfolios if you are exposed there is again a simple thumb rule for this if you are exposed to more than 60% 60 80 100% going into any one segment be it only mid caps be it only small caps be it only thematic now this is the time when you have been hearing a lot about you know a particular theme be it it few months back or or maybe a year year and half back it was about the international investments if you are exposed to any one theme or any one corner of the market for more than 60 or 80% of your portfolio that's again another very good thumb rule to that tells you that you are taking too much risk last but not the least uh, alex uh, now i agree with all your uh, friends who said who told you absolutely not i'm not comfortable with 50% loss or downside in my portfolio uh, i don't know a single person who says that i'm okay <laughs> or i'm looking forward to 50% sort of a correction in my portfolio and that's why uh booking uh, a realignment of your portfolio in line with your asset allocation this is what it will automatically book profits from your equity obviously today i will talk about equity because equity markets have given uh, anywhere between 20 to 35 40 percent sort of a cagr over last three years so essentially when you do the asset allocation goal based rebalancing you will go out of equity and to more uh, conservative to moderate asset classes like pure fixed income or even equity hybrid or balanced advantage Fair funds point. and we're talking about this in a, a little more detail a couple more topics also to discuss we have to slip into a very quick break though gentlemen do stay with us and viewers we'll be back before you know it do stay tuned Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies, but when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing: profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards, simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. We've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money. There are different types of stocks: large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Stock selection isn't an easy task, and neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. You have a missed call. 
let's be real guys there are many financial experts out there which stocks to target what's good for long term when to buy when to sell how do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams you can accomplish all your financial dreams let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the portfolio manager Welcome back. You're watching the Mutual Fund Show and we've already dealt with quite a few topics. Now, let's continue to talk about what you should do with your incremental investments. And right at the start of the conversation, Himanshu suggested that perhaps you can look at hybrid strategies uh, going forward and perhaps you should be a little cautious when it comes to your investments into mid and small cap funds. Let's find out what he thinks about aggressive hybrids as a strategy or whether you should go towards the dynamic asset allocation route. Himanshu, what's the view here? Can it form a substantial portion of an individual's portfolio? What are the factors to bear in mind? So first of all, Alex, uh, hybrid is uh, a product or aggressive as uh, balanced funds are a product for uh, moderate profile investors and who also have a three to five years kind of a time horizon. So it's a product which is very suitable for them. In fact, it's a very, very efficient product because what it does is it keeps on rebalancing the portfolio. So if the markets run up the way they have run up in the recent past, they'll book some profits and move into more of debt. And similarly, if the, there is a beer turn which comes and the market falls, they will move, use that cash or fixed income, sell that and buy equities. Now, a lot of investors, they say, why do we need a fund manager to do this? We can do it on our own. But I think that's the greatest myth. Even HNIs or UHNIs, in spite of having the best of advisors, sometimes they are not able to do this either because of inertia or because of emotions which comes into picture. And sometimes there are realistic issues around taxation, exit loads. So these are basically various debt trades. While in an aggressive hybrid fund, if the fund manager sells it, uh, there is no exit load, there is no taxation which they have to pay because mutual funds enjoy the uh, tax benefit over there. So I feel any client's portfolio, a part of your growth portfolio can be through hybrid funds. They could be categorized further into uh, aggressive hybrid or asset allocation funds. And in today's scenario, when we are seeing an overvaluation in the market, maybe an underconsumption of pure equity funds and an overconsumption of asset allocation or aggressive hybrid funds is something which we recommend to our set of clients. Quick follow-up, uh, and this is not asking you for a recommendation, but which particular fund houses have you liked in the past when it comes to these hybrid options? So I would say one needs to create a model portfolio. But uh, someone who has been very consistent in this space is ICICA Prudential. They have been a part of our model portfolio for quite some time. Uh, last five years, we have seen that. They have maintained that consistency in managing this uh, aggressive hybrid or asset allocation funds. So we really uh, like that fund house a lot in this space. Uh, now, I, I did really want to talk about thematic because it's, uh, uh, you know, it's always a flavor. Uh, to talk about and it is one of the largest categories that uh, currently exists in the equity category. Amol, uh, the question is how do you choose because you have to be right both when you enter and when you exit because sometimes a sector can fall out of favor very, very quickly and you're left with a bit of a concentration risk in that particular sector if you have too much of it. Uh, but at the same time, it can pay off really well. Uh, how do you choose one right now? And is an SIP approach the right way to invest in these schemes? 
Uh, well, Alex, uh, I'm afraid I have to, uh, you know, my views have not changed since the time we spoke last and maybe several uh, several other iterations of programs over all these years. Uh, first and foremost, uh, what you have asked is whether this is the right time to choose a theme. My answer is, and we are talking about, we are on the MF corner, we are on the MF show. Uh, we are talking about a lay investor investing into mutual funds and that investor has come to mutual funds because that investor cannot pick and choose stocks, cannot do the timing or doesn't want to do. You know, even if you are skilled enough to do it, you don't want to do it because of certain regulations that your job might have, uh, restrictions that your job might have, or you simply do not have time for it. Now, for such an investor, my, uh, my stance is still the same. If you have to ask about a theme, then you should not invest in a theme. Right. So that's what we have discussed earlier in the past, uh, earlier as well. Uh, second point is about uh, whether uh, via SIP is the right way to invest into theme or a sector. I would say, see how, and you have also touched upon it, uh, a, a sector or a theme is particularly sensitive to various various dynamics or macro factors. Those could be government regulations, those could be technological disruptions, those could be innovations taking place in various segments of that market. Now, I would say is if you want to choose, pick and choose a theme and invest, instead of SIPs, do it via lump sum. Why? Because SIP, to have a meaningful allocation, you will take a lot of time, maybe six months, maybe one, one and a half, two years, to get a meaningful allocation into a particular theme. And by that time, the theme would have played out the way you are expecting. So I would say lump sum is probably the better way to go with it. But always remember, if you have to ask about thematic, then you should not invest into a thematic. Uh, a diversified fund, if you think that manufacturing theme will do well, just as an example, uh, if that is the case, and if fund manager's view is aligned with your view, then a particular diversified scheme can buy uh, stocks from the manufacturing theme or from any uh, other theme for that matter. Fair point. Uh, the last topic that I want to discuss today is a, a development from yesterday, Himanshu, and that has to do with fund of funds investing in overseas ETFs, which have hit, according to Amfi, 95% of uh, the limit that has been prescribed by the Reserve Bank of India. That further limits what investors can put money in when it comes to grabbing a slice of overseas equities. So what are the options available right now, according to you, and should they continue to invest in these uh, assets? You're talking about a NASDAQ that continues to uh, test new highs every day. Right. So again, over there, like today, a lot of people are saying, I am a great believer of India, but I also want to manage my risk, which means all my eggs into India is not the best of strategies. So for that, international investments becomes extremely important. For retail investors, this feeder funds actually was making a lot of sense. But now this limit has been uh, uh, achieved. Maybe everyone will wait for the uh, government agencies or the regulators to enhance this limit and then they can start systematically building it up over there. Again over there, as you mentioned, markets have run up. If tomorrow the limit gets enhanced, one should go and systematically build up the portfolio over there rather than doing lump sum purchases. But for HNIs or UHNIs, there are other options which are available. Let's say under LRS, one can actually do USD $50,000 per annum. So a uh, new financial year is coming up. New limits will also open up for each and every HNI. So they can actually look at those vehicles to build their overseas portfolio. And over there also, I would say if someone has to build up an equity portfolio, do systematically, but our recommendation in our uh, model portfolio for international, it's a very, very broad diversified portfolio which we have created across multiple asset classes, multiple geographies, right. and right. across active and passive strategies. Then there is also another interesting route which is evolving and practically everyone is talking about it. Hmm. Very few have implemented it. It's the gift city route. Right. Which is also opened up. So a lot of family offices are thinking of creating an entity and looking at hmm. parking a part of that, like 50% of that is allowed to be invested in the international markets. I'm sure as uh, things evolve, there will be far more options or sophisticated options which will be available over yes. there. So, so and we, 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 we'll vehicles. talk about, yeah, yeah, and I think you spelled it out quite well, Himanshu, and we'll talk about that. I think it warrants a separate show to talk about the various options available and what will develop there. But thank you so much, both of you, for taking the time and for speaking to us on the Mutual Fund Show. And to you, viewer, hopefully the various topics that we've had on this particular program have benefited you. If you've got questions for us, you can send them to us on the WhatsApp number on your screen. And meanwhile, do stay tuned. Lots more coming up on NDTV Profit.
Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real, guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target? What's good for long term? When to buy? When to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Welcome back to NDTV Profit. You're watching Large Trades, a show where we talk about all kinds of bulk and block deals, buzzing stocks on the back of large volumes. But before we head on to the show, let's have a quick market check. The benchmarks are in the green. The Nifty 50 is up about 0.4%. Um, and when we look at the um, contributors, um, we have the auto pack um, with Hero Motor um, and Maruti Suzuki leading the gains. We also have a UPL all up about 3.5%. And the Nifty Auto Index has been buzzing in trade currently. Um, and when you see what's dragging, it is the um, IT pack. And this was mainly after Accenture's revised outlook, which anticipated lower growth than previously um, projected. And when we look at the benchmarks um, to the likes of the mid-cap, let's pull up the mid-cap chart right there. Um, they are outperforming currently. Um, with um, the likes of All Cargo Logistics, which is up in trade um, on the back of volumes. We also have something like a CAMS, which has been buzzing on trade for the past few days. It's currently received an approval to start um, operation at its new facility in the gift city. And when you look at something that's been dragging the benchmark a little bit, it's the Tata Investment, which has again hit an lower circuit of 5% after Tata Sun's IPO was called off. And if we look at the small cap 250 index, um, it's up right now. Um, we also have um, Prestige, uh, which is in focus. Um, it's up in trade after a 62.5 acre land acquisition. And it's one of the stocks that's been, you know, taped taking the Nifty Realty higher. We're now moving on to the stocks that we do have in focus in the show today. We have Lakshmi Organics, which is our first large trade in focus. Now, the stock is buzzing in today's session on the back of high volumes. And let's bring in my colleague Varsha with more details. 
Hi Mika, so as you rightly said, so stock is up almost over 7%. This is on the back of volumes which are trading over 24x is 30 day average. Uh, now this is a specialty chemical industry. So if you see the Q3 FY24 revenue uh, grew at mid single digit with lack of demand from end segments such as packing. Then in pharma segment also export market continued to be weaker. Also in agrochemical segment inventory was being reduced and export sales were impacted due to the Red Sea crisis. Uh, now, but the good thing about this company is if you see uh, they do have strong pipeline of 11 products which are in pilot and capex approval stage uh, almost more than 20 percent of revenue comes from a uh, new products and specialties and they are recently doing a capex of almost 710 crore in the H facility which will uh, produce more of specialty chemicals and the revenue from that facility is expected to be around 1700 crore but uh, this company do have risk so if you see almost all molecules that Lakshmi organic mix by using ketin and decating these are the products that they use to manufacture value-added products uh, these products doesn't have intrinsic advantage when it comes to comparison with their competition now Chinese companies have been manufacturing this molecules since long and Indian companies are also joining the competition maybe this this one so this is the reason if you see the stock performance uh, in last one year the stock is down almost three percent and in last six months the stock is down almost 14 percent thank you so much Arsha. it's not only some a chemical company like lakshmi organics we also have kempla sanmar which is you know it's gained um, off its highs today but it's up on the back of large volumes but moving on i want to talk about a company that is engaged in the production of steel coal and ferroalloys and this is sarda energy and minerals now the stock is up intraday 15.34 percent and it's around the same gains right now up about 13 percent volumes over 18 times its 30 day average with total volumes at 53.74 lakh equity shares where sellers were almost twice the buyers now this was on the back of the latest news that their joint venture subsidiary called natural resources energy um, which the company has 51 percent economic interest in has received a letter of intent now this letter of intent was awarded for a composite license from the industry energy labor and mining development um, department um, of the government of maharashtra maharashtra and now with this license they have have um, rights to start mining um, uh, the Sujargad one iron ore block in Maharashtra and this is the license is for an area of 1,526 1, uh, hectares and the company has also recently incorporated a new joint venture subsidiary um, called uh, Bartunga Coal. Now the share in uh, the company's share in the JV is at 67 percent and it's the company is incorporated as a special purpose vehicle. They're going to carry out um, things like reopening, salvaging and developing the Bartunga Hill Coal Mine and the cost of acquisition was 6.7 lakh rupees. In terms of when you look at the company's growth strategy, um, backward inter integration and diversification to re re reduce the cyclicity of the um, business, but they're also going to expand capacity. Um, they have planned expansion of their iron ore pellets production. Um, the railway siding and the loading infrastructure um, expansion at their coal mines is also going to be carried out for cost-effective movement. And lastly, they're constructing a 25 megawatt hydro project and the progress of this project is currently ahead of schedule, which is good for the company. But moving on, we have a counter called Shanti Gears, which is another stock that is buzzing in trade today. The stock has driven gains up to 11%, little down from those gains, it's up 7% right now. And we have Puneet joining us to tell us more about the company. Yeah, thanks, Mika. And as you rightly said, the, the stock is up 11%, and uh, the volumes have been at 11 times its 30 day average, currently trading at roughly 7% uh, after coming down from its intraday highs. Now, do know that this is Shanti Gears is a maker of gearboxes and, and is part of the Murugappa group. Now, for quarter three, the results uh, for revenue, the company had an 8% growth uh, over the last year, but for EBITDA and uh, PAT, the levels were uh, absolutely flat. Now, the key highlights about the company company is that you know they have doubled their revenues from the March 21 levels to March 23 this year for these three quarters growth has been good as well uh, now FY23 is the first year where they have operating positive cash flow 
which is very very key for the company to be profitable and has had returns on capital which is upwards of 30% for the company. Now finally the promoters own 70% stake and they also recently uh, uh, if, uh, during the uh, third quarter they appoint, reappointed their uh, CEO for the next five years as well. Also approved a dividend of 3 rupees per share. Now, uh, for the f nine months, the company has had 75% growth in its free cash flow, and that's where we see the return on capitals have been good as well. Finally, on the order books, they booked 142 crores of orders during the Q3, and over the nine months, the order book is up 37%. Back to you. Thank you so much, Pani, for those details. And moving on to our final buzzing stock, we have Amber Enterprises. Now, the stock has surged in today's trade on the back of a recent acquisition of ResoJet. My colleague Mahima joins us for more details. Right, Mahika. So, as you rightly mentioned, the stock is buzzing in trade today. Well, it touched an intraday high of around 5.95% and the volumes are around 5.7 times its 30-day average. Uh, the support levels are at around 3,129 and the resistance levels around 5, uh, 4,500. Now, uh, two triggers that uh, because of which the stock is buzzing in trade today. The first one is that its recent acquisition of a 50% take stake in ResoJet for 35 crores. Now, ResoJet is a J with um, LCGC Resolute Appliance. They, they are basically into manufacturing of washing machine and components. And the, stregger, and the second uh, trigger why the stock is buzzing in trade today is because CLSA has um, uh, maintained its buy rating for Amber with a target price of 4,100, which is a 19% upside um, as, as of its closing price yesterday. Now, uh, recent con call highlights suggest, highlights suggest that uh, they've shifted from supplying components to room uh, air conditioner and they're diversifying uh, supplying components to telecom smart meters and automobiles now they've also the companies also provide their guidance uh, for the coming future where they anticipate improvement in margins and ROC in the coming years they've said that forecasting a decrease in proportion of revenue in uh, room air conditioners and they're expecting growth in bottom line uh, absorption of interest cost and uh, improved asset turnover in the coming year so uh, the future of amber does look very strong and that is why uh, CLSA uh, has also had a bullish stance on this particular stock. Thank you so much, Mehima, for those details. Now, next, speaking at the sidelines of the Confederation of Indian Industries Western Regional Annual Meeting, my colleague Vikas asked ITC's MD Sanjeev Puri about the company's plan for sustainability and uh, broader goals. Here's what he had to say. As far as industry is concerned, I think uh, uh, we're, we're in a good uh, position right now because we have a lot of proactive policy interventions that have happened by the government at the, at the center. I think the open access policy, for example, that came recently, the green credit system, the, the whole idea about life, which is about sustainable consumption to, to support the transition. So as enterprises, I think the, what we need to embrace is green infrastructure, buildings, energy, transportation. We need to embrace nature-based solutions. Uh, we, we need to deal with the issue of water, the issue of biodiversity, the issue of forestation. So it has to be through a spirit of public-private partnership and enterprises need to do it as in their eco ecosystem. Right? And and the last thing is also, uh, particularly, you know, companies in the agri-value chain also need to work on the agri-value chain to build resilience in the agri-value chain. So really it's about the hard green infrastructure, it's around nature, it's around agri. And the fourth point, it's also about adopting the principles of life. Right. In, as individuals, as citizens, and also as enterprises. So, uh, since ITC is one of the major companies of the country, I think the role of these companies is also equally important. So if you can talk briefly about, you know, what are the steps that the company has taken? So, you know, for us, it has been a journey that has spanned over two and a half decades. And today we are the only company in the world of our size, which is carbon positive, water positive, solid waste recycling positive for 18, 21 and 61 years in a row. And we have been working in many of these areas, right from energy transition, uh, green buildings, the, the world's first 12 hotels which are lead, uh, lead certified net zero hotels are all ITC hotels. The world's first three 
net zero water hotels are also ITC hotels. All hotels of ITC have emissions less than what is the target for, as, as per the private uh, Paris 2030 uh, climate agreement. It's now time to slip into a short break, but do stay tuned. We have a special conversation with Patel Engineering lined up for you while we speak about the Indian hydropower sector. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNO. Thanks for tuning into this conversation. We're trying to talk to companies which are going to play a prominent part with, in order to enable um, the country to attain its lofty goals on the power side and the renewable side. So we've spoken to a clutch of wind energy players in the past. The hydro is coming out as a big emerging segment with very tall targets. And one of the prominent players in the civil engineering construction segment on the hydro side and also on the tunneling side, but also on the hydro side, hydropower side, is Patel Engineering. Uh, they command a dominant market share within that bucket. And um, it's a pleasure to have in Rupin Patel to try and talk about what's happening in the business currently. Mr. Patel, good having you. Thanks for joining in. Um, give us a sense of how is order flows looking like for both or all the three aspects of the business currently and uh, and uh, and what is I mean are there execution challenges currently or do you reckon that uh, you will be able to uh, continue the kind of run that you've shown on the execution side in the last three quarters into the future? See, what is happening, I'll first address it one by one. As far as the order inflows are concerned, they will still be strong. When you look at the industry, just like the solar side, uh, what the government is aiming at is setting up 48,000 megawatts of hydropower in the next five to seven years. And that is on the execution side. Plus 30,000 megawatts of pump storage projects. If you actually translate it into rupees, it is equal to about five lakh crores of work to be awarded in the next five years. So yes, you will see the order book growing rapidly for the companies in this sector. In terms of execution, I don't foresee any challenges. You will actually see the order book increasing and it's being translated into revenue. So yes, the growth will stay. And I have never seen this kind of emphasis by the government in the hydropower sector. Um you, you've you been present in construction, various heavy civil engineering works, right, in the past. Dams, bridges, tunnels, piling works, industrial structures. Uh, what would the current order book split and the revenue split be for Patel? And since you've started off talking about hydro and the emphasis the government is laying there, how, how do you think this will shift over the course of the next 12 to 24 months? See, right now our order book is about 60% hydro, 10% tunneling and about 20% would be irrigation works. What you see is the emphasis on hydro. So you will shift your order book more towards hydro. I would see in the foreseeing future, the hydro going up from 60 to 70 to 75%. Um, and the corresponding margins will expand too, because hydro is actually the more profitable sector. Uh, with a bid loss from up to 14%, 14 to 15%. So that is what you will see Patel go out in the future and do. 
Okay. So hydro order book is high. Your execution in hydro would be higher. You will give a preference there as well by virtue of the order flows, which will enable you to clock in not just the revenue growth, but the margin growth as well. Would that be a fair assessment? Yes, that would be a correct assessment. Okay. Now just give us a sense of the opportunity size. I mean, having a, a target of four and a half, five lakh crores of order books that the government will give out in total to the sector is one thing. Um, what is uh, what is the kind of order booking or order backlog that a company like yours or some of the others can bag part one and which is executable within the timelines that are being given uh, because that becomes the other clear aspect right because in the past as well infrastructure companies at times in the past between 2003 to 2008 as well didn't probably have the dearth of order booking but execution had become a challenge. I don't think in hydro, traditionally, the issues that have been with hydro, be it land acquisition, be it environmental clearance, we saw in the past that uh, projects were stuck because of this. Now, all this has been cleared out by, the, by Modi Saab, my Honorable Prime Minister. What he has done, the change he has brought out, is that the works can only be bidded once all the land is acquired and the environmental clearances and projected affected people are dealt. So you will not see work stop because of these reasons. Bulk of these projects are being executed by central PSU, so I don't see issues with funding. In terms of working capital uh, requirements, I think the power sector, uh, the power minister has been very, very careful to ensure that how this is achieved. He has started various policies like the independent engineer, CII, so that people do not have to go for arbitration and the working capital cycle will improve. So for all the companies in the sector, in the hydro sector, you will see the working capital cycle improve, and you will see the order books expand. So I don't see any issue in execution, provided the company has the capability to execute the projects. Mm. Right now, there are about five players in the sector, traditionally. So I will see all of them, the order books will expand. Okay. Um, so one is the execution capability in terms of technical know-how, the other is the balance sheet ability to do that. Now, you've, you've come out from maybe a past stressful period, but you improved quite a bit. But I also read uh, that, uh, and, and my research analyst told me this as well, that in some, uh, you, you uh, there is some, um, if I'm not wrong, some bit of uh, debt uh, changes that you have to do. You were looking to sell some land parcels in order to reduce debt. There was some debt or some uh, monies that were kept with banks which had to be converted as well. Can you give us a sense of the balance sheet currently as it stands? Uh, and is there any kind of restructuring exercise that is going on? Would you need to raise any additional capital in order to execute the kind of works that you're wanting to do? And then I'll come to the targets, of course. No, sir. We, uh, yeah, we were in financial stress about five, six years ago. We restructured. We have been consistently reducing our debt. We have been reducing our debt by selling non core assets that is land and or from money received from arbitration awards and NITI. The plan, every year we have been reducing debt, even last year we reduced debt, debt by around 300 crores. The next two years also we plan to reduce debt by around 300 crores by selling non-core assets and by reverse Vishwa schemes which are opened by the government because we have about over a thousand crores of arbitration awards won, which will be converted uh, into cash to reverse Vishwas. Part of it to reverse Vishwas, part of them are in Supreme Court at various levels. So you will see the order the debt levels of the company go down. Right now, there is no restructuring going on in Patel Engineering uh, per se. The monies that we will, uh, recently we have buying huge orders. We have been leveraging our know-how, tying up with companies in joint venture who have larger balance sheets so that we can execute larger projects. So right now, there is no restructuring exercise going on. We finished that long ago. The capital which we raise, which we are planning to raise in the next few months, will be used for further expansion. As the working capital will go up, as turnover goes up, we will require working capital for both equipment and, equipment and mobilization. So this is what we will be doing. So the money that we are going to collect is not going to be used for restructuring. Okay, and and is there is there some monies or some assets lying with banks which need to be paid for, or the money converts the debt with banks getting converted into equity or any of that sort? Maybe it was a past exercise. Has it gotten completed? Can you yes, is that, that? Is that yeah? See, what we did is what we did a SDR, wherein the promoters control approximately 50 percent, the banks took control of about fifty one percent, 
the promoter thereafter a wide right issue increased his stake. Uh, my stake right now is close to 40%. Um, and there is no other conversion by the banks that I foresee or which is planned right now. Okay. And the banks today control about only 5% of the equity, approximately. Okay. Okay. Fair call. Um, now, um, just want to understand the numbers. Your, as of September 23, um, you had an order book of 20,000 crores. Your TTM yes. revenues are close to four, four and a half, give or take a few here and there. Excuse me for yes, not knowing yes. the exact number. Now, and you spoke about an overall opportunity size of four to five lakh crores. And you apparently, from what our research tells us, have about a 40 to 45% current market share, traditional market share of 25% in the hydro segment. So now yeah, put yeah, this right. together for us. You have hydro and you're going to bag orders there. You have the other businesses as well, which might be 20, 25%, but still be there. Uh, what could potentially the order book, based on your balance sheet and your capability be, let's say 12 months or 18 months from now, and what is the kind of revenue run rate, Mr. Patel, that, I, that you are targeting over the course of the next 12 to 24 to 36 months? See, if you look at the order book conversion ratio, the order book conversion ratio has been four to 4.5, um, so the order book divided by 4, 4 to 4.5 is the revenue, give or take a couple of hundred crores here and there. That has been traditionally there. Huh. So today when you look at Patel Engineering, Patel can, if it doesn't take any orders, can consistently maintain the revenue of about 5,000 crores for the next three, four years. Now coming to growth, <clears throat> we see our order book, in fact, we are as people and as systems within the company, we are geared up to take our order book to 30 to 35,000 crores in the next 12 months. So what we're internally targeting is a minimum of 30,000 crores in the next uh, 12 months in terms of order book. And this we are completely geared to do in terms of people and systems. And uh, if we divide it by, that would be the revenue growth in the coming years. Okay. So you anticipate that your revenue numbers could move up from circa four, four and a half thousand crores to maybe even 6,000 crores um, yes, by, see that. say, in FY25? Yes, you will see a growth. Something like that. And does so that as the orders come in, uh -huh. as the orders come in, they'll be converted. So you do mobilization for say six months, and then you'll start converting it, translating it to Okay, so which means that about about five and a half to six thousand crores of possibility yes. of revenue target yes, by five twenty five. Yeah, that should be a minimum. And and do yeah. you sorry one more question? Do you anticipate that as revenues move up and your ability to hire improves, you would target even higher revenues uh, by FY26, 27, because as you said, the opportunity size is very large. Yes, you will see Patel now take on larger contracts. The other size of the contract was in Hydro was about 1,000 crores. Now, what is, we have moved up to 3,000 crores. You will largely see Patel take uh, contracts worth about four, 5,000 single contracts. So revenue will move up very sharply in the next, uh, next two years, two years. Okay. Because considering the opportunity out there and our experience and the players in the field, yes, you will see that. Okay. Um, one last question, Mr. Patel, and which is yes. that one is revenue run rate, two is what happens to ratios, what's happened. You have spoken about EBITDA margins being higher, so I'm guessing operational metrics would be higher in FY25 and 26 versus what they are right now. What does it do to return ratios? What does it do to uh, debt levels? What does it do to earnings growth? If you look at Patel traditionally over the last five years, you will see Patel's numbers have been consistently improving in terms of revenue. Uh, the interest rate has been going down, the debt has been going down, and the working cycle, uh, working capital cycle has been improved. This year also, if we consider that we are not going to take any orders, let us assume hypothetically, Patel does not take any orders. Uh, Patel's rating is expected to go up. That will add to savings and interest rate, and the bottom line will improve. If Patel does nothing, the bottom line will still improve. As Patel takes in more orders, obviously the uh, economies of scale will pump in. We are we have already announced that we are consistently reducing debt, and we plan to reduce debt over the next three next two years to up to three or three hundred crores. We do not intend to take on more debt. Our plan is to bring down debt to about approximately uh, twelve hundred to fifteen hundred crores over the next three years. So you will see a saving in that. So automatically. Due to uh, what the Honorable Minister of Power has done, Mr. Singh has done, the working capital cycle is improved. So, borrowing should not be required at all. And um, 
all the issues at site are settled by the independent engineer and you get paid for that. So I will see the numbers overall improving and the ratios of return on capital, profitability, and working capital cycle all go well. All right. Well, we wish you all the best for that and more, Mr. Patel. Thanks for throwing some light on what's happening in the hydro space. Um, and good luck to you. Thank you, friends. Well, the pleasure was ours. Viewers, thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide? is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real, guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target? What's good for long term? When to buy? When to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy a nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. We've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable... Good afternoon, welcome. You are tuned into India Market Close here on NDTV Profit. You know, quickly taking stock of where markets are at, half a percent higher on the Nifty. If we can have the intraday graph as well uh, to try and give more perspective, we've built on those gains since the morning. 
and uh, we built on yesterday's gains as well. So it's it's a bit of both, which is uh, definitely a positive. Uh, let's quickly pull up the heat map. Uh, try and you know uh, see what's really moving markets today. It's the IT pack on the lowest end of that band. Uh, so that's the key drag. But on the top end, if you see, you have the likes of a Maruti, a Hero Moto. So some bit of auto which is pulling some weight. Uh, you have UPL up three and a half percent. It's been a while since I saw something like that uh, on UPL. So that's a positive. You have Apollo, Sun Pharma. Those are some of the gainers as well in trade. Uh, let's quickly pull up uh, the sectoral indices. See, uh, you know how we're uh, structured sectorally. And uh, of course, outside of that two percent gash on the Nifty IT. You're seeing positivity across the board. Nifty Realty up nearly 2%. Now, mind you, it was up 3% at close yesterday as well. So, Realty stocks seem to be doing well as well. Uh, auto, of course, in the lead, 2% higher. But across the board, you're seeing good traction. Uh, the PSE basket, uh, not much to be seen. But the Nifty PSU Bank doing fairly well again in trade today. Uh, that's again a second consecutive day of gains. Uh, good gains for the Nifty PSU Bank. That's where we're at. Quickly on to the BSE 500. Uh, if we can uh, pull that up uh, in terms of the key stocks, winners and losers. Uh, yeah, there you go. Tata Investments. Uh, for the longest time, I've just seen that locked in bottom uh, on lower circuit now. So 5% uh, lower on that one. But uh, outside of that, Gujarat Ambuja Exports, we spoke to them uh, yesterday or day before uh, uh, with regard to how business is looking. Abbott, Persistent Systems, and then you have a whole host of IT stocks there. Um, so outside of those two, you're seeing, or those two, three stocks, you're seeing pretty much an IT in the decline. Uh, Lakshmi Organics, Carborandum, Sobha, so some Realty, uh, some Organics plays, UPL also uh, up today. So uh, some bit of all that also gaining. You're seeing Indust Towers up 6%. Uh, two, three days where we've seen good traction on Indust Towers as well. Uh, of course, we'll talk about a whole host of stocks, including focusing a bit on IT and auto today. I have Neeraj with me, of course, uh, for India Market Close. But quickly on to some stocks which are in focus uh, uh, in trade today. Let me pull up something like a Brigade, a Prestige, real estate stocks at play. Uh, and both of these gaining two different reasons why Prestige on the back of land acquisition, Brigade on the back of a favorable note coming in from Kotak. So, uh, some of those stocks are up. Let's also pull up uh, something like a Prince Pipes, uh, you know, uh, up around two and a half odd percent. Novama, a favorable note coming through from Novama. So that one is also uh, in the green. But outside of that, uh, I also have the likes of a Torrent Power. Man Infra on the back of uh, uh, News uh, is also buzzing. Uh, Shiram Finance is up. Torrent Power up now 3.6%. Morgan Stanley note, not favorable in terms of valuations, but favorable in terms of the new projects that they've won. They've upped their uh, earnings estimates on that one. Uh, but 3.5% is a solid move on Torrent Power. Uh, Man Infra up 2%, we spoke about that. Amber as well is up 4.5%. This one also has been uh, gaining some of these EMS stocks doing fairly well in trade. Uh, Bharat Dynamics, if we can 10% higher stock split, some dividend, uh, that's at play as well. Uh, Neeraj, back to you. Well, actually, back to our guest. Just keep in mind there are a few stocks like All Cargo, which have done exceptionally well for themselves in the session today, up about 13% in trade, and real estate as a bucket is doing well, and both Indus Tower and Vodafone as a bucket have done really well for themselves. So the, the duo, uh, maybe something around the fundraising activities of Vodafone, but both Voda as well as in the stars doing well. Nagarat Shetty, senior technical um, analyst, uh, senior technical research analyst at HDFC Securities with us on the show on the technicals and Avinash Gorakshekar, director of uh, research at Profit Mart Securities on the fundamentals. Gentlemen, thanks for joining in. Nagaraj, I'll take it to you first. Uh, despite IT, the index in, in some sense holding out, is that a net positive as we hit a truncated week? What would your trades be? 
yes, uh, rightly said, index bounced back uh, sharply from the lower levels. What we have seen, we have seen some sharp uh, downtrend in the last week and this week, uh, uh, a good upside bounce from the lower levels around uh, 21,700 levels. There is a resistance around 22,200. The way it has moved up from the lower levels, the overall chart pattern, which is indicating that uh, we are likely to see Nifty breaking above the immediate resistance of around uh, 22,200, 300 levels in the near term. Twenty-two thousand. So, would you initiate longs despite the fact that we are hitting a long weekend, Nagraj, on the Nifty? Yes, of course. The chartically, it is looking looks like that uh, the momentum it has uh, created today from the lower levels is likely to continue for at least for next week, and we are likely to see upside uh, breakout of the 22,200, uh, 300 levels in the next week. And so, in light of that bullish view, uh, what are the specific stocks that you would be taking a trade on today? Yeah, the recently after a massive decline, uh, these mid cap and small caps have uh, witnessed the good uh, upside bounces from the lower levels. I'm uh, picking the stocks from those uh, mid and uh, mid cap segments. Uh, one one is first one is the. LNT finance and holding. Uh, if you look at the chart, uh, chartically it has uh, showed some sharp downward correction. Later it consolidated around 145 odd levels, made a double bottom kind of a thing and uh, uh, bounced back from the lows. Uh, currently looking, the chart pattern is looking positive. It seems that uh, it has formed a higher bottom around 200 EMA, uh, somewhere around 144, 145 levels. One can look to buy uh, currently around 155.50. The target would be around 165. One can place a stop loss at 150. And second one is uh, Borosil Renewable Energy. Borosil was in a downtrend uh, recently in the last week and uh, recently it has bounced back from the 480, 482 levels from the lower levels after forming a, a slight higher bottom. The overall chart pattern is looking positive. It is showing upside breakout of the smaller range moment, currently placed around 522, 523. One can look to buy at this point of time. 545 is going to be the uh, upside target for this stock and uh, 510 uh, could be the stop loss. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we just missed the first stock, Nagaraj, that you mentioned as a call. Can you just repeat that for us? LND Finance and Holding. LND Finance Holding. So long call on both of those. Okay. Thanks for that. Now, the other pocket, Avinash, that has done really well today is real estate. Uh, has, and we're going to talk about autos and IT too. Now, start off with real estate because high beta comes back into flavor when the market sees this uptick. Uh, is that the reason why? Or do you believe some of the real estate stocks might have seen fundamental bottom, bottom fishing? Avinash, the question is to you. Yeah, Neeraj, uh, uh, you know, as far as real estate uh, pack is concerned, they were beaten down quite badly. In fact, most of the large cap names as well as the mid cap names. And I think, uh, you know, the signaling of uh, possibly an interest cut in the next two months is something which is going to, you know, further boost the sector. We have been talking to many small, uh, you know, developers. I think the, the ground level report is that, you know, inventories are still selling uh, pretty well. Uh, there's no impact on demand. And I think, you know, pockets like Bombay, uh, you know, Gurgaon, typically, uh, you know, Western India, I think uh, real estate prices have been keeping very firm. So I think we have positive on stocks like Obrevality, DLF in the large cap category. Uh, in the small cap, uh, mid cap category, we are positive on Anantraj, you know, because it's got a combination of real estate and data center business. So I think uh, the markets are definitely looking at these companies because the earnings trajectory for these companies over the next, say, 6 to 12 months is going to be pretty robust. I think a lot of construction activity is going on. And I think the government is also looking uh, quite positively, possibly post-budget, we could see some further announcements for the sector. So I think uh, a lot of value buying has happened and I think the markets have bounced back. You rightly mentioned that despite a negative uh, you know, headwind from the IT sector today morning, markets are focused on these sectors, which is rightly you know, uh, you know, positioned well for these companies. Okay, Avinash, uh, you know, uh, let's quickly switch over to uh, where all the action currently is, at least on the downside, which is uh, IT. And uh, try and uh, let's try and pull up uh, charts, uh, right? 2% lower on the Nifty IT. Can we pull up probably uh, the last month uh, of what the Nifty IT has done? Uh, and then maybe the, the last three months to try and get more perspective. But uh, while we are at that, uh, the commentary that's come through largely is that Accenture came out with numbers. They suggested that their growth earlier of 3 to 5% for FY24 will not be met. They've toned down on that growth number. 1 to 3% is now their new band for growth, which means that H2 growth will be far slower than what was expected. That's one. 
The other piece, of course, is what's the India impact and what's the impact on Indian stocks. Largely, the impact expected to be on BFSI as well as telecom. Now, when it comes to those stocks, you have the likes of a Tech Mahindra, big on both telecom and now getting big on BFSI as well, given the change in leadership. TCS and Coforge are three which could face negativity in terms of their numbers as well, given Accenture's commentary. And in terms of the sector valuations, if I were to quote Jefferies, they're looking rich with a lesser recovery in sight. Also, you have the Fed coming through, you know, kind of mixed, where uh, they seem to be suggesting that they'll continue to push uh, and wait for a taper on rates. Uh, as, and you have Nifty IT valuations at 26 times earnings, which is a 13% premium to five-year average. 29% premium to the Nifty 50 currently. So Jefferies is selective at the moment, is what at least the note suggests. Infico Forge are their top picks. But we also spoke with a slew of market experts regarding their assessment about tech. Let's hear them out. Um, what last we spoke, it was more about the quarter, and I said the quarter was better than feared. And I think that's where we are. We, it, it's kind of we're kind of stalling for a couple of quarters where things are not getting worse, but they're not getting better. In order them for them get, to get better, you need to see these bookings convert, and that's the bigger issue here. Um, you're right; we have not seen any large booking announcements um, year to date. Um, but again, you know, the some of the companies will tell you that not, not everything gets released or is announced, and these tend to be pretty lumpy. So, you know, but ironically, even if we see deals announced, they're not converting. <laughs> That's the issue. Um, it's a very unusual situation that I have not seen, you know, throughout the years that I've covered the space. Clients awarding contracts, but they're not converting, and they're telling you to stall until they get a better feel on the macro and you know on Fed's cutting rates. I think certainly there are challenges on the IT side. It's been visible for a while. Even the you know Indian companies have been articulating challenges over there. They've been winning big deals, but the challenge is in many of these cases, you're losing something which was a legacy business, and now you're announcing a new deal. So the net benefit to the company, you have to offset the legacy loss with the you know new deal wins. You can't just keep adding the new deals without recognizing the fact that there is some legacy business which is going away. So I think that challenge will continue. Everything that we hear from the US suggests that uh, you know tech spending is going through a difficult period. This is visible in technology, it's visible in the classic IT services, it's visible in support, and it's also visible in the consulting side, right? So the top end of the market, discretionary consulting badly affected, services less so. The only point that I would make, Neeraj, is that from a domestic economy perspective, one of the strengths that we've seen in the economy in recent times is not the growth of just the classic IT services but the rise of global capability centers in India where you have multinationals setting up their own sort of research units here doing research, doing coding and doing a lot of stuff which is core to their own enterprise and that I think will continue to sort of grow. So overall IT services and you know related exports from India should continue to do well but the classic listed IT services companies particularly the ones with a lot of legacy business I think they are going to struggle a little bit more to handle this transition okay so uh, those views coming in but I want to take Avinash's views very quickly with regard to IT Avinash how are you reading this commentary from Accenture what's the second order impact uh, in terms of Indian IT and what's your sense no, I think my guess is that IT companies will uh, see some challenges, you know, over the next, say, two to three quarters. I think Accenture's uh, guidance cut clearly indicates that, uh, you know, uh, big companies in US are unable to get... What's happening on mankind, guys? So, basically, IT... IT is something which I would uh, believe, you know, would see a lot of challenges, I think, at, at least in the very near term. Okay, uh, thanks, Avinash. Uh... Nagraj, your views with regard to IT, any specific uh, plays here from a, from a chart perspective? Yeah, if you look at the sector, sector has done the uh, negative uh, uh, decline recently, last couple of weeks it has seen, we have seen some sharp decline from the highs of 38,250 to almost 34,000. Uh, 
the 34500 the 34700-odd labels it has made today i think the negative uh, the trend weakness is likely to complete it like uh, in the short period of time and i'm expecting it to uh, bounce from the lower levels the, the dust will clear uh, will be cleared in the next one or day or two and i'm expecting upside bounce in the it sector along with the moment in the uh, positive movement in the prominent it sectors so it stocks like uh, tcs and uh, uh, infosys from the lower levels uh, and while viewers were while we're stuck on ID, but what we'll do is on the other side of the break, uh, we need to slip into one. Other side of the break, we talk about autos. That's amongst the better performing sectors. We try and talk about metals because that has zoomed in trade. Just before we take that break, if you just look at the sectoral breakup and what are the themes and what are the sectors that are doing well, in addition to real estate, auto, real estate, media, metals, pharma, a clutch of sectors with autos right up there because of that one stock which is in focus, Maruti Suzuki. We talk about that, Tata Motors, Bajaj Auto, and some more on the other side of this very quick break. Stay tuned. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite oh, simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. As we've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about it, Come back to markets just as the Sensex crosses 73 again and uh, uh, of course it's a day where we have plenty of positivity, lots of stocks buzzing. We have Mihika with us who's going to talk to us about all uh, the volume buzzers for the day, stocks buzzing on the back of good volumes. Mihika. Yes, so up first we have Lakshmi Organics which is up 9% intraday and the volumes are over 22 times is 30 day average. Um, then we have um, uh, Sarada Energy which is over 18 times is 30 day average volumes and it's up 15% intraday after the company's joint venture unit got a letter of intent uh, for the license of iron ore mine in Maharashtra which is around 2500 hectares. Then we have Shanti Gears which is up 50, um, the volumes are up 15 times is 30 day average and it's up 9% intraday. And e Mudra, which has been buzzing um, since yesterday, up 14% today. It's maintained its uh, strong momentum with volumes at 10 times its 30 day average. And lastly, we have All Cargo Logistics, which is up 14% um, and volumes over 6 times its 30 day average. Okay, thank you, Mika. Uh, you know, let me quickly take it across to Nagraj. Nagraj, views with regard to something like an e Mudra, 
some of the strong volume buzzers in trade today, anything that uh, you can pick up on? All cargo, e-mudra, your views? Yes, if you look at the all cargo, uh, it was uh, uh, beaten down stocks recently and from uh, 90, 94 levels to almost reach down to 64 level. Today's 13% uh, up move uh, is uh, indeed uh, giving some boost uh, for the stock to uh, show a uh, sustainable upside bounce. I'm expecting this upside bounce is likely to continue for the, at least uh, all cargo. And uh, even 80 is going to be the next uh, resistance for the stocks in this uh, uprun. So that's all cargo. Now focus shifts to autos. And there is a very strong move that has happened in autos in the session today. The index is at the day's highs, led principally by Maruti Suzuki, which is up three and a half. But I must say, Tata Motors is not far behind. And in case of, I mean, my colleague Puneet would join in to talk about both Maruti and why Maruti could be active. And of course, then throw some light on Bajaj Auto because Bajaj Auto has uh, some comments that have come in. Uh, and it could be interesting to see what's happening there uh, as to what the comments mean for the stock as well. Nagaraj, can I first ask you, before we get the fundamental sense going, uh, to talk about the charts of the auto pack. It's very active today. Maruti is leading the charge, but a lot of others are also active. Uh, how do these look on the charts? Yeah, definitely they are looking positive. We have seen some good uh, decent uh, downward corrections from the higher levels for the whole auto sector recently and even uh, Tata Motors, Maruti, Maruti in fact uh, is outperforming in the last three, four sessions. And uh, I think both the stocks, Tata Motors, Maruti are looking positive. I'm expecting further upside momentum, at least next uh, three to four, five percent uh, upside is likely to continue in the short term. Okay, um, so that's the point around autos. So Maruti is rocking it and uh, very, very interestingly, Puneet should be ready in a moment from now. But Harsh, the other point being, uh, just the kind of moves that have happened in Maruti post uh, even what Shashank Srivatava said, that they got their act right when it came to uh, the mix of hybrid and the, and the norm ICE engines that they have. Never mind the fact that they were not the front movers in EV. It was cussed a lot for the fact that it's not doing too much on EV. And yes, Tata Motors has stolen the limelight and it's raced ahead in the last 12 months. Yes. Best performing auto stock by a country mile. <laughs> but now Maruti is starting to kind of make its presence felt. Yes, absolutely. And it should also be on the back of the fact that we've got higher on our base when it comes to EV. And therefore, growth may not be as high going forward because you're now playing on a higher base. Uh, so that may be one concern which the markets are starting to price in. Second is also CNG. Uh, Maruti continues to have a 72% market share in CNG and therefore uh, that may continue to rule the roost uh, over the medium term. You know, just before I go to Puneet, MGL today was saying that the number of conversions on, on gas cars in, on the road has really shot up in trade. But let's get in Puneet to talk about all of this. Puneet, before you talk about Bajaj Auto in general, Right? The index has done well, and Maruti is really leading the charge. Talk about Maruti first. Yeah, thanks, Neeraj. And as you rightly said, the index is up 2% today. With starting with Maruti, stock is up almost 4%, and year-to-date has been gaining and is up 20% starting January. Now, uh, recently, Nitin Gadkari, the, Ministry of, uh, the Minister of Road, Transport, and Highways, uh, said at a particular summit that the proposed tax that the that he thinks that the proposed tax reduction on hybrid cars is sh should make in now he has recommended a 12 percent uh, tax rate on this particular segment and has requested the finance ministry to take this up seriously now do note that currently the tax rates on uh, hybrid cars is roughly between 28 to 43 percent compared to just 5% on electric vehicles. This leads to a disparity in prices for hybrids as well as electric vehicles. And in case the government decides to take this up and reduces prices or, uh, and taxes as well, reduces taxes on hybrid cars, this would be one of the key benefits for Maruti Suzuki, which already has launched variants such as Grand Vitara as well as the Invicto in the hybrid space. Now, coming to Bajaj Auto, as you said, Neeraj, stock, is up, stock has done really well in the past year, has announced a buyback also. And going forward, uh, currently they are hosting an event uh, with, with, of the Bajaj Group, uh, CSR Arm, Bajaj Beyond, and with CII. 
and they are uh, setting up a Rahul Bajaj Center of Excellence. Now, this would be an investment of 5,000 crore over the next five years. But the key thing that uh, the MD Rajiv Bajaj said at this particular event that the company is uh, looking to launch a CNG power train which would half the fuel expenses compared to a petrol. Now, do know that this announcement had come before of the CNG vehicle launch. He's given a lot of details today. He said that the launch is expected in June this year. It will half the fuel expenses. And thirdly, it will compete with the likes of Hero Splendor, TVS Raider, as well as Honda Shine. And finally, he's also said that this would be in the price segment of roughly 80,000 rupees, competing with all of the three uh, competitors that I just mentioned. Finally, one big number he's given, the company is on track to sell 2 million or 20 lakh pulsars across 93 countries this year. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. So, well, multiple reasons why Bajaj Auto, Maruti and some others could be active. Um, any thoughts here, Nagraj, before we take that break on Bajaj Auto as well? We spoke about Maruti. What about Bajaj Auto? Yes, Bajaj Chartikali, Bajaj Auto has been a fantastic uprun over the last uh, many months. We have seen positive chart pattern like high tops and bottoms over the period of time. Whenever the correction has started from the higher levels, this past, uh, stock has bounced back strongly from the lower levels. Recently also, we have seen some significant upside bounces uh, in the last four or five sessions. I'm expecting this upside momentum to continue and the next resistance will be watched for the stock is around 9,450 odd level. Point taken. Uh, you know, we also have uh, Bajaj Auto, which is launching the first ever CNG motorcycle. CNG is back in vogue, Neeraj. Uh, and uh, that's going to happen in June this year. Uh, this is what Rajiv Bajaj had to say on that one. That in the month of June, we are... So I didn't tell you exactly what I was But I am giving you specific information that in June, ke mein we will launch this motorcycle. So you have to do a lot of publicity that CNG is coming out of June. Okay, uh, that's it for the CNG. Okay, plenty happening in auto. Uh, Avinash, your views with regard to all that's happening and uh, in terms of valuations, because look at how Bajaj Auto, some of these names have just shot up uh, quite dramatically. We've seen very solid returns from some of these uh, stocks. Bajaj Auto was a sub-7,000 when the buyback was announced. I remember it was announced around 3.350 and Neeraj and me were anchoring. And, uh, uh, you know, it's currently very close to 9,000. So, Avinash, one valuations, if you can talk about that and your views on auto in general. No, I think uh, my guess is that, you know, two-wheeler sector has taken off uh, quite commendably. And this was the last segment of the automotive market, which has now, uh, you know, got back into action. Uh, if you see the commercial vehicle, the passenger car market was early to, you know, get revived and, uh, get robust volumes. I think now the three-wheeler and the two-wheeler markets have actually got back in action. And I think to a large extent, some rural demand is also responsible for that. I think going forward, two-wheeler markets would definitely see a strong double-digit growth. And that's what is driving stocks like Bajaj Auto, Hero Motor, TVS Motors. Because, you know, for the last two years, uh, where the sales were virtually flattish. The industry was showing a significant amount of degrowth. So I think markets are now upbeat that the sector has taken a revival. We could see longer uh, kind of uh, volume numbers. And I think if interest cuts do happen in the next two to three months, I'm quite sure that this would impact the two-wheeler sales further positively. So I think, you know, uh, Bajaj Auto did a buyback at 10,000 rupees. I would not be surprised that if this earnings momentum continues and if their CNG bike actually takes off and generates a good amount of volume interest, then I think you could see a further kind of re-rating on the stock because uh, within the two-wheeler market, I think, you know, it's going to be the product-oriented uh, success which is going to be uh, responsible. Uh, you know, after Pulsar, uh, obviously, we saw what happened in the motorcycle market for Bajaj. So, I think uh, this is definitely a very key product for Bajaj. If it clicks in big numbers, then I think you would see a further re-rating. Uh, I would not be surprised that two-wheeler market is still now showing, uh, you know, initial signs of uh, buoyancy. There's more to come over the next, say, 12 to 15 months. Okay, Avinash, uh, one quick, quick question. Uh, just in terms of names, how would you play this? Two-wheeler, four-wheeler, auto-ank, maybe two, three names that you really find good in this market. So I think two-wheeler uh, uh, auto component companies, you know, specifically companies like Fiam Industries, uh, Lumax Industries, uh, typically even Sundaram Fasteners, or for that reason, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, companies which are into the, you know, uh, bodybuilding parts like, say, 
you know, uh, uh, JBM Auto. These are companies which obviously would benefit. I think clearly PM looks very attractive and obviously, you know, you will have Lomax Industries also. These are very large auto component suppliers and I think whenever volumes pick up, uh, you would definitely see a stringer. Uh, uh, one recent listed company which is uh, Ask Automotive, you know, that is also one company which has got a large uh, revenue share from the two-wheeler market. It's been rising quite well over the last few weeks. So I think here also one could definitely look at it. Uh, I would not be surprised that there could be significant re-rating here in all these auto component companies which are largely servicing the two-wheeler market. Okay, so thank you for that, Avinash. Uh, Nagraj, uh, I understand we're going to have to let you go. Uh, so thank you uh, for, uh, for all the time that you've given us today. But uh, it's time to slip into a short break. Uh, but before that, Another pack that's been in focus is the Nifty Pharma, up over a percent or so in trade today, doing reasonably well. It's gained over 11% in the year so far. In fact, we spoke with Gautam Shah of Goldilocks Premium Research, and he says the best in pharma is yet to come. Listen in. I think the best is yet to come. I think pharma has been absolutely clean and smooth. We have seen consistently higher highs all along. And it, it is only going to get better and better because our working target is about 19,600 short term and about 21,500 on the index, uh, more medium term to long term. So it's clearly has been the place to hide and I see continuous strength there uh, led by Sun Pharma, which is our favorite and we've recommended it multiple times. Uh, Cipla, Dr. Eddie's. Uh, so I would stay with these three big names uh, for the time being and I would avoid the smaller or the mid cap pharma companies where I think there is no great risk reward to be buying fresh at these levels. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real guys, there are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term? When to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dream? Back with India Market Close right here on NETV Profit. Uh, let's uh, bring in on the show Shivangi Sarda. She's analyst equity and derivatives and technicals at MOFSL. Shivangi, good having you. Thanks for taking the time out. Good afternoon. Um, it's turning out to be a good afternoon, Shivangi. Uh, did this quite turn out the way you anticipated? And because you're hitting the long weekend, are you comfortable taking home longs on futures or options if you have them? 
Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Neeraj, for having me. And we've seen that there has been spectacular action of the bulls from the crucial support zones. Uh, right from the 50 exponential moving average on the daily frame for Nifty, we've seen that there has been a good amount of longs that have been added. Uh, uh, you know, and here onwards, we see that it is holding quite well above 22,000 zones, which was uh, kind of a make or break uh, in the yesterday's session. So overall, uh, bulls are quite active. India VIX is at its lower band, which indicates that there is no panic. So uh, of course, we are looking at buy on decline strategy as well. Now we are heading into the monthly expiry week. So of course there will be some sort of option premium crash because of the time value. But um, uh, you know, overall we are expecting a good upside so one can play with the futures and carry the long. Uh, we are expecting uh, the spot levels to, uh, you know, next hurdle, uh, next immediate hurdle is 22,350 and then 22,500 levels with a support near 21,950 levels. Okay. Um, Shivangi, a clutch of sectors and themes looking very promising today. As you said, very strong action by the bulls. So what's the first amongst equals? Where is it that you're seeing the best action which would make you believe that the probability of gains continuing would be the highest despite the long weekend and a truncated week? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, auto is one such pack which is quite, uh, you know, active and which is uh, a lot of momentum. Now, among that, uh, you know, one counter, which is Maruti, which is looking quite attractive at these levels, uh, there has been an increase in the amount of rollover that is happening in this stock as we move into the monthly expiry week. Uh, technically speaking, there has been a Poland flag pattern formation breakout over here and holding on quite well. You've seen that this stock particularly has been an outperformer in the entire space. So, of course, the tailwind from the sector and uh, the strength in this uh, counter is going to take this stock higher. Uh, now, the next targets that we are expecting is around about 12,800 levels with a stop near 12,100 zones. Okay. And one of the other set of stocks which have done really well, aside of all cargo, of course, um, look at Phenotech Chemicals. Um, it was a one in which there was a, a QIP or a, or a preferential issue recently, and Phenotech is up about... 10.5% if I'm not wrong, 382. So a bit of a surge out there in the last uh, half an hour of trade. And the one that caught my eye is Star Cement. I wonder if the gains are back-ended. It's up 9.5% now as we speak, 230, 231. But yes, a bit of a spike in the last few minutes for Star Cement as well. Cement per se has had a bit of a subdued run recently, but Star certainly doing well for itself. What was doing well uh, was Metro Brands. And you know, the last few days, the stock has had some very interesting sessions. Now, if you are wondering uh, what Metro Brands is about, it's uh, Rekha Junjunwala owned a company, has zoomed about 5% in the last five days. What could be fueling the rally and what are the fundamentals? Let's get in Mahima and Harsh to talk about Metro Brands. Over to you guys. Right, Neeraj. So, uh, before we move on to the fundamentals and what is working out for the company, a brief idea of what the company does. Uh, well, uh, Metro Brands is basically into uh, the footwear, uh, retail footwear segment, and it operates multiple brands under one umbrella, which include uh, the Metro itself, then we have Mochi, then we have Crocs, then we have Foot Locker, Fila, which they've recently acquired, then we also have Fit Flop. Now, uh, the interesting part about Metro Brands is that uh, they do not manufacture the uh, footwear themselves what they do is they outsource this to a lot of dealers across India and that is what gives them the advantage of uh, delivering uh, the new styles that come into the markets very uh, swiftly now also uh, Metro Brands believes in uh, something called um, company owned and company operated so all the uh, stores that the company has are owned and operated by the company. So here is uh, something where the company's debt is allocated to. So uh, it just just to give a brief idea about where the store counts of um, the entire Metro brand stands, it, they have around 800 stores across India. And if we uh, talk about uh, Metro, uh, the brand itself, it has 313 stores. Mochi has around 229 stores. And Crocs has around 206 stores. Now, recently, they've entered into two strategic partners partnership one uh, with Foot Locker and the other one is with Fila. Uh, the both of these are, are going to uh, become completely operational by the end of FY25 and in terms of their nine months um, coming to their fundamentals their nine months um, 
how the revenues have worked out for them. The revenue is has shown an increasing trend where in FY21 it was only around 800 crores. It has now gone to uh, 2,300 crores. Uh, moving on to EBITDA, where well, their EBITDA has also shown an increasing uh, trend uh, from 175 to 684 at present. Uh, also, their uh, EBITDA margins. Um, their margins have also shown an increasing trend. However, this, the trend, the increasing trend is not uh, on a steeper side, but uh, they're still on an increasing trend. And lastly, uh, in terms of profits, uh, their profits have also shown an increasing trend. Just uh, it's it's worth noting here that this is the nine months FY 20, uh, 24, and this is the FY 23 that we are comparing it with. But uh, Metro Brands is also buzzing in trade today because two brokerages have uh, maintained their buy stand on uh, Metro Brands, but to, uh, to, more, to know more about this, Harsh will tell you what they're saying. Well, yes, thanks for that, Mahima. So I'll start off with Goldman Stacks. In fact, both of these brokerages have actually initiated uh, coverage okay. on, uh, on Metro Brands, so stand corrected there. But where uh, Goldman Sachs is concerned, one, they've uh, kept a target price steep 1450, very steep upside. They believe that as premiumization starts to kick in, there's going to be some positive impact. As you saw, margins have been going up and that trend ought to continue as premiumization kicks through. What they are suggesting is in the larger retail space, premiumization has done very well, whereas Metro brands, there's still some way to go before premiumization kicks in. So they are expecting that to happen. Store count rise by a CAGR of around 11 to uh, 13 odd percent across stores. Uh, and that should, of course, uh, you know, further lead to some amount of upside. The SNS business contributing to around 17% of revenue by FY35, better margin business, and therefore should aid the numbers going forward. Fila's revenue, now this is a big one, because Fila is an, uh, it's an FY22 kind of news, but it's still to fully come on stream. And once that comes on stream, you can expect a revenue number of 2100 crore and EBITDA margins of roughly 23% uh, by uh, FI35 is what they see. Now, significant headroom for store growth as well. Uh, that should also further uh, aid uh, and give a bit of a fillip with regard to where Metro Brands is concerned. But more importantly, Dam Capital as well, positive on Metro Brands. Slightly lower target price where uh, uh, dam capital is concerned, but what they seem to be suggesting is uh, and very interesting, uh, uh, you know, point to note here is that they are expecting the some metrics. 1.2 crore rupees per store is the investment. Okay. 60 lakhs per uh, store is the profit or the cash flow that the store makes. Therefore, two stores are contributing to one new store essentially in terms of cash flow and therefore they are expecting a store growth of 35 percent going forward which should further aid the numbers of metro brands they're also suggesting that metro brands largely has self-funded their growth except for two fundraisers one prior to the ipo and one during the ipo they've virtually done no fundraise and therefore one to keep your eye out on definitely okay metro brands and you know, for for the for for the better part of the day, did okay. Uh, Metro Brands as a stock will come up on your screen. Let's pull back a little bit, maybe in the last uh, half an hour. Uh, yes, uh, started off well and then has come off. Uh, Avinash, any thoughts here? Metro Brands, do you track it fundamentally? No, I think clearly uh, in terms of their retail reach and in terms of their positioning, I think uh, Metro Brands, uh, uh, you know, brand should do well. My sense is that, you know, in the past few quarters, there was a slowdown in the footwear market growth. I think comparable companies like Campus, Bata, you know, had shown, uh, you know, slightly flattish top line and margin pressure. But I think Metro Brands is one of those companies which has got a very deep uh, retail as well as a rural penetration. And I think you would obviously see better numbers at least coming next year. I think the fill up, uh, the, you know, kind of collaboration uh, uh, is yet to take off. But once that comes in, Obviously, if it gets operationalized uh, pretty soon, uh, we could see numbers changing dramatically. And I think, uh, you know, the market is quite upbeat on the fact that this is a B2C product category where pricing is not a problem. Uh, obviously, you know, in the past few quarters, there has been some problem on the demand side. But I think things are slowly recovering. And I think longer term, definitely, we could see a decent risk reward coming out from here. Okay. And since we are talking of retail, um, you know, maybe Tuesday, on Editor's Cut, I'll try and bring about a perspective on 
all retail versus maybe a trend. Because if you just look at what trend is doing vis-a-vis -vis what a combination of some of the others, save for DMART, are doing, I mean, I think trend consumates all of those market caps. But the reason why I mentioned DMART, because uh, on Twitter, or on X rather, a clutch of Shivangi Sarada fans are telling that she gave a splendid call on Avenue Supermarts or DMART. So Shivangi would love to know what was the call and what's the call now? It's also in the similar space. Absolutely. So DMART has been, uh, you know, uh, spectacular this week. Uh, we've seen a 10% surge over here uh, in the last three, uh, four sessions itself. And we've seen that there has been a very good amount of volume that has added. Uh, this entire space is looking quite positive and uh, it's surpassed its previous hurdle zones as well. Uh, technically speaking, we've seen that this stock has, uh, you know, uh, now uh, is it's, you know, training to come out of its consolidative band on the monthly frame. So the targets which are coming out for this stock are quite, uh, you know, good and decent at these levels. Um, we had, uh, of course, recommended at lower levels, but still the targets are now coming to be around 44, 44 levels uh, for the next uh, zones. And 4,200 would be a crucial support to watch out for and to trail the stop losses ahead. Well, it's, cer it's certainly doing well for itself, Avenue Supermars, but that's about retail. What's caught my eye, Harsh, very strongly is Indus Tower now. While Star Cement, uh, Lakshmi Chemicals, all of them are doing well, Indus is now 8% higher on extremely strong volumes. This has been a rank outperform, if you will, within the telecom space. You compare a three-month performance or a six-month performance, what have you, a three-month is a better uh, a timeline of Indus Tower vis-a-vis -vis anything else available within the telecom space. Uh, Bharti Airtel, uh, Vodafone Idea, put in a reliance with the geo might that it has, and I think Indus Tower stands head over heels above every, even Tata Communication. Maybe Tata Com would have done slightly better, but let's pull up the three-month charts of all of these very quickly um, and show you Indus Towers in particular. Uh, the performance of this stock has been very, very strong. So both a technical and a fundamental view there. Um, on, the, on, on the charts, if you will, or on the derivative position, if you will, Shivangi, to you first, Indus Tower, uh, does the does the move today signify that it could do further or it to do more? So there has been a very good amount of short covering move over here in Indus Tower. Uh, it uh, beautifully uh, surpassed its resistant level of uh, around 269 levels. And uh, right now, of course, the stock is up by, uh, you know, over 8.5%. Uh, so a slight cool off would be a good risk reward, uh, you know, to enter into the stock. But the next targets that we could look at uh, is around 285 levels over here. Uh, now 265 would be a crucial support to watch out for. The stock has come out uh, of its uh, higher band uh, after the consolidation of the last eight to nine sessions. So of course the uh, up move uh, is sustainable at these levels as well. This could well be because of a proposed Vodafone fundraise as well, because anything that Vodafone can do, which enables Indus to recover the dues that it has, would be construed favorably. Is Indus fundamentally a good buy at the current valuations, or would you avoid? I think uh, in terms of valuations, uh, Niraj, it definitely looks interesting and uh, good. I mean, if you look at the longer term uh, viability of the business, uh, initially, you know, I think whatever Vodafone has been saying is that they would be selling the stake. That actually helps. Uh, recovering, you know, whatever dues are there from Vodafone. But I think the entire uh, tower renting space, uh, I would believe, is now getting consolidated. And I think Indus Towers should do pretty well in terms of their geography, in terms of their size. And I think their balance sheet is also pretty strong. So I think longer term, I think this business is definitely sustainable. Uh, with 5G rollout, I think you could expect further traction. But I think longer term, I think money could be made. In the near term, you know, this momentum will continue. But I think you'll have to see some bounce of buying and selling. But longer term, yes, this business is going to prove quite profitable for the company because there aren't many players who actually compete uh, you know, with the scale and size of Indus Towers. Okay, thank you for that, Avinash. Uh, uh, if I can come back, uh, Shivangi, your, your views with regard to uh, some of the footwear stocks. You have Metro Brands, you have Bata India, you have Relaxo. Uh, anything that you like, and how are they looking on charts for you? Uh, so, uh, you know, let's look at the entire space uh, right now. So, uh, the small names are, of course, beaten down 
but uh, looking at uh, stocks like uh, Bata, uh, these stocks, the consumption names especially, especially have witnessed some sort of recovery. But again, you know, the momentum is really missing. Now, uh, for instance, Bata has been in the downtrend from the last three months. And uh, even though it is near its crucial support zones of uh, near about 1380 levels, which was uh, where it rebounded, uh, you know, even in um march last year but then again we've seen that the momentum is really low at these levels so we would actually wait for some time for the levels to stabilize uh so this would be a kind of a wait and watch for me okay uh, uh and shivangi your picks on this friday evening uh so yes uh maruti was one preferred pick which we discussed which is looking quite positive at these levels uh, and we are expecting a good up move, uh, you know, from here as well. The second uh, preferred pick would be Charlotte Hotel. Uh, now, after three weeks of lower highs, lower lows, uh, we've seen that there has been a negation over here with good amount of volumes that have been added from the last three sessions. Uh, from the last uh, six trading sessions, consistently higher lows are forming. That means that the support is uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, shifting higher. And there's been buying at any small decline. So we are expecting a good up move over here to 850 uh, odd levels. And 805 would be a crucial support to watch out for. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, Shivangi, those are BTST. Just to quickly uh, clarify that. Yes. Okay. Uh, and Shivangi, you know, we spoke about Nifty IT prior to you joining Absolutely any views, because now we're 2.5% down on the Nifty IT, nearly there. Uh, of course, still slightly above the day's low, but uh, we're closing very close to that. So, uh, you know, some of the heavyweight IT counters are still uh, lacking uh, the kind of support-based buying. Uh, we've seen Infosys and the other sectors, uh, the other st stocks in the sector as well which have, uh, you know, seen quite a lot of beaten down from the last four to five sessions. Uh, so heavyweights, uh, you know, are uh, a no entry at these levels. But then again, mid-cap IT names are showing some sort of strength. Uh, you know, but alternatively, there are better sectors which are much more in momentum in this kind of a market. And we should actually be with the sectors which are in momentum and not chase uh, the ones that are lackluster, but definitely mid-cap IT are recovering from lower levels. Okay, um, Avinash, um, uh, Star Cement, and, and cement wasn't uh, likely to move quite a bit, uh, primarily because pricing pressures exist. Uh, what explains this 11% uptick? Are you constructing on any cement stock? I think Neeraj, uh, we like large cap uh, cement companies because we believe that pricing power will be more better realized in companies, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, Ambuja Cements and ACC. I mean, I would not be surprised that, you know, even Ultratech would benefit, but the smaller players, I think it's very difficult to believe that Star Cement, you know, probably because they operate in a very niche market, very little competition there. I would uh, wait for at least a quarter or two to see that, you know, these prices uh, in kind of uh, smaller markets where only one or two players exist, you could possibly see pricing uh, getting more stronger. But I think uh, with the government pushing on infrastructure, and I think this budget, you know, hopefully once the new government comes in, uh, the, the focus on infra and construction is going to continue unabated. And I think that is where the market is quite positive. I think supply side also, cement prices seem to have stabilized. Uh, prices have started moving up. The raw material prices, the raw material input, sorry, have also stabilized. So that also is a matter of comfort for the cement companies. So I think infra is definitely uh, going to go up. And I think that's uh, that the way to play it is obviously to play on the cement sector. So we are positive on Ambuja cement. We believe that even at these levels, somebody who's got a 12 to 18 month view could definitely get a better risk report. Okay. Avinash, Shivangi, both of you, thanks so much for joining in today and giving us your thoughts. And to you and yours, a very happy holy. Mm. Right. That's the view from our experts. and. You know, just before we wrap up, hear out a major voice at a CI event. Uh, my colleague Tamanna asked ITC's MD Sanjeev Puri about the kinds of rural income and how strategic investments can positively impact rural economy. Herein. If I specifically was to focus on rural incomes, you know, now rural incomes are in three parts and each one is nearly equal. One is off farm incomes. That is indexed to connectivity to urban centers. That is indexed to 
uh, growth in manufacturing and real estate particularly, that is one. Second is rural wages. And third is farm income. So, so three parts of it. The first is independent. The other two are a little bit connected to agriculture. And as I said earlier that uh, if we, if we, uh, weather events are, are if, if they do happen, uh, they can cause problem. But there are solutions available. I think I would, I would also compliment the national agencies that have also started to provide this information, some solutions to, to farmers. But the effort and the scale and magnitude of what is happening needs to be multiplied and it needs to be done in a spirit of public-private partnership. Enterprises, government agencies all need to come together. And there are successful models. I'll, I'll give you example, uh, I'll give you our own examples. Several years back when we started Climate Smart Agriculture, in 70% in of the districts we started, all these districts are today classified as high yield and high resilience. GHG emissions there have dropped by as much as 60%. Farm incomes have improved by as much as 90%. So what is good for the farmer is also good for the planet. Okay. So there are, there are solutions available. They may not solve all, all of the issues, but maybe 60-70%. So we should implement these while we continue to work on developing solutions for the or the pathways for the unsolved problems. So we need to implement that, that at scale in a spirit of public-private partnership. So we'll have to do something about it. The good news is work has started, but I think the journey is, is a long one. Okay, uh, that was Sanjeev Puri, of course, of ITC. I'm gonna quickly take you through markets as we are very, very close to closing this week out. Uh, a third of a percent higher, at least the way we see it at the moment, the Nifty 50 building on those gains from yesterday and nothing to complain about whatsoever. Very close to the 2200 mark. It's a place where we would want to be if we were to start next week. So it's, it's a good place to be at. Let's quickly pull up the heat map uh, and see nothing new from what we've already been talking about. Autos, uh, we also have some positivity around something like an Indusin bank is up 2.3%. There was a positive note by ICICI Securities on that one. 2000 is the target price, keep your eye out on that. But outside of that, let's look at the IT pack that's dominated the players in red on the Nifty 50. So that's where the pain has come from, at least today. But despite that, we've, we are still in the green. So that's a positive. Let's pull up the contributories because uh, that's where we'll see that despite all the pain in IT, uh, we've still done fairly well. HDFC Bank is, uh, is, is here as well, but outside of that, the three top IT players, uh, Infi, TCS, HCL Tech, contributing to almost 60 points in the negative of the 84 negative contributories. Uh, and look at the positives, ITC, LNT, ICICI Bank, Sun Pharma. So it's a bit of pharma, a bit of banking. It's quite diverse there in terms of uh, the sector make. Now let me quickly take it to sectors because you'll see a coat of green across sectors. Uh, and outside of, of course, uh, the Nifty IT, we've closed now for the day and for the week. So except for Nifty IT, which has now closed to a quarter percent lower, uh, we'll go into the constituents very, very soon. But uh, you look at Realty, look at Auto, look at Pharma. They've done very well in trade. Realty, in fact, closing 1.8% higher. Auto at one point of time was a top sectoral gainer. Some bit of cool off that we've seen in the last 10 to 15 minutes there. 1.6% higher is where we've closed that one. Pharma up 1.3 and media also did fairly well in trade. So we've got a good clutch of four uh, sectors which have done over 1.3% in trade. At the expense of IT, we've done fairly well. Let's uh, quickly pull up IT uh, in terms of constituents and see the pain has been across the board. It's not mid cap, it's not large cap, it's across the board. We're seeing Infi, Wipro, Coforge, Persistent, pretty much across the board. Uh, clearly, we are seeing uh, pain uh, in IT on the back of the Accenture commentary that has come through. Uh, but let me quickly last off pull off the Nifty Realty uh, and look at the constituents there because that one has done very well. Except for Phoenix, we're seeing a coat of green across the board. So there as well, look at Prestige, look at Soba, look at Brigade. Uh, Prestige and Brigade on the back of one of news, but outside of that as well, Nifty Realty doing fairly well in trade today as well as to close the week off through the week as well. But let me quickly 
that's all the time we have. Uh, let me quickly toss it across to uh, Sanjeev Puri, who spoke about the government's initiatives on sustainability. Uh, of course, hope you have a great long weekend. Uh, we'll see you on the other side. We're, we're in a good uh, position right now because we have a lot of proactive policy interventions that have happened by the government at the, at the center. I think the open access policy, for example, that came recently, the green credit system, the, the whole idea about life, which is about sustainable consumption to, to support the transition. So as enterprises, I think the, what we need to embrace is green infrastructure, buildings, energy, transportation. We need to embrace nature-based solutions. Uh, we, we need to deal with the issue of water, the issue of biodiversity, the issue of forestation. So it has to be through a spirit of public-private partnership and enterprises need to do it as in their eco ecosystem. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite oh, simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. As we've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money, There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks. On your show, Hot Money. Thanks for tuning in to Talking Point. I'm your host, Neerat Shah. The case for a chat today, you can't take your eyes away from what the Fed has done, but you obviously can't take your eyes away from what Accenture has guided to. So in some sense, there's this push of policy action versus demand. So the case for a chat will come up on your screen next, and we are going to be talking about whether 2024, India remains in the global spotlight, whether outlook for IT remains subdued, whether the Fed action prompts risk asset managers to up their bets on risk assets slash equities per se, and whether uh, fixed income and precious metals become a space to bet on. Uh, the gentleman who is our guest today, back in Jan 2023, had said that there are options beyond equities, 
and he's self-confessed in a previous interview that in some sense equities still did well. So he said he doesn't want to make any forecasts, but we've gotten him to do precisely that. Vetri Subramaniam, Chief Investment Officer at UTI Asset Management Company joins us. Vetri, so good having you. Thanks for taking the time out. Thank you. Thanks for having me in this lovely studio. Now, the pleasure is entirely ours. So how do you feel, Vetri, about, uh, about, about the whole process of investing? Because just uh, the, the volatility in news flow always is high, but it's certainly not low this time. Sure. Uh, again, you know, the way I look at this, Neeraj, uh, actually I don't see volatility as being high because if you look at volatility either in terms of historical volatility or in terms of the volatility that we can look at in the options market, both are actually very muted. Sure. Um, I think the definition of volatility sometimes hides the language that we should be using, which is the market's not going up every day. But the market is not supposed to go up every day, right? So I think that's the wrong definition of volatility. The market actually remains very, very low in terms of volatility. And, you know, the bigger point that I would make, and I always tell investors this, if you're going to invest in equities, expect that the market will drop at least 10% once every year. Expect that the market will drop 20 to 25% every two to three years. And once every 10 years, it might even drop 30, 40, 50%. That's going to be part and parcel of your journey. When you look at it in that context, I don't think anything we've experienced in the last few months amounts to volatility. Yeah, no, but just the volatility news flow is what I meant because there, uh, it's very chop and change for all the hawks around Fed who, and, and what the Fed delivered yesterday or day before la last night, I mean, was pretty different from what anybody could have anticipated. So in some sense there, there is a bit of a chalk and cheese effect. Uh, partly true. But again, I would say, look, you know, in the markets, there's always something going on. Mm. Right? If you were to tell me that there's more news flow today as compared to 2020, when at this point of yeah, time, yeah. we were all getting locked long. up at home and we didn't know where, you know, That's the true. future looked like, I would say that was a lot more uncertain yeah. than it is today. So, yeah, I mean, these are all small things. Look, the Fed policy, uh, MPC policy, these are all part and parcel of the discussion about markets. But mm. these can't be the sole determinant of what investors choose to do. True. So, you know, I treat this as part of the weather. Uh, you know, should you dress appropriately for the weather yes answer is yes but you don't change your uh, you know strategic objective because of what the short-term weather forecast is so that's the way I look at it okay and I'll come to the strategic objective as well and earnings growth and other sure, factors sure. but just uh, a word about the weather too I mean does it look like uh, the mood might have changed at the margin because of what the Fed reiterated nothing different Correct. Correct. but reiterated Sure. I think that's a good question, Neeraj. And, you know, you go back to January and I remember looking at the data. Uh, people were expecting as many as almost, you know, five to six rate cuts during this year. 140 basis points was what the Fed implied was showing. Uh, that's now obviously down to about 75. Um, and, you know, to that extent, I would say the market's already sort of shifted in its expectation that growth is going to be much better than anticipated. Inflation seems to... Coming down, not net near target, but coming down. But to my mind, you know, the more interesting thing which actually emerged from the Fed uh, messaging day before yesterday was the fact that they have actually indicated a willingness to walk back on quantitative tightening. To my mind, that was actually the most critical part of the messaging as opposed to anything else. Because I think one of the challenges that the U.S. Fed in particular and the U.S. Treasury in particular faces is that unlike central banks all over the world uh, or governments all over the world who increase their average tenure of borrowings in the post-pandemic periods when rates were close to zero, uh, the U.S. Treasury never did that. And they actually continue to borrow very, very short term. In fact, in the last one year, they have predominantly borrowed treasury bills, which I would actually submit is a very dangerous strategy to follow. But therefore, they will sooner or later have to replace that treasury bill borrowing with dated security borrowing. Now, imagine a scenario in which the US government is continuing to happily run deficits of six to seven trillion dollars a year. Uh, they're going to have to issue long dated bonds. And now the biggest holder of bonds, which is the US Fed, is also saying I need to sell bonds into the market. So if there was a reason to breathe a sigh of relief, it's simply that the Fed for the first time in a way sort of blinked and said, okay, you know, we might have to rethink how much uh, and how aggressively we sell bonds. So that messaging on QT was to my mind the most significant part of what came out. And maybe there is nervousness and rightly so there should be nervousness because I think the US Treasury has played what I would say is a fairly risky game of borrowing so much in T-bills and not in dated securities. So 
considering this aspect that's happening in the US, considering that BOJ, albeit in a gradual fashion, but there is a bit of a quote unquote policy normalization as well Correct. that has happened. Correct. So central banks are talking a very different tune than what they have in the last three years. What's the what's the impact to your mind on risk assets per se over the next nine months, probable impact? So, you know, we talked about Tina versus Tara, and uh, I think in the Indian context, it certainly didn't work. Global equities worked very well. But I think the fact of the matter remains that what we discussed last time in terms of the underlying change in not just weather, but in terms of climate is very, very pronounced. It is pronounced because we've now, it's very clear we've moved away from zero interest rates. Right? Japan is the last one to sort of exit that territory. Um, and therefore, as a result, bonds have become a valid asset class in any global investor's portfolio. And this is already visible in what's happened in the US. So which asset class in the US pulled in the largest amount of money last year? It was US money market funds. They pulled in almost six trillion dollars of money simply because people are saying, "Hey, I can actually get you know four and a half, five percent over risk there. Uh, you know, I'm happy to take that because I haven't seen this kind of you know reasonably safe return on a safe liquid asset for a long period of time." So I think that will continue to remain a challenge. That bonds have once again become a valid asset class in the pools of money, which are the largest pools of money, which are trying to meet retirement obligations and you know you want to use a balanced portfolio of bonds, equities, so on and so forth. The mad rush to go down the risk curve to get better returns, that period is now behind us. So I think this is a change in temperature that we will have to continue to deal with, that bonds are once again a valid investment uh, instrument in uh, you know global investor portfolios. And I think that will continue to pose challenges to equities. And from that point of view, therefore, high equity valuations, you know, I would be a little bit worried and circumspect because incrementally, rather than people hunting for yield by going down the risk curve, they are going to go back to the stability of what bonds are willing to offer them. So actually, uh, I'd love to understand this from you because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. Uh, higher for longer rates, even if rates yeah. were to come down, therefore bonds and valuation multiples both get impacted. Mm. But... If there is a series of rate cuts, it may not be seven, it may not be six, it may be three. In some sense, if it enhances the appeal of emerging markets by and large, what is that next nine to 12 months of presumably three rate cuts have in store therefore for equities and EM equities in particular, considering the point that you just made in the previous answer versus the appeal of EMs in a rate downward sure, trajectory? Sure. So I think the critical difference here I would submit is that we don't see the long bond yield coming down dramatically. Mm. And equities are eventually priced relative to the long bond yield rather than to the short term money market rate. Right? So will the Fed cut? Sure, they most probably will cut. It should get cut at some point of time. Likely in India as well at some point towards the end of the year we will cut. But that's not the important number on which people price equities. What they price it on is where is the 10-year bond yield. And I, the key, I think, is that that is not going to come down for the simple reason that inflation looks like it is higher for longer. The West, and particularly US, has suddenly discovered this new toy called fiscal deficit. No signs of bringing it down. Unlike India, where we're actually continuously looking to tighten fiscal deficit, you know, going into 26. Yeah. And if you look at what the finance minister, of course, you know, new parliament, etc. But the finance ministers actually now even talked, and if you see recent commentary, not just the fact that we need to bring down the fiscal deficit and be disciplined, but also talking debt to GDP. And this is happening in an environment where the US is not even talking about these things. The CBLO is, but you know, otherwise they're not CBO is, but the government is, you know, pretty happy to run fiscal deficit. So I think equities will get priced of the long end, and that is where we need to be cautious. I don't see the long end coming down. Okay. So uh, before we take that break, one more macro question with regards to India, therefore. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, Morgan Stanley reiterated their call that it is India's decade. In some sense, we're talking about a very fiscally responsible uh, finance ministry uh, at the helm of affairs currently. And growth numbers, uh, not anemic, certainly, even if not as strong as the last three years, if Correct. you will. Correct. How favorably does that place Indian equities in light of the fact that the valuations are still high for them? 
I think you're absolutely right in all our conversations and we you know raise money from a lot of global investors which we manage almost three billion dollars of global money wow. uh, I think there's no doubt about the fact that most people say look India is a very structural component of our portfolio uh, and we want to continue raising our exposure to equity in India simply because we can see the long-term structural opportunity uh, but that's one part of the story the other part is what am I paying for it right and I think that's where it starts to get slightly more tricky because valuations in India are expensive. Equities in general across the world are expensive at this point of time, particularly the US. And in India as well, you are having to pay a significant premium to that. So I think to that extent, the sort of appetite has been a little bit more muted. I would submit more muted than what perhaps people have hoped for. That's been offset by the fact that domestic demand yeah. has been very strong. But I would really interpret the setup to say that if for whatever reason Indian equities were to correct or come down, you will start to see a lot more stronger foreign bid. And just two points I want to make here. You know, Indian equities have reached a premium where it's interesting to just think through the mindset of global companies. We've had two or three global companies in recent time come and say, you know what, we are happy to sell down some of our stake in India, right? So when you have these high valuations, it's not surprising that rather than seeing a rush of global m and inbound into India, you're actually seeing some of these MNCs saying, hey, we can actually sell some of these rich assets in India. The other interesting that I want to point out is that everybody only talks about how much money is coming into the market, particularly the local money is coming into the market. Look at the amount of stock sales which are being made by P funds, VC funds, promoters, QIPs, OFS, IPO. If you look at that number for 2023, actually there was $45 billion of buying by FPIs and domestic institutional investors. There was close to $38 billion of what I can count of sales of primary fundraising or secondary sell downs by these investors. So, you know, at these valuations, you're also attracting a lot of supply. I think it's a great decade for India as a country, you know, capital availability, economy grows, all of that. Equities, I'd argue that I want, you know, valuations which offer more margin for comfort. If you are arguing, we are listening to it, Vetri. Uh, stay on. So much more to talk to you about. We'll take a very quick break, viewers. My colleague Chinma has done a small story around the piece that Mr. Subramaniam spoke about, which is that we've analyzed what the kind of sales that have happened from the promoter entities in the small cap universe in the last seven, eight or nine odd months. And they have been substantially higher than what you've seen in the recent past. So there is maybe some word of caution warranted. I'm glad uh, Mr. Subramaniam is bringing that. We take a break come back and talk about maybe some micro as well. We've spoken a lot about the macro. We'll try and talk a little bit about the micro on the other side. Stay tuned. Presented by Patanjali Chavan Prash, world's best Patanjali Chavan Prash, made from 51 precious herbs, co powered by Canara Bank. Together we can. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, Kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit.
listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neeraj Shah, on my show, Talking Point. With talking point in conversation with Vetri Subramaniam of UTI. Um, Vetri, we spoke about the macro by and large. Uh, we could go on with that, but have to bring in a little bit of the micro element as well. Um, do you foresee earnings growth to be a challenge in FI 25, 26, uh, or maybe FI 25, 26 is too far to put out? And what are the pockets of challenge? Could it be BFSI, which hasn't quite delivered on stockpiles returns, even if the performance has been okay. Could it be technology on the back of even Accenture saying that they don't see a demand, this thing, those are two large ones, or some others? Sure. So if you look at the Bloomberg consensus, it's now penciling in about 14% growth in uh, earnings for the Nifty 50. That's the consensus number for 25. Not too different from what actually happened in 2024. Uh, will happen because we're still huh. at the final quarter numbers are to come in. But I think that's pretty much in the bag. Um, I think the big difference is if you look at the 24 number, uh, Neeraj, uh, the challenge is that top line growth was actually very weak and the entire growth in earnings was actually driven more by EBITDA expansion because the base year actually had a lot of the impact of you know the post-Russia Ukraine sort of disruption and supply chain and prices. Um, I think the key for 2025 is that it will have to be more revenue led. I don't think there is scope now for EBITDA margins to expand anymore. In fact, given, as you rightly said, there are some pockets within the economy where for a variety of reasons, things are a little bit tighter. Uh, there is very limited scope for margin expansion. So I think it will have to be now led more by revenue growth rather than by margins. Uh, that's point number one. Uh, the outlook, I think, for revenue growth, reasonably good, though the consumption side of the economy, as we can see most high-frequency numbers, is challenged. Investment side, doing better, but I would still submit, you know, it's not necessarily doing great. Right? So that whole pickup that we've been hoping for in terms of private capex, it is still something that we are hoping for. It's not yet visible in the numbers at this point of time. It's only the government capex which has sort of held up. But even there, if you take government capex plus PSU capex, the overall impulse is actually more or less flatline now for a few years. And remember, Neeraj, that you're going into continued fiscal compression, right? 5.1% yeah. fiscal deficit this year, then again, four and a half. So I think the backdrop has certain challenges. We cannot say it's zero challenges. Some of those challenges could be related to global growth. Some of those challenges could be related to NIM compression, which the banks might experience this year. So there are some challenges in getting to 14%, but at least the bar is not set at 25% earnings growth. So the market's looking at a number which is perhaps slightly more in the realm of what is possible. If, if there is a disappointment thereof indicated by quarter one earnings where we might see maybe margin compression because of higher commodity costs or otherwise, could, th could there be a possibility of a swifter than anticipated uh, corrective move in the markets? Because it also coincides very, very interestingly with true, the election uh, calendar. Yeah. Look, the valuations are rich. Uh, they are slightly rich in the case of the large caps slightly above the comfort zone, but at least they're not blinking red. Yeah. They're far more uncomfortable in the mid cap and the small cap place. And I would submit that, you know, at these valuations, you really need earnings growth to not only deliver, but even to deliver some upside surprise. Yeah. I think that's a very high bar. So I would be skeptical about earnings ability to sort of really outperform significantly on the upside. You know, whether the market's correct by going nowhere for a period of time, whether they correct in valuation terms by, you know, coming down sharply, that's very hard to predict. But I think people should be aware that valuations are posing a challenge to, uh, you know, the returns that you can get from economies. A lot of the potential of businesses is reflected in their multiples. Uh -huh. And if it's reflected in their multiples, it means those earnings expectations are baked in. Now you really need something far better than that to give the stock price a lift. 
shift would there be a cushion of domestic flows at the dips you yourself would be getting in money every month every quarter sure. how sure. strong is that flow to cushion the impact of the fall uh, very good question uh, two ways of looking at this and i think everybody should be aware of it obviously the sip flow i think gives us a lot of visibility but when i peel back the sip flow and i look at the rate of cancellation of sips it does seem that there is some momentum seeking behavior visible even in the sip flow right because how many sips are actually persisting beyond beyond one year two year three years the numbers i must say are slightly disappointing they're still good in an absolute sense compared to where we used to be five years ago but if you just look at the headline number that's a bit misleading because there is a high number of sips which are getting cancelled and then you know people are opening new sips again my interpretation of that is there is some bit of return seeking momentum chasing behavior which is there but i still think the sip will give stability it will give support you know the mutual fund sahi hai program which amfi has been running goes back now almost 7 years 2017 and i do think in my travels across the country when i meet people there are a large number of investors who've started to think about this long term they're thinking 10 years 20 years but on top of that there are some people playing momentum and that's what we should be a little bit uh, you know worried about Superb message to wrap this up. Vetri, thanks so much for taking the time out and being with us on Talking Point today. Thank you. Delighted to be here, no, uh, Neeraj. The pleasure was entirely ours, I must tell you. And viewers, thanks for tuning in to this edition of the Talking Point. people believe in different things in cricket some hail the king some believe in god some wait for mr right some believe in swiping right some run away from risk others run after it for some kids mean babies for others kids mean puppies some want a home to settle in the future some want to roam the world today some make a career in a company Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing: profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards, simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. We've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money. There are different types of stocks: large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? First, decide on the stock. Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Stock selection isn't an easy task, and neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Markets end higher, extending gains for third straight day as it reversed losses from the past week. Meanwhile, rupee records lowest ever close against the dollar. Bajaj Auto is set to launch its first CNG motorcycle in June this year says MD Rajiv Bajaj to compete with the likes of Hero Splendor TVS Raider and Honda Shine Arrested Delhi CM Arvind Kejriwal produced before the Rouse Avenue court as ED sought 10 days of custody in the excise policy case 
Supreme Court sets aside a trial court's order directing Bloomberg to take down an article on Z observes that the order seems to lack a prima facie application of mind. Ice cream makers gear up for summer as they expand the capacity to meet the demand for frozen treats. Amul projects 45 to 50 percent growth in sales in FY25. Hello and welcome. You're watching The Reporter on NDTV Profit and I'm your host Pragati Obroy. As always, the show aims to bring you the market headlines along with national and international news. Well, before we start the show, it's time to see how the markets fare during the day since it's the end of the week. Uh, my colleague Harsh Saita joins in for a quick market wrap. Well, the Nifty 50 closed in the green, so that's a positive, but IT was a bit of a drag on the Nifty. Four tenths of a percent higher on the Nifty 50. The Nifty IT down 2.3%, but let's flip it to the Nifty Bank as well, because that was in focus. A couple of days back, recorded nine out of 10 in terms of a streak, nine days out of 10 in the red, the longest losing streak in 20 years. Now the Nifty Bank builds on the gains that it closed at yesterday, 0.8% higher, today 0.4% higher. So that's a positive. But let's first pull up the heat map, uh, try and understand which pockets have done well. Hero Maruti leading the pack, 4% higher on Hero, 3.5 plus percent on Maruti. Maruti being the top gainer on the Nifty 50 this week. So that has been the standout that Maruti has done at least this week. It's pulled the Nifty well. In terms of the losers, no surprises. We spoke about Nifty IT being down 2.3%. All of the Nifty IT constituents are at the very bottom of the table as you see it. But otherwise, we've had a fairly good day of trade. Have a look at the top 20 stocks, all of who have gained over 1.2%. So it's a fairly positive day of trade uh, that we close and week of trade that we close. Let me quickly flip it over, look at uh, the contributories on the Nifty 50. And what we'll again see is in terms of the losers, top Contributories, largely the IT pack, no surprises there. We've spoken about that. But ITC, ICICI Bank, LNT, and Maruti there uh, have are the top four contributories among the gainers in trade. So that's a positive as well. Maruti featuring there. I also want to try and pull up the sectoral indices and see what's happened there. Realty was the top sectoral winner of trade today, at least. Auto, Pharma, Media, all of which have done well. Mind you, Auto and Media are the two top sectoral gainers in trade this week as well. So that's another positive. And Realty has reversed a two-week decline. So that's another positive. But you look at IT, 2.3% down. It's been uh, a week in which IT has seen a slump on the back of Accenture commentary coming through. And uh, we'll have to, of course, wait and watch how we open next week. Very interesting week, but for now, happy holy. See you on the other side. Well, that was the market wrap at the end of the week for you. We also spoke to a slew of market experts regarding their assessment of the tech sector. It's time to take a look at that. Um, what last we spoke, it was more about the quarter, and I said the quarter was better than feared. And I think that's where we are. We, it, it's kind of we're kind of stalling for a couple of quarters where things are not getting worse, but they're not getting better. In order them for them to get better, you need to see these bookings convert. And that's the bigger issue here. Um, you're right. We have not seen any large booking announcements um, year to date. Um, but again, you know, the some of the companies will tell you that not, not everything gets released or is announced. And these tend to be pretty lumpy. So, you know, but ironically, even if we see deals announced, they're not converting. <laughs> That's the issue. Um, it's a very unusual situation that I have not seen, you know, throughout the years that I've covered the space. Clients awarding contracts, but they're not converting, and they're telling you to stall until they get a better feel on the macro and, you know, on Fed's cutting rates. 
think certainly there are challenges on the IT side. It's been visible for a while. Even the you know Indian companies have been articulating challenges over there. They've been winning big deals, but the challenges in many of these cases, you are losing something which was a legacy business, and now you are announcing a new deal. So the net benefit to the company, you have to offset the legacy loss with the you know new deal wins. You can't just keep adding the new deals without recognizing the fact that there is some legacy business which is going away. So I think that challenge will continue. Everything that we hear from the US suggests that uh, you know tech spending is going through a difficult period. This is visible in technology, it's visible in the classic IT services, it's visible in support, and it's also visible in the consulting side, right? So the top end of the market, discretionary consulting badly affected, services less so. The only point that I would make, Neeraj, is that from a domestic economy perspective, one of the trends that we've seen in the economy in recent times is not the growth of just the classic IT services but the rise of global capability centers in India where you have multinationals setting up their own sort of research units here doing research doing coding and doing a lot of stuff which is core to their own enterprise and that I think will continue to sort of grow so overall IT services and you know related exports from India should continue to do well but the classic listed IT services companies particularly the ones with a lot of legacy business I think they are going to struggle a little bit more to handle this transition those were market experts on the tech sector for you let's also take a look at the rupee movement now the Indian rupee touched its all-time closing low it weakened by 28 peso to close at 83.34 against the US dollar experts that NDTV profit spoke to said that the weakness in the rupee is because of overnight strength in the dollar across the board after a series of strong economic data in the US now tracking this space very closely we have Mimansa joining in with key details on this movement. Yeah, hi, Pragati. So, uh, apart from the overnight strength in dollar uh, uh, globally, uh, another thing that is actually leading up to rupee depreciation is the shortage of dollars in the currency market in the sense that RBI took delivery of its $5 billion swap, the buy sell swap that they did uh, two weeks ago. And uh, due to that, the overnight swap rate, the forward swap rate has risen, which indicates that there's a dollar crunch in the system. And apart from that, the, over the last few months, currency traders have been purchasing the rupee against Asian currencies in the offshore markets for better returns. So the view in the market has been that the rupee will appreciate, but uh, on the expectations that the uh, dollar inflows from foreign investors are going to come in. And indeed, they have come in. The data suggests that. But uh, the, the dollar inflows have been absorbed by the RBI through and through, which is not reflecting on the market. This is what the uh, currency traders have have told us. Apart from that, the weakness in Chinese yuan in the offshore market has also led to some weakness in the Indian rupee at uh currency open. The next level that the market is going to watch out for is 8340, 40 to 45, uh, and which, which is when the RBI may start intervening and the exporters may start booking some contracts. All right. Thanks so much for bringing us those details, Mimansa. Now, Bajaj Auto is also set to launch its first ever CNG motorcycle in June this year. And that's what has been said by MD Rajiv Bajaj. And he also mentioned that this new offering is aimed at targeting the mileage conscious consumers here here are the details of this from the md himself that in the month of june we are to maine abhi tak exact nahi bataya tha but aapke kehne se i am giving you specific information ki june ke mahine mein we will launch this motorcycle to iska aap bahut publicity karna bhi bahar ja ke ki cng ka motorcycle june mein aa raha hai well, my colleague Tushar Deep Singh is also joining us to share more details from the Bajaj event itself, uh, especially on the pricing of the motorcycle and other key features. Bajaj Auto plans to launch the first ever CNG motorcycle in June this year. Managing Director Rajiv Bajaj said on the sidelines of a Bajaj Beyond event today. So very quickly, the CNG powertrain will cut by half the fuel expenses as incurred in a petrol motorcycle. The motorcycle will compete with the likes of the Hero Splendor, TVS Raider, as well as the Honda Shine. Uh, so essentially, since it's in the commuter class, we can expect the pricing to be at around 80,000 rupees ex-showroom. Uh, additionally, Bajaj Auto is on track to sell about 
about uh, 2 million pulses this year in about 93 countries. Now, what is the Bajaj by beyond event that happened today? It's essentially, it's a setting up of, of the CII Rahul Bajaj Center of Excellence for Skills uh, in Pune. It will be headquartered in Pune with 50 centers all across India. Uh, the initiative is aims to impact about 10 million uh, youths in the next five years, entailing investment of about rupees 5,000 crore rupees. Uh, essentially, this is in remembrance of Rahul Bajaj, who passed away a couple of years ago. Well, those were the details from the Bajaj event. Moving on to the February economic review. Now, the Ministry of Finance suggested that India's inflation outlook for the upcoming month is positive, especially with the pickup in summer sowing expected to bring down the food prices. And in the February monthly economic review specifically, the Ministry's Department of Economic Affairs noted that the outlook for food in inflation has in fact improved past couple of months. Now, a modest increase in the overall acreage in the rubby sowing has been observed and this is now compared to the previous year. According to the second advance estimates of FY24, in fact, wheat production could increase 1.3% while Kharif rice production could rise 0.9% compared to the previous year. So this is what is expected to bring down the inflationary pressure in the major food items. In fact, the department said that the inflation in February moderated mildly in all groups in the course CPI basket and this primarily included clothing, footwear, household, saving, good and services, health, transport and communi communication. Now, let's also take a look once again at the legal news like we do every day. The Supreme Court has now set aside a trial order asking Bloomberg to take down an article which alleged financial irregularities at Z Entertainment. Varun joins us with more details on this case. The Supreme Court has set aside a trial court order that directed Bloomberg to take down an article which alleged a $241 million financial irregularity at Z Entertainment Enterprises. Now, the top court observed that the trial court's order lacked a prima facie application of mine and that the High Court's order upholding the trial court directive has also been passed without adequate reasoning. It said that the error committed by the trial court has further been perpetuated by the High Court as they both have merely recorded that firstly, a prima facie case existed for the grant of an injunction in favour of Z, secondly, that the balance of convenience lies in Z's favour, and lastly, they said that an irreparable injury would be caused to Z if an injunction is not granted in its favour. Now, the court said that while granting a mandatory injunction of this nature, the courts have to make sure that more than a prima facie case has been made out. Now, since this case is likely to come up for a hearing before the trial court on March 26, the Supreme Court has directed the, court, the trial court to hear the matter and pass a reasoned order this time around. In line with the legal news, the hearing in the Delhi liquor policy money laundering case has also started and the arrested Delhi CM Arvind Kejriwal was taken to a special court in the Rouse Avenue. Now, my colleague Charu Singh is joining us to share key details about the ongoing hearing of the case in the special court. Charu, what are the latest updates from the hearing? What are the expectations? There's, there's naturally a lot of curiosity among everyone about this case. Good evening, Pravati. So, as we all know, last night after two hours of questioning, ED arrested uh, Delhi CM Arvind Kejriwal, and then he was uh, taken and presented before uh, the bench in Rouse Avenue Court. Before that, uh, the matter was also mentioned before uh, the Supreme Court of India, and uh, CJI Chandrachur uh, transferred it in front of the uh, three-judge bench led, led by uh, Justice Sanjeev Khanna. However, uh, senior advocate Manu Singhvi appearing for Kejriwal review his case and said that first he will uh, appear for Kejriwal uh, in front of the Rao 7 U court uh, where ED had closed the court for a 10-day custody of the CM and currently the proceedings are going on before um, the Rao 7 U court only. Uh, another important development that's there is a PIN has been filed before the Delhi High Court uh, which says that uh, so CM Kejriwal should not uh, be allowed to remain in his position considering his current arrest. So that is another development that is happening because of this. And uh, the proceedings before Rao when you are still going on, uh, Senior Advocate Manu Singh is still there pr uh, presenting Kejriwal and putting out his uh, argument saying that there is no re need to keep him in remand just to uh, get more information about it when he's already ready to cooperate with the proceedings. So let's see how this unfolds. The proceedings still going on. We'll keep you updated with more details. Got it, Charu. Thanks so much for bringing us that. It's also time to slip into a short break, but please stay tuned because we have lots more lined up for you.
different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Welcome back. You're watching The Reporter on NDTV Profit. Now let's take a look at a more topical news rather. Now with sweltering summer just around the corner, ice cream chains are gearing up for a busy few months ahead. The demand for frozen treats has in fact already seen an uptick and leading to top brands expanding their capacity. Our colleague Sesha joins in with more details on this. Ice cream companies are expecting about 25 to 30 percent growth in sales between April and June over the previous year in anticipation of a summer rush. Now, some are expecting a surge in demand already, like Amul MD has told us that they are starting to see an uptick in some pockets. They have invested rupees 1,000 crore towards expansion of its manufacturing cap capacities. Uh, this is through a mix of greenfield facilities as well as enhancement of the existing facilities. Amul is also expanding its fairly new retail format, Ice Lounge, uh, focused entirely on premium ice cream. Uh, they have opened 15 such stores and 10 more are planned during summer. Mother Dairy is saying that, you know, they are betting on stable prices to spur demand. This is unlike the last two years when we have seen that companies were forced to hike prices because of the higher raw material prices. However, this year they, they are seeing a fall in milk procurement prices as well as surplus stocks. Uh, American uh, chain Baskin Robbins, um, they are set to open 1,000 outlets in India. The premium brand expects to outpace market growth this summer. Now, even though the ice cream consumption is fairly low compared with the global average, the market is highly competitive with a very few number of big players and a whole lot of small regional players uh, you know, um, fighting for a market share. The smaller companies rather collectively uh, control in half of the market. Another trend that we are seeing is the emergence of quick commerce channels. Now, these channels are driving in-house uh, consumption for major brands. Uh, however, we are seeing that the traditional companies are under pressure due to the rise of protein rich calorie uh, low calorie ice cream brands. Uh, this include Noto, Go Zero, Get Away, and Brooklyn Creamery. So all in all, uh, high competition is there. Still, companies are gearing for very few busy months ahead. That was Sasha bringing us updates on ice creams in this sweltering summer season. Moving on to updates from a CII event. Now, in a conversation with NDTV Profits, Sanjeev Puri hails the government's sustainable policies. In fact, he even said that the enterprises need to embrace nature-based solutions as a part of government's green push. 
we're, we're in a good uh, position right now because we have a lot of proactive policy interventions that have happened by the government at the at the center. I think the open access policy, for example, that came recently, the green credit system, the, the whole idea about life, which is about sustainable consumption to, to support the transition. So as enterprises, I think the, what we need to embrace is green infrastructure, buildings, energy, transportation. We need to embrace nature-based solutions. Uh, we, we need to deal with the issue of water, the issue of biodiversity, the issue of forestation. So it has to be through a spirit of public-private partnership and enterprises need to do it as in their eco ecosystem. At the same event, Vinay Dubey, founder MD and CEO at Akasa Airlines, also said that one can expect sustainable fuels for airlines to be more abundant and affordable going ahead. In fact, he also spoke about Akasa Air's growth plans. Let me start by talking about Akasa's stand on sustainability because that's very, very important. Um, there are no um, global statistics available, but it is our assertion that we are the world's most sustainable airline. We've got the most modern fleet. We've got the youngest fleet. Um, we have refused water gun salutes and saved thousands of gallons of water. Uh, our food packaging is 100% is uh, recyclable with you know, non-contaminant ink. Our flight attendant uniforms are made out of recycled marine waste. The shoes our flight attendants wear, uh, uh, the rubbers are made out of, the, the soles are made out of recycled rubber. So it's, you know, sustainability is at the core uh, of, of what we do at Akasa. In terms of sustainable aviation fuels, um, we would expect that over time they would A, be more abundant and B, be priced in a manner that is affordable to airlines. I'm not an expert on the development of, of alternate fuels, so I can't give you a date you know, by when this will be done. But I think, uh, you know, if you look at our government's focus, if you look at the governments around the world, uh, you know, their focus is on sustainability. And so they are working with alternate providers of fuels. I just don't have timelines for you. Those were the updates from the CIA event in Mumbai. Now let's take a look at another very important news. India's 21st century Pushpak Viman has been successfully launched. Now Pushpak, an SUV-sized winged rocket dubbed the Swadeshi Space Shuttle, successfully landed on a runway in Karnataka this morning, marking a major milestone in the country's attempt to enter the reusable rocket segment. The rocket was dropped from an Air Force helicopter as part of the test. The outcomes were excellent. Excellent and precise, said ISRO chief S. Somnath. Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi also arrived in Bhutan on a state visit from 22nd to 23rd March. The visit is in fact in keeping with the tradition of regular high-level exchanges between India and Bhutan and the government's emphasis on its neighbourhood-first policy. I'm joined by my colleague Saurabh Gupta from Bhutan to tell us more on this. Well, it's a very important trip of the Prime Minister to Bhutan and this is very, very important from multiple angles given the fact that the Prime Minister is visiting Bhutan uh, just ahead of elections in India, but also the fact that the Prime Minister has been uh, you know, a very early proponent of the neighbourhood first policy where the India has, of course, uh, seen its immediate neighbourhood as a priority in its foreign policy. And in that context, Bhutan has been special because when the Prime Minister took office in 2014, the first country he visited during his first official foreign tour was Bhutan. Now, we are at the Thimpu Zong. The Thimpu Zong is important. You know, it's located and nestled right below the snow-capped, beautiful mountain peaks in Bhutan. The Zong is important for multiple reasons. One is it is not only, you know, the administrative, uh, you know, place, the seat of the administration, but also it is the... Monas it is the monastic, you know, uh, place where monks also live and religious instruction also is imparted. So it is very important that the Prime Minister is being given the guard of honour at the Thimpu Zong. It's very, very significant from the perspective of the honour being accorded to the Prime Minister. Now, there have been, of course, talks, there have been MOUs and there have been several other issues uh, that also have been carried out by the Prime Minister during, uh, you know, uh, uh, during multiple uh, foreign visits and in fact he's visited Bhutan multiple times but this one is special because remember he's also meeting the king 
of Bhutan, His Majesty the King of Bhutan, and also uh, he will have uh, you know several meetings throughout the day, beginning with this card of honor. But what is more important is also that the Prime Minister is being conferred upon the order of the Druk Galpo. Now, what is the order of the Druk Galpo? It is the highest civilian honor in the country of Bhutan. It has never been accorded to any foreign national. Prime Minister Modi is the first foreign national to receive the order of the Druk Galpo, which is the highest civilian honor in the entire state of Bhutan. And therefore, this is a very, very significant trip. You can see, of course, the Guard of Honor is ready for the Prime Minister and the Indian Prime Minister is being accorded the Military Guard of Honor here at the Thimpu Zong. It's also very, very, uh, you know, uh, it is, it is of course, very, very renowned and very, very, uh, you know, significant and important in terms of the Prime Minister's visit to Bhutan. This, of course, is probably going to be his last official foreign tour before India moves into the election cycle. So therefore, it's a very, very important visit from the perspectives of both India and Bhutan, countries that have shared a very deep relationship with each other that goes much beyond, you know, uh, several issues that we talk about. It's a very, very deep relationship that is being fostered both by India and Bhutan, with the Prime Minister's personal touch also being added to the diplomacy with Bhutan. Those were the updates for you from Bhutan. Now on to some very exciting sports news. The 17th season of Tata IPL or Indian Premier League is set to kick off this evening. Fans are all gearing up to watch the first face of match between last year's winners Chennai Super Kings or CSK and Royal Challengers Bangalore or RCB. So it's definitely going to be a CSK versus RCB very exciting match. But before the first match of the eight week long season kicks off, a star studded opening ceremony also also awaits the audience, with the likes of A.R. Rahman and Sonu Nigam gracing the event. We also have one last story, a very important one for you. The retail market participation has been on the rise since the pandemic. However, the astronomical rise in the interest to tap India's growth story hasn't entirely led to a layperson going to professional financial planners. In fact, a study shows that there is only one planner for 30,000 investors. So why is the ratio so big or rather skewed? Methri said explodes in this package. There is one doctor for 834 people in India, 21 judges for a million Indians and one investment advisor for over 30,000 investors in the Indian stock market. The Dalal Street is crowding with more and more investors, but investment advisors are not growing with the same pace. Why this number fails to grow? Let's hear it from the advisors. In a role that you play where you are purely giving advice and never handling funds of investors, there is a very steep net worth requirement that exists, which we think is not required because you're never touching funds of an investor that gets invested directly into a financial instrument. The second is there is a recertification examination that needs to be taken every three years because that exam also doesn't have very high pass rates. So you will find people having to go through that exam multiple times. Number three, you have a requirement that you have to be a postgraduate in specific areas for two years which once again has the limitation that, for example, there could be very high quality postgraduate programs which are just one year, but that's not, that's not valid. So strict qualification norms by the Securities and Exchange Board of India makes it difficult to be an investment advisor. Thus, investors instead end up relying more on mutual fund distributors for advice. An unwillingness to pay the consultation fee and lack of financial literacy adds to the cause clients are not as willing to pay fees up front. Uh, somehow the investment psychology has been that it's okay to uh, give commissions which are hidden in the NAV, uh, NAVs of uh, mutual funds. Uh, so that is one set of, uh, set of challenge that I face. The other is basically compliance. The advisory business, there are a lot of uh, steps and processes that uh, an investor needs to follow. But how wise it is to take investment advices from mutual fund distributors whose expertise is restricted to only mutual funds. It is also noteworthy that the market regulator SEBI has also set regulations for investment advisors who can only earn through advisory and not through portfolio management services. 
the mutual fund distributor, for example, uh, does not have a fiduciary responsibility as an advisor has been. So the advisor is basically uh, working in the client's interest. A mutual fund distributor is actually not providing a service which is conflict-free as compared to that of a uh, of an advisor and as a result of which it's important to segregate the two because the business models of both of these are very, very different. If you're talking about a country as large as India and you